Good morning, everyone. Happy Wednesday and welcome to GCFI 74 Day 3. We've had a wonderful two days worth of insightful panel discussions and presentations, and we expect today will be no different. Uh, today, we have a very fishy theme. So we have a lot of fish related and fisheries related, uh, reef fish related um, sessions on today. And we're going to start things off with our keynote presentation this morning. And we are honored to have Dr. Will Patterson join us to deliver today's keynote address. Dr. Patterson is a professor of fisheries and aquatic sciences in the School of Forest, Fisheries and Geomatic Science at the University of Florida. He and his research team examine population dynamics, trophic ecology, movement ecology, and population connectivity and habitat utilization of marine fishes, with reef fish ecology being an area of focus. They employ technology such as many remotely operated vehicles, large scale three dimensional telemetry, and genetics or genomics approaches to address otherwise intractable problems in reef fish ecology. Dr. Patterson serves on state, regional, and national advisory panels in which research products produced by multiple investigators are incorporated into fisheries assessment and management within the peer review framework. So I invite uh, Dr. Patterson to deliver his keynote address today on Gulf and Caribbean data limited reef fisheries, new approaches to assessment for effective management. Over to you, Dr. Patterson. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, and thanks to uh, GCFI and the steering committee for the invite to come speak today. Um, obviously, I think we would all enjoy to be in uh, beautiful Destin, Florida, um, rather than um, doing the Zoom meeting. Uh, but uh, kudos to the committee for the excellent organization um, and seamless delivery, and I hope the next hour uh, is seamless as well in that respect to, to technology. Um, I do want to note that I made a slight tweak to the title versus what was submitted uh, during the abstract stage. Um, so the, the last part is new approaches to assessing stock dynamics. I just felt this better captured um, what it is I'm going to talk about today and sort of a complementary approach to data limited methods that have been proposed previously. So the Gulf and Caribbean region clearly um, has enormous reef fish uh, resources. And we often think of them from an extractive point of view, whether they be for recreational uh, fishing, commercial fishing, or uh, spear fishing activities. Um, but you know, there are numerous other ecosystem services they provide. And their management in the region is based on these services, such as ecotourism um, and uh, protein production for uh, local communities, um, and, and because of their importance, their assessment and management is a critical component of uh, governance in um, all parts of the Gulf and Caribbean region. There are different um, governance structures that, that exist throughout the region. In U.S. waters of the Gulf of Mexico, Caribbean, and Atlantic, the Magnuson-Stevens uh, Fisheries Conservation and Management Act is what's... Um, is the, the guiding um, legislation here in federal waters and states often have um, um, approaches to be consistent with the Magnuson Act. So it was amended, um, reauthorized in 2007. And a, 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 an important component of this reauthorization was the requirement for annual catch limits um, and the guidance that came after the act that were due to go uh, in effect by 2011. So in the U.S. Caribbean in particular, as well as um, also parts of the Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico, uh, there's been um, an ongoing, um, there have been ongoing work to try to provide these annual catch limits. Um, in other parts of the, the Caribbean, um, the European um, Commission, European Union rules apply, and there's been a lot of discussion about the common fisheries policy 
and its move toward using um, FMSY and, and clear reference points. There was a goal to have this accomplished by 2020. Um, that passed with, without full success, uh, but that work is ongoing as well. And then obviously we have the, the Caribbean Community Common Fisheries Policy um, that's been proposed and is a work in progress uh, and has been discussed you know, at many GCFIs in the past. Um, and so we have the nation's uh, states that are uh, members um, of this um, um, group that, that are pushing forward to have this unified policy. We have other Caribbean um, states which are not um, part of the policy to this stage. Um, regardless, uh, we have you know, individual states pr um, uh, promoting their own management measures currently. Um, and again, this idea of overfishing and how do we, how do we estimate that and how do we manage toward avoiding that um, is a common theme in all of these discussions. So the Nature Conservancy on the left here provides this nice diagram for fishery harvest strategy, right? Determine the objectives, design data monitoring um, program to produce data to conduct stock assessment, and then develop harvest control rules based on the results of assessment, design enforcement and compliance system, and then evaluate management effectiveness and adjust, and then the loop um, circles back again. And, and so this is an idealized model for what effective management would look like, but it's clear that on the front end, we need to have clear objectives of what the purpose is. And then as far as science-based management, if we can conduct stock assessment, that's really the ultimate goal. Um, on the right, this isn't actually a control rule, but what's called a stoplight plot. Um, but it shows that if we drop uh, the biomass, if it goes below our limit value, um, then we're in an overfished or depleted condition. If we fish above our F limit, which is this region up here, then we're overfishing. And if, we, if we're overfishing long enough, even if this biomass is above our biomass limit, eventually we're going to drive that below the limit. And so for in this region here, where fishing mortality is below the limit, but biomass um, is, is above our limit, then we're going to be recovering. Um, excuse me, the biomass is below the limit, but the fishing mortality rate is um, below the limit as well. Then we're fishing at a rate which would allow the stock to recover above that biomass limit. To turn this into actually a control rule, there'd be a stepping down phase uh, between the limit um, and the origin here once the biomass, the fishing mortality limit, once the biomass drops below its biomass limit. Well, in, again, in, in the US, we have the Magnuson Act in federal waters, which is um, supersedes uh, all other management. And on the right hand side here, this is a, a demonstration of how what the current management paradigm is. Um, and so first, the overfishing limit is estimated typically through a stock assessment. And this is the yield of FMSY or its proxy. And then you can see there are some error bars around that OFL estimate, which represents scientific uncertainty. Then the acceptable biological catch is set below that, which is the OFL reduced um, based on scientific uncertainty. And then we have um, parameters over here on the right, which the councils um, are responsible for. So on the left, we have the scientific, the um, scientific and statistical committee, which handles the estimation of OFL reduction to ABC. The annual catch limit um, has to be less than or equal to the ABC. So the ABC really brackets where the ACL can be. And then in some cases, we actually have an annual catch target, which is just the annual catch limit reduced to management uncertainty. This is more common in the US and recreational fisheries um, than in commercial. So it's imperative, right? If we wanna reduce that buffer between OFL to ABC to have rigorous science-based assessment um, and be able to minimize the scientific uncertainty to the greatest extent possible. In U.S. assessments, um, typically, uh, what's utilized is a, is a process um, known as integrated analysis. So there's an excellent review by Mark Monder and Andre Punt um, from the early, uh, the mid-2000s, uh, 2010s, called a review of integrated analysis and fishery stock assessment. And, and what they lay out are the advantages is that an integrated model, so instead of estimating stock recruitment or growth, other parameters or functions external to the actual operating model, instead with an integrated analysis, all of the available empirical data are actually combined in a single analysis. 
And so these multiple data sources are linked together through um, a likelihood function, the, the objective function of the assessment. And then assumptions across the data sources are applied throughout all of these different analyses. So it doesn't, it's not piecemeal. Um, and then uncertainty is propagated through to the model outputs. What are some disadvantages? Well, there's, these are complex models. The red snapper assessment has over 1,100 parameters, for example, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, so there's opportunity for misspecification error. Um, com computational needs can be quite high. Um, and then lastly, data needs. So we need to have long time series of information going into these assessment models. Um, and a large portion of the US, um, but not in all regions, stock synthesis, um, which is an integrated assessment model uh, that Rick Mathot has been developing over the past 20 years and now with a team of other scientists, is really the standard assessment tool uh, which has been utilized. Again, in different regions, we have different uh, models um, that are sometimes used uh, more so than stock synthesis, but overall this has been widely used. And every year globally, um, there are at least a hundred or so assessments that are conducted with stock synthesis. Um, and this model, it has uh, a considerable amount of documentation, a GitHub site where you can download it um, from its freeware. Um, the R packages that are used to run the model, as well as to do um, projections or um, the data plotting of diagnostics or outputs. But the model itself has several integrated components. There's a population submodel, which is a, a statistical catch at age mod model, in which recruitment, mortality, and growth uh, uh, um, um, parameters are, are estimated. There's an observation submodel in which um, the expected values for a wide range of data types are derived, such as the catch at age, for example, or catch at length. Um, and then we have a statistical submodel where um, the goodness of fit is computed, and this is uh, uh, to try to minimize the, neg the negative log likelihood. Um, so the fit between expected and observed values. And then projections um, can be performed uh, through MCMC procedures to project forward um, management quantities such as uh, the fishing mortality rate that would produce um, um, FMSY. Um, but, but actually the OFL, the ore fishing limit, when you apply that FMSY to future estimates of um, biomass, for example. So important for setting OFL and then from there, ABC. So complex models for sure. This is uh, a great figure from um, Skylar Sagaris, who was the lead analyst for um, the Gulf Gag assessment shown here, CDAR 33. And the, so this is a protogenous grouper, and you can see the various data sources that went into this model. So we have commercial handline, commercial longline, headboat, charter boat, private recreational, and then a red tide fishery. So this was um, an extra source of mortality, which was estimated to occur due to red tide on the West Florida shelf. Um, and then the data types catch uh, abundance indices, um, including some fishery independent indices, length composition, age composition for the various fisheries um, and, and um, surveys, and then discards. So quite a complex model. And the important thing to note here is some of the data streams go back to 1965. So for other data limited species in the US Gulf of Mexico, the Atlantic, the US Caribbean, um, as well as um, other Caribbean states, there just aren't these long time series of catch data or length data or age comp data that exist in many areas. And so data limited methodologies have been proposed to um, assess those stocks and to try to provide scientific advice to managers for the sustainability of catch. Um, and so Tom Carruthers has done an enormous job with his colleagues on the West Coast. Um, he's, he's at UBC. And developing this package data limited methods. I know this has been the subject of workshops and discussions at past GCFIs. So many of you probably have some experience here, um, but in their, in their um, 2018 paper, they lay out the various methodologies that exist within uh, the DM, DLM toolkit within R, again, an R package that's easily downloadable um, and explorable. And you'll note here, that we have some of these that are static, which means they don't update with new data. We others have other methods that are dynamic that do update with new data. I'm not gonna walk through all the various ones, but I do wanna point out here that for most of these, 
there is some information about catch which is required. And so by that we, you know, we understand it to be an accurate estimate of catch um, and typically a time series of catch, especially for the depletion based, me depletion based methods. However, there's some um, R ratio and life history analyses that are shown down here under the abundance-based methodologies that don't require an estimate of catch, meaning uh, an accurate estimate of catch. And so these various um, methods, they do require an estimate of natural mortality. For, in most cases, they do require an estimate of biomass, which can be very tricky. You, you'll notice that none of these other um, procedures require an estimate of current biomass. Um, and so if we can actually provide methodologies to estimate the current biomass, and we can provide methodologies to estimate natural mortality M, then this is actually a perhaps a great approach to jumpstart the scientific assessment approach in regions where we have very data limited um, stocks. And so I'm gonna talk about some of the recent research to support that. Carruthers has also done, um, and others have done research on simulation testing of these various approaches. And in the figure here on the right, um, in this paper from 2014, they had six different life history strategy types. And so I picked out snapper and porgy because these are life histories that are most common with um, Gulf and Caribbean reef fishes. And so we have the same models that were shown before. Um, and then there are three metrics that the simulations were um, uh, computing. One is the probability of overfishing. And so this is the percentage of simulations where the stock was uh, overfishing was occurring. Um, there's the B to BMSY. So this is the percentage of time um, that B to BMSY was below 50%. And then we have the yield. And this is the percentage of time when the yield in the last five years of the simulation was um, below the yield at FMSY or the overfishing limit. And so we, you can see we have those metrics for snapper um, as well as the porgy life history. So the darker the gray, the worse the performance. Um, and so you can see many of these catch-based methodologies have dark gray. Um, they tend to be um, more conservative as far as the probability of overfishing goes. Um, but then the the corollary to that is that oftentimes the yield is not close to the overfishing limit. So there's foregone yield. Um, but interestingly, um, these life history based analyses perform actually quite well relative to these other data limited um, approaches. But the catch here is that we have to have some estimate of current biomass, um, which can be difficult to, to um, put our fingers on. So what I'm gonna talk about today are some alternative approaches to estimate stock dynamics to inform these data limited approaches. Um, and all of these approaches also can feed into data rich assessments and all of this is scalable. So in their recent review, um, Punt et al talked about sort of the ideal future um, integrated assessment model. And one of the important characters is that it's, it's scalable as new information becomes available, such as genetic mark recapture, estimates of stock biomass, that can be incorporated um, relatively seamlessly into the assessment um, and enable us to utilize that new information moving forward. So what I'm gonna talk about are some um, new ideas and approaches to, um, to validate aging and to estimate natural mortality. Then I'm gonna talk about um, estimating the dynamics of the stock from age composition data and give an example with uh, Warsaw Grouper. I'm gonna talk about optical approaches, some of which have been used in this region um, for quite a considerable amount of time, but how to leverage those uh, monitoring programs to become more informative to estimating stock biomass, um, as well as the size, therefore age composition of the populations. And then lastly, I'm gonna to touch on a couple of molecular ecology approaches, which I really think are gonna be the future. So age obviously is, is critically important. It's the fundamental parameter in population ecology and fisheries. Um, we must reliably estimate age um, because so many other parameters such as you know, growth, mortality, reproduction at age are all uh, dynamic rates that are dependent on accurate estimates of age. And so aging error um, has two components, imprecision and bias. And so we need to account for those and mitigate them to the extent possible, but clearly understanding and appreciating um, what those levels are is critically important so that we don't have misspecification. Um, and then otoliths for bony fishes 
are have been shown to be the most reliable and in, in almost all cases um, aging structure. You know, obviously, if we have a protected species, um, that can be a problem. And monocanthids and ballistids, you know, the the first dorsal spine, um, historically has been utilized, um, but otoliths in general are the most reliable, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. On the right-hand side, we just see here an image of vermilion snapper, and they're characterized by this really incredible variability in size at age. So for assessment purposes and just understanding the population dynamics of that fish, for, for one example, we need to ensure that that spread that we see in the data is real, that there is there actually is this variability in size at age, um, and this isn't just an aging error issue, for example. So otoliths, you know, they begin forming prior to hatching, metabolically inert, inert once formed, and elements, stable isotopes, and radionuclides uh, are incorporated from the environment into their structure. Uh, they form alternating opaque and translucent zones. We count the opaque zones to estimate age. Um, but sort of the catch in the tropics, especially for deep water fisheries, is that opaque zones can be difficult to discern. So I have a handful of snappers and groupers um, shown here on the right. And for the most part, you know, we can, we can um, see the opaque zones quite clearly. Um, but there are some examples, such as in red grouper over here or the gag down below, um, where we can start to get some imprecision, where multiple reads um, provide different estimates of age. Um, and so aging error and actually validating that our age estimates are accurate are critically important. Well, one tool um, which has been used um, in other regions um, considerably and more so in the past five years or so in the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean um, is using the bomb radiocarbon chronometer. And we actually are fortunate enough to have several different time series of coral radiocarbon data. Um, and you can see different points here, the stars above, where we actually have coral records. Um, and I've limited this to the central and northern um, Gulf of Mexico because the couple of examples I'm gonna talk about utilize those time series, but there are some coral records, you know, as far as south as, um, you know, 16 degrees um, south of the equator off of um, Brazil. Um, and so there's some other records in the southern Gulf of Mexico that can be utilized as well. Um, but the principle here is that, that in atmospheric testing of nuclear weapons back in the, um, um, 40s, 50s, into the 60s, uh, doubled the amount of naturally occurring radiocarbon in the environment. And so this is carbon-14. It has a half-life of 5,730 years approximately. Um, but when that, when that doubled in the atmosphere and it then became entrained in the oceans as dissolved inorganic carbon, and that was taking, taken up by corals and other animals that have calcium carbonate tests, or in the case of um, fishes, otoliths, and, and so over time, we had this ramping up from about negative 50 per mil to about 150 per mil in our region, um, and then a linear decline or monotonic decline that is basically linear um, from the mid-1970s until the present. And so we can utilize this reference series to examine um, the accuracy of aging by aging a fish, subtracting its age from the year it was collected, lining the data up on the curve, and then testing statistically if the curve fits uh, or the data fits um, that function. In the bottom right here, we can see the oceanography of the system, and it's a good reminder of why we have such commonality um, among these different time series despite the fact that they come, came from many different areas um, of this region. So the first uh, example I'm gonna give here is for uh, Gulf Red Snapper. And so this is a paper that was um, published um, by Beverly Barnett, who just finished her PhD here at UF um, a few months ago. And, and so in this case, the had a sample of fish um, with a range of ages and, and um, um, collection years. The cores, after they were aged by counting opaque zones, the core of the second otolith was extracted um, using an earlier method that, um, that Beverly described in her 2010 paper using a micro mill, which is a precision drilling instrument that enables us to take um, extract very precise areas or regions of the otolith. And then analyzed at the Wood, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute's um, um, ex, uh, accelerator mass spectrometer spectrometry facility, NOSAMS, um, the National Ocean Sciences 
um, AMS facility at, at Woods Hole. And so on the right, we can see the reference series for data that she had at the time. And then we have these overlaid uh, red snapper data points. Uh, the fits that you see here, this is a, a Lowe's regression or a smoothing function. And then we have the 95% confidence intervals shown in the dotted lines. And then statistical tests of this using the method from uh, Castile et al. 2008 demonstrate that the null model, so not advancing or subtracting years from our estimates of birth year, was the most accurate. So this validated that otolith opaque zone counts for red snapper um, are formed annually and accurately reflect age. Importantly, um, there, was some, there was some work done just previous that questioned whether red snapper aging was accurate. And so this is pretty definitive that in fact it is. But secondly, um, you can see that this linear decline period supplemented with uh, otolith, uh, age zero otoliths, and then the edges of adult otolith material from red snapper extended that time series um, past where the coral data ended. And so this decline series, um, this linear function, Kalish, who, do, who was the original developer of the bomb radiocarbon chronometer, proposed this in the Pacific. Um, Andy Fisher and, and Scott Baker and others talked about it um, with snapper species um, back in the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, Alan uh, Andrews with uh, his Hind paper and, and co-authors um, in 2013 extended that series. And now um, the Barnett et al. extends it even further. So a key here is using that known age otolith material, either at the, from the edge of adults or from whole age zero fish to extend that forward. And most recently, this is a paper from uh, Virginia Chervet's lab um, at University of South Carolina. They've actually um, gone in finer detail in this area of the Caribbean. So we have Puerto Rico, St. Thomas, um, and St. Croix, and you can see their sampling locations for different species they examined. Um, and there were a couple of time series of coral, but they didn't extend um, far enough into the recent past to be useful for the age validation the authors wanted to do here. But also there was some discrepancy between the two time series. So what they were able to do is use this known age otolith material to develop a time series specific to this region. And of note, this time series has much tighter fit than when looking at the broader Gulf and Caribbean time series that we've looked at with red snapper um, and some other species. So perhaps if you, look, if you derive your time series from very local waters, you can actually minimize the variance, therefore um, increase your, your, the rigor of your test for aging accuracy. Um, and we can see a few different species um, red hind cores and then white crunt and mutton snapper, which fit in this curve. Um, and this is a linear regression fit to the known age data, plus or minus 95% prediction intervals. And then to take it a little step farther, um, we recently published this paper using islands cores as the source of the radiocarbon signal. And um, islands have been utilized in other taxa um, to do aging work, either with amino acid racemization or even to derive radiocarbon signatures. Um, in fishes, we have a great model, especially in teleos, because they're spherical and they grow in these concentric rings of, of protein. And so we have some electron microscope images here from um, the University of Florida facility, where you can see these very fine scale 20 micrometer layers, cell layers, as you move from the core out to the edge of the lens. But the great thing about the eye lenses is, is that like otoliths, they're not resorbed once they're formed, but otoliths are only um, about 12% organic carbon or carbon. Um, and part of that is from dissolved inorganic carbon, only about 20 to 40% is metabolic or organic carbon. In the case of the islands, it's about 50% carbon and it's all organic. So we don't have this mixing between organic and inorganic sources. Um, and so in this paper, we demonstrated that if we core the otoliths of red snapper, as well as a suite of other species, and we took the core of the islands, um, there's actually a one-to-one -one, um, fit, right? A one-to-one -one relationship. So we can take the islands core and use that as our bomb radiocarbon signature. So if we don't have a fancy micro mill, these lenses are really easy to work with, lay them on the counter. They slowly start to dry and crack open. It takes a couple of hours till you get down to the core. 
or you can throw them in a freeze dryer and it happens much faster and you can do multiple samples at a given time, which is the way we do it. But in our early work, we laid them on the counter, we let them dry and we pulled out these little BBs that are a couple millimeters in diameter and then analyze those for radiocarbon. It's uh, a really smooth and easy method that doesn't require a lot of fancy equipment to actually perform. Well, if we carry that forward now, still looking at age and growth, um, and now we have a deep water reef fish, the Warsaw grouper, which has been um, a subject of concern for many decades. Um, in this uh, other paper by um, Beverly Barnett, you can see that we were able to age these fish out to um, their early 60s. Uh, more, more recently, there's been a report by Sanchez et al of an age of 99 from the Western Gulf of Mexico. So a long lived fish um, that historically was heavily targeted, but has been afforded um, some protection from through regulatory mechanisms in more recent years. But in the, in the time series of data that Beverly had access to, we could see that quite a few small young fish in the time series, but once they start to become, you know, almost teenagers, their numbers really sort of dwindle. And in the older age classes, very few samples. So this is a challenge for trying to fit growth functions to these types of data. However, there's this um, great paper by Taylor et al from 2005, um, which is a, a Bayesian um, and likelihood analysis um, in which uh, the principle is that selectivity and size selective fishing bias uh, age length samples or length at age samples, um, hence they bias the von Bertalanffy growth parameters, our, our model fits to the data. So in their modeling approach, which the papers here, you can, you can go investigate it for yourself. Um, I'm not gonna get into the computational details of any of these um, various analyses, but the model assumes that there's logistic selectivity, the size at age data are sampled from a multinomial distribution and that recruitment variation um, M and recruitment variation, um, variation in M and F uh, are stable across the time series. So variation may exist, but it doesn't vary across time. So those are some assumptions that have to be met here. And we, you know, there's can be debate about whether those are likely to be or not. The von Berlanffy growth parameters are then estimated using this multinomial likelihood. And we put Bayesian priors on the parameters as well as um, natural mortality and selectivity, which is really a vulnerability function. And then the posteriors, once we compute the model, are the parameter estimates themselves. So in the case of Warsaw Grouper, you can see that the blue dots are again our data. And then we had a burn-in period and then 5,000 simulated data points. So this is recreated from the selectivity estimate um, as well as the early size at age distribution. And you can see now we have these points that are filling in they're clustered more toward the majority of the observed values, but we had these other observations down below, which were quite smaller. Um, and we're also being informed by the variability in size at age for the young fish for which we have a lot of data. Um, and so the actual um, L infinity for this population fits in at about 1500 millimeters instead of up here closer to 17 or 18 millimeters where the bulk of um, the samples are coming from. And again, this is accounting for the selectivity um, estimated in this model. So the take home here is that our, our um, estimating F from Z uh, and subtracting uh, M from Z, uh, we get a value of 0.34 per year. And our M value was 0 0.066 per year, which gives us a ratio of 5.2 to one. Um, Really, you know, an M, an F to M above one as a rule of thumb is um, overfishing. If you're 5.2 to one, then this is really some, you know, great, uh, high, highly suggestive of substantial historical overfishing um, in this stock. Well, how do we actually estimate the M from these longevity data? Well, there's an excellent review um, by Then et al. that came out a few years ago in which they looked at data from um, a couple hundred different species of fishes. And then the, this table um, shown here from their paper is the various different approaches that have been utilized that they summarize here to estimating natural mortality from either life history data um, coupled with temperature in some cases versus from 
these empirical estimates of mortality and using Tmax or maximum observed longevity as a means by which to estimate the um, natural mortality rate. So they conclude that their best estimate here is using this Honed non-linear non, uh, least squares approach um, where M is equal to A to the T max raised to the B or A times T max raised to the B. And the parameters that they actually estimated were M uh, equals 4.899 times T max raised to the negative 0 0.916. Um, Zhao et al. in 2012 did a, a study from a range of species, and they estimated um, through their simulation analysis that FMSY on average is about 0 0.87 of M. So earlier I said an F to M of one above that ratio is uh, indication that overfishing is likely occurring. So in the Zhao et al. paper, they actually suggest that this is perhaps a little bit lower than that. So maybe around 0.9 with a standard deviation of 0 0.05. So again, if we can collect age data and we take a random sample, um, we have a sufficient sample that we can um, get you know, older fish in the population, we can not only estimate Z from things like catch curves or using the Taylor et al approach, but then we can estimate M based on longevity and these approaches um, that are proposed here by Thin. And now we have um, some pretty good indication about stock productivity, as well as whether overfishing likely has been occurring or not. Well, I'm going to switch gears here a little bit and talk about optical methodologies. And so these are widely utilized in the region to count fish um, for monitoring projects. Um, but in recent years, we've been able to develop really low cost stereo camera systems. So now that we can scale many of the fish that we view with our either diver based um, um, baited trap based or ROV based methodologies. Um, and so the figure that you see in the bottom right is a recent paper that we published, just looking at the accuracy of these methods and comparing them to traditional paired laser methodologies. Um, stereo camera one setup was 400 millimeters apart, the, the stereo cameras on these many ROVs that we utilize and research here at UF. And then spacing out to about 610 millimeters. And so you can see if we space them out to 610 millimeters and um, we look at the percent error. Um, so we have distance across the, the y-axis here. And then we have um, um, the stereo camera setups. And then the other parameter that I wanna mention is that we go from zero to 40 degrees from perpendicular. So the red laser fails the, the farther we get from perpendiculars hitting the fish dead on. The stereo camera system, especially the farther we put the cameras apart, is actually fairly accurate um, across these different um, experimental approaches. So very, very useful tool that, that we now have good data on how accurate they might be. So as an example, there are many surveys in the Gulf of Mexico using video approaches. And so John Walter has been working on a methodology to take the size composition data um, using a neural network uh, modeling approach, converting that size composition then into the distribution of sizes uh, among seasons, surveys, habitats, et cetera. Um, an additional component that he's working on now is uh, estimating the age composition from these size data. So if we have a good growth function, we can estimate the age composition, and then we can estimate mortality rates. So, on a, and, and if we have multiple years of data, now we can do a cohort analysis as we watch those cohorts move through. So very quickly with a little bit of video data and some stereo cameras to estimate the, the lengths, having an accurate age function with just a few years of data now we even have a more robust way to estimate mortality rates that don't rely on having accurate catch or effort data for you know, long time series um, to utilize these fishery, um, these uh, data limited uh, assessment approaches. We've utilized these optical methodologies, for example, in a recent study, which has been called the Great Red Snapper Count. Um, and so this was a, a Gulf wide project um, that occurred over the past few years. Uh, my group was responsible for Florida. And in Florida, we used many ROVs to estimate the density of fish in the system, and then used a random forest model 
um, one to select the sample sites, but then to scale those density estimates up to the entire shelf. And uh, again, a similar approach can be utilized even around, you know, uh, much smaller areas uh, around Caribbean islands. Um, that's a much more uh, tractable, uh, tractable problem, especially if you have very good estimates of what the habitat is in those systems um, and the distributions to then scale your density estimates up to an absolute abundance estimate. Um, very useful approach. And again, as far as our F ratio data limited methodologies, having an estimate of current biomass is critical. Size composition, density data, now we have estimates of biomass. Um, importantly, you know, the size composition data that comes from these optical surveys, I, I've, I've mentioned its relevance, but interestingly, you know, Gulf wide, the estimates from this study were more than twice what the stock assessment estimate of age two plus abundance um, and the most recent stock assessment. Now that assessment's a few years old and some, there've been some um, other changes that might affect the stock assessment estimate in the meantime. Um, however, you know, we still produce this larger estimate. In Florida in particular, right, we had a lot more fish than we anticipated, but they're mostly small young fish. So as the stock is recovering um, after annual catch limits were put in place in, in 2008 and 2009, now we're starting to see the recovery of these younger age classes in Florida where there was an historic fishery, but not a recent fishery, uh, or at least not to the scale of the historical landings. However, larger older fish, these fish can be a meter in length are largely absent still from that population. Um, another component of this that I want to I highlight is some work that we did to estimate the behavioral response of red snapper to ROVs, to divers, to towed camera, to towed sonar. Um, we use three-dimensional telemetry. We use some fairly sophisticated multi-beam sonar to track fish. But then we had another method where we use stereo camera rigs. And again, these stereo camera rigs can be um, created very inexpensively out of a metal frame, um, GoPro cameras that are precisely set. The um, methodology for calibration, it's all coded in R and easily accessible. Um, and so I just um, showed the two data points, uh, the, the, the two data plots here from our stereo camera work um, that shows individual fish moving in response to the presence of an ROV or the presence of a towed camera vehicle. So detectability and um, behavioral responses to gears, whether it's a baited trap and you're trying to estimate the area of sampling, um, or if it's an ROV or a towed camera through the system and you're trying to estimate how fish react behaviorally to that, um, we can use these fairly inexpensive stereo camera setups to accomplish that. Switching gears once again, um, talk for a minute here about molecular ecology. And, and so there've been a couple of recent large scale studies, one done in the Southern Pacific to estimate Southern bluefin tuna population size, and then another off of Southeast Australia and New Zealand to estimate the population size of white sharks using a procedure uh, or methodology called close kin mark recapture. So the original work in Australia was done looking at parent offspring pairs, but then later incorporating um, half sibling um, information or sibling um, relatedness. So in these approaches, um, tissues are sampled, typically fin clips from any fish that people get their hands on. Um, so we have a random sample of the system and then the, the fin clips themselves are sequenced and we look for, um, in a genomics uh, approach, relatedness using these uh, various um, markers. They could be microsatellites um, or they could be SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms. Um, but so we look for relatedness in the data. And then from there, um, we use this as uh, a tool to look at the relatedness in the samples relative to what we would expect in a, in a random sample. And then we can scale that up to a population um, size estimate. And again, so this has been done for uh, bluefin tuna and for white sharks. There's a study going on um, funded by National Marine Fishery Service in the US um, for Atlantic bluefin tuna. And then more recently, um, um, 
we've been funded in a, in a large group that includes Dave Portnoy and Eric Anderson, um, Chris Hollenbeck doing the close kin mark recapture molecular component, and then myself and Nate Batchelor and Jeff Buckle um, and a team of modelers, uh, uh, Krishna Passa, uh VC and uh, Nathan Hostetter at NC State doing an integrated modeling approach, scaling up abundance or density estimates from the camera trap surveys that occur in the Atlantic as part of routine, mod, uh, routine sampling uh, monitoring and ROV surveys being conducted um, as part of this project. So we'll try to produce two independent estimates of population size. Um, and again, you know, although this is a large scale project, um, the total price tag for this is 1.5 million. Um, it's a considerable amount of funds, but you can do it on a smaller scale for smaller areas. And especially with the camera trap or ROV data, that can be done relatively inexpensively to produce these estimates of stock size and abundance um, and, and local areas, which can then be utilized in these F ratio approaches to data limited assessment. Lastly, um, in these molecular approaches, uh, an, an even more recent molecular approach is using what's referred to as DNA methylation to estimate age. Um, and so here's uh, some work in, done in Europe um, by some authors that have had a considerable amount of, of work in, in this area. Um, basically what happens as, as animals age, their DNA becomes either methylated or demethylated at certain sites, these CPG sites, cytosine next to guanine and the DNA molecule. Um, and we can develop a relationship between age, chronological chronological age and that degree of methylation, which then can be used to predict age of unaged animals. And so this um, recent paper shows uh, the effect of temperature is minimal. It was non-significant for European sea bass um, um, between the epigenetic clock predicted ages and the chronological ages. And then the study on the right is a paper that was just published um, from Dave Portnoy's lab at Texas A&M Corpus Christi with Nick Weber, his PhD student as the lead author. And here um, they developed um, epigenetic, epigenetic clocks for red snapper and for red grouper, two really important ecologically and economically important reef fishes in the system. And the um, epigenetic clocks predicted age with uh, the, the R squared here between the chronological age um, derived from otoliths and the epigenetic age prediction was 0.9995 for red snapper and 0.9996 for red grouper. So in the future, um, we're expanding this work, but the ultimate goal is to be able to utilize fin clips um, and you know, selected um, heavily um, ver or validated, significantly validated otolith collections to develop epigenetic clocks and then to be able to age fish rapidly and cheaply um, using this approach. So in the future, um, fishery dependent sampling is likely going to look not just like this on the left, but like this on the right as well, where whenever um, port samplers put their hands on fish, they're taking a fin clip, they're putting it in a vial. Um, this uh, DMSO, DMSO um, and then sodium chloride buffer is um, easily shippable. It, there's no problems, you know, ethanol creates problems when shipping, this does not create any problems. Um, and so in, in the future, these tissue samples are going to be routinely taken across all fisheries. We can estimate population structure, we can estimate population size using the close kin marker capture approach. Um, and then epigenetic aging can be performed to look at the age composition of the landings, um, many more data points and done so apparently with high accuracy. So in conclusion, um, you know, systems are perfectly designed to get the results they get. So if we want to revamp our systems as far as data collection and analysis, then we have to start somewhere. And data limited methods often produce uncertain estimates of biological reference points. And the more data intensive data limited methods don't necessarily produce more reliable results. Um, so you have to start somewhere if the goal is to keep F below FMSY and biomass above BMSY. Integrated assessments require time series of catch, effort, recruitment, et cetera, that take time to, to fill out, 
to, to actually collect the data. But these data um, limited um, methods, not all of them do require those long time series. So fishery independent estimates of fish density can be scaled to population size. Um, we can also use genetic, um, genetic close kin mark recapture to produce those population size estimates, although that's you know, technologically much more um, um, computationally and cost consuming. Basic life history data can provide important information about growth and mortality. Again, so for these F ratio approaches, you know, we can in, in a year um, or two quickly develop the data um, time series to produce those estimates. Um, and again, I know, in, in, at least in the US Caribbean, there's been a big focus on this. Um, Virginia Chervet, John Honig, um, some other folks in the region um, have been working to produce reproductive biology data, size at age data, growth rate information that will at least enable um, some of these data limited methods to be utilized um, there that haven't been available in the past. And lastly, these F ratio DLMs um, could utilize these sources of information to jumpstart science-based management in areas where we've been kind of pulling our hair out because reliably catch time series or effort time series don't exist. But also importantly, these are scalable. So as time series are developed where we have accurate catch and effort data, um, so we can move toward integrated assessment approaches. Now these other data sources can scale with that and provide external information um, as well. So lastly, I just wanna thank um, a whole suite of folks that have participated in the various studies that I've talked about here, um, as well as the, the funding um, resources and agencies that have provided us the resources to uh, perform this work. Thank you, Dr. Patterson. And the questions have started to uh, trickle in now. And um, I'm going to read you a question from Carissa. And she thanked you for a really great talk and asked, what were your thoughts on conducting data limited stock assessments when available data is very limited. So in, this, in a case where there's only catch data available, is any stock assessment better than no stock assessment? Yeah, so a pretty loaded question there. Um, I think what we've seen, uh, the way this works best in, in various places where these data limited methods have been um, proposed um, to provide management advice, is first there, there should be a data triage where, you know, get people in the room who have collected the data, who have information, scientists, um, fishers, um, agency, um, you know, managers and say, okay, what data do exist? And so if it's just catch data, but it's only the recent catch, then that's gonna be less informative than longer time series of catch. Um, but the, the study, um, the simulation work that, that, I, that I cited here from Carruthers, there's another um, simulation study that uh, Sagari Sadal published a couple of years ago in the Gulf of Mexico, which is really excellent, in which they looked at data rich stocks. So things like red snapper and gag and amberjack, um, and then applied data limited methods to those assessments to figure out how well they tracked what the assessment um, results were coming out of stock synthesis. In that simulation, they didn't have these F ratio approaches because they couldn't, they didn't have an independent estimate of, of biomass. So those weren't really assessed. That's why I focused more on the Carruthers. But in those different um, simulations, you can actually see where you might be, um, where different data limited methods are gonna steer you wrong. And also where they're conservative and where they're not so conservative. So it turns out that in many cases, especially for these catch only models, they do a pretty good job of keeping F below FMSY, but in doing so there's foregone yield, right? So depending on what the management objective is, you know, management objectives include things like full employment, food production, et cetera. And so foregone yield is, is not, um, an outcome that's desirable. So you just have to sort of bracket what the management objectives are and what the data are available and then focus on what actual methods you can apply. Thanks, Dr. Patterson. Um, and there were a couple of questions related to the methylation. So 
Bob Glazer sort of asked a question and then so you sort of clarify with your fin clip discussion. But he asked, were there specific tissues that can work better for DNA methylation or can DNA methylation be used non-destructively um, in, for example, endangered species? And then IV sort of followed that up to ask about a cost estimate for this um, DNA methylation analysis. Sure. So I'm working with the experts that do DNA methylation, and that's Dave Portnoy, Chris Hollenbeck, and Nick Weber. So I can give you some of the information here, but if you have other questions about this, then you should contact um, Dave Portnoy in particular directly, and he's at Texas A&M Corpus Christi, and you can find his, his contact information on the web. What I will say um, to answer to, to Bob's first question is um, fin clips work great. They work great for um, close kin marker capture. They work great for genomic studies to look at population structure. And we've been using them to do the epigenetic, um, develop epigenetic clocks. There, there is um, some information out there that different tissues perhaps provide different um, rates of methylation. And, and then of course, muscle is turning over, um, you know, every six months or so in these fish. And so how does that affect? We're not really sure like how uh, white muscle versus fin clips um, for example, there's a, a recent study um, using gonads versus fin clips in Atlantic salmon. So those questions are great ones. We don't have all the answers there yet, but fin clips um, definitely do the job. And it's a matter of, you know, can we apply a fin clip to an historic um, frozen muscle sample, um, an epigenetic clock from one tissue to the other? That work remains to, to be done. Um, the, one of the issues with the protected species is developing the clock to begin with. So we need to have information that we can provide an accurate age estimate to generate the epigenetic clock. And this leads me to Ivy's question about the cost. So a lot of the cost is on the front end because, you know, um, maybe closely related species, you could apply an epigenetic clock for GAG to red grouper, which in our, our current funding, we're testing those types of ideas but maybe it doesn't apply to red snapper or to amberjack. Um, so maybe for closely, genet closely related species, you can apply the clocks uh, to, to um, conspecifics or con not conspecific, but, but congeners. The initial cost in developing the, the, the clock is, is pretty intensive because you have to do a lot of sequencing and you have to search for these CPG sites that are methylated um, some become methylated over time, some become demethylated. And then you have their search algorithms. So a lot of this is AI type of applications um, and, and cutting edge genomics work to identify the, the, the loci and develop the models. But once you have the models developed um, and you have um, primers developed for the markers that you're looking for, then it becomes quite inexpensive. And so the sequencing, we estimate the sequencing for that step once the clocks are developed um, and you know, given current um, costs are gonna be about $5 a sample because you can run a few hundred of them on a chip um, on a you know, high um, uh, multi-lane, you know, high rate sequencer. And that can be done in a matter of, of hours. Um, and so once, once you have the clock developed, it becomes really inexpensive. So there's some R&D on the front end, but those methods are um, being developed now and, and to try to streamline the process. Um, but once you have the epigenetic clock developed, it can be, it's gonna be quite inexpensive, um, we believe, to, to do the mass aging. Uh, thanks, Dr. Patterson. And we have a question from Alejandro. And it's, it starts off with a bit of a comment saying that fisheries independence survey with these tools are very useful for the evaluation of the resources. However, we still need to have a robust estimation of abundance. And this is a big limitation within the region. So what do you think should be prioritized in the Caribbean? Well, again, you know, different states have different priorities. Um, so, and, and, you know, different places have different monitoring already in place. As far as, as far as the abundance estimation, um, you know, perhaps close kin mark recapture is, is kind of off the table because of, of the expense 
and needing to pair up with a regional partner that you know might take years to develop and and you don't have the time to do that um, if you have surveys that are optical whether they're diver based or trap based um, or even rov based then you can put stereo cameras on those platforms and start to collect length composition data in situ. That's particularly important for places that have MPAs in substantial areas, because if you're only looking at the catch, then you don't have an appreciation for what's happening with the MPA with the age composition and reproductive output. Um, with the red snapper situation in the Gulf of Mexico, one thing that we found in our study is that there's a biomass of fish that's away from the structured habitats um, that's fairly substantial. And so the stock assessment is tracking the age composition and landings and effort for the, the habitats that are exploited, but we have this um, portion of the stock that may be lightly exploited or relatively unexploited. Um, and so there's maybe a disconnect there in the population estimates, at least from as far as the the total population size in the Gulf. Um, the same thing could happen in the Caribbean where you had an, uh, uh, you know, a given portion of the shelf uh, of, of a given you know, country that had you know, quite a bit of protected area. The exploited area may look a certain way, um, but the protected area obviously should be, should be um, much healthier with more complete age composition data. So I think you can actually produce estimates of population size um, with these surveys. A, a key caveat is is the um, behavior of the animals and whether you have cryptic biomass or not, or whether you have avoidance or attraction, um, that can be assessed behaviorally quite, quite easily. Um, and then another approach that I didn't talk about here that can be utilized to estimate population size is to do um, high reward tagging. So you set your rewards high enough so that you have you know, a reasonable expectation that if fish are caught by fishers, they're gonna be reported. So you can use that approach to estimate exploitation rates. Um, if you have exploitation rates and you have estimates, good estimates of the catch, then you can estimate population size. Or alternatively, um, you could utilize the um, tagging data to actually estimate population size. Um, some more assumptions are involved there, but um, that's another approach that can be used. And again, that can give you information on fairly short time scales, um, on you know the order of a year or two, instead of having to wait, you know, a decade or longer to develop these catch and effort time series um, that are required for some of these approaches. Thanks, Dr. Patterson. And Hazel, first of all, starts off by saying it was a fantastic talk and she learned so much. Um, so this is from Hazel Oxenford. And so she asks, do you envisage a regional lab that can provide a genetic based stock assessment results to the fisheries divisions across the region with little funding or capacity for this type of scientific research? Yeah, so um, that's an excellent question. And I know it's something that, that Dave Portnoy and Chris Hollenbeck have discussed. Um, and, and again, um, you know, I'm, I, I contribute some of the life history components to, to their research uh, in, in these fields, um, and, but they're really the leaders and the go-to folks for those types of questions. The, I, I think this is possible. And one thing that we need to keep in mind is that you know, a lot of the you know, successful business folks um, internationally um, or within the US have set up um, environmental or marine related NGOs um, to fund or foundations to fund, you know, these sort of big questions and, and large scale ideas that have the potential to benefit humanity. Um, and so this could be an area that they find, you know, value and in, in, in contributing funding. So I think it's a great question. Um, it's we're we're kind of on the front end of this, but but it's coming, and and obviously um, every year, just like computing power gets less expensive, um, you know, sequencing gets less expensive, and so you know by the time this becomes operational, these quotes and figures, rough estimates, really, um, that I that I gave in response to to Ivy Barrymore's question, you know, they're going to get lower and lower and lower, um, and and so. There's the there's the potential for this, you know. I, I don't work in 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 that realm of of seeking um, international funding on on that scale, but I know some folks who have 
who ha have tapped into that for, you know, lionfish type of research or um, other type of um, exploratory research in the region. So it, it's possible. Um, I just don't know what that would look like quite yet. And sort of a follow up and the look and forward um, aspect of this. Uh, we have a comment and a question from Alfonso Aguilar Pereira. And he says that the wealth of science devoted to stock assessments within the US is remarkable. However, how is this outstanding science being done to provide key recommendations in management to protect, say, for example, the Goliath group in the US since the government appears um, to not really be addressing its protection? Wow, nothing like a loaded question here at the end. <laughs> um, well, I, I won't make a comment on whether I think that the government appears or doesn't appear to be addressing the protection. You know, um, for those of you in, in other parts of the region um, that, that may or may not have, you know, tracked some of the recent um, management or political activities. So there will be a limited fishery for Goliath in, in the next year or coming years um, that um, has, you know, a lot of folks on either side of the argument um, very heated at the moment. And, and so what I would say to that, you know, with the Goliath example is um, I stay out of the politics. If they're going to be landed fish, let's get every single piece of data and tissue possible from those fish, right? Let's coordinate with FWC and make it so that those fish don't become um, you know, Goliath burgers or fillets, but they become scientific specimens um, and that we collect those and, and we archive all of the data um, and then, you know, maybe fillet the fish, give it to a food bank. Um, you know, there are issues with larger Goliath and, and metals, um, perhaps PCBs. Um, but but um, so anyway, you know, I, I say get as much information as you possibly can. And one thing that I try to do in this talk, but but maybe I, it, it didn't come across clearly enough, is I, I agree with this idea that the wealth of, of um, resources devoted to science in the U.S. isn't matched in other places in the region. However, um, I think, you know, there are examples of things that I talked about in, in the research I presented today that these are, these are tractable problems and questions and methods um, that can be utilized with very little investment and likely able to tack on to existing surveys and monitoring to make those, you know, those investments more, more meaningful um, and to be able to utilize information that probably already exists to some extent. Um, and, and then, you know, perhaps as technology becomes more available and, and, and some of these analyses become cheaper, then it can be scaled to, um, to those uh, more rigorous or, or more scientifically advanced approaches. But, but I think the opportunity exists already um, for some of these approaches that are, that are quite easy to implement. Thanks, and yes, that concept of uh, capacity, build, capacity building and technology transfer from sort of the developed countries to developing countries is really um, what's needed. Um, so we have, uh, a comment and a question once again. Um, this one is from Ron Hill. And he first refers to a slide which you highlight the work of comparisons of simple or simple static to complex or dynamic assessment approaches. And you mentioned that dynamic perform better. So he asked, were those data based on simulations of known stock conditions? so that the indicators of overfishing condition was better characterized. And again, he says, great talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks for the question, Ron. So um, what's meant by dynamic versus static in this case in, in the Carruthers um, simulations was that the models themselves, um, as you add more data, the dynamic models refresh, and so they would change. But the static models, um, don't and and so that was not that one is more or less complex you can find a range of complexity among the static models and a range of complexity among the dynamic models here um and it's the second part of the question had to do with were these um data from known stocks no um 
so there are four other life history types that they they explored. And so we have snapper and porgy, and so they pulled from the literature among luchanids, among um, sparids in this case, and they came up with this sort of model species and they give the details how they set up their simulations um, in their in their paper. So the Sagaris um, analysis from 2018, where they took data rich Gulf of Mexico assessments and they applied the data limited methods. They weren't, for example, able to utilize these F ratio estimates because they don't have an independent estimate of a, a biomass available there. By doing the simulated um, studies, like simulating what the stock dynamics are for fishes with these different life histories, these authors, Carruthers et al, were able to, you know, say, okay, well, this is what the biomass was because they, they created it, right? There's the simulated population. So then these methods can be assessed whether they can, um, how, how well they provide management advice based on the known simulated population that wasn't available in the comparisons between data rich assessments and data limited assessments in the Gulf, because there's, there's not this um, estimate of stock biomass, which would be critical for these abundance um, based, um, you know, sort of F ratio approaches, um, which Carruthers showed to be to actually perform quite well, even though they're, they're fairly simple. And um, they do have this requirement of having an estimate of abundance, which is an important um, and often limiting, you know, approach, you know, with the assessments that Sagaris looked at, um, they, they weren't able to do that because they didn't have an independent estimate of, of abundance. Um, but that's why in the simulation um, framework that could be done. Thank you. And Ron says that clarified everything. So thank you. And Alejandra sort of had a follow-up comment um, in relation to the previous um, response related to capacity building. Now, Alejandra said it is, it is a capacity, build, capacity building issue. And he comments that GCFI and partners have been working very strongly um, by bringing, um, by providing acoustic technology workshops within the region. Uh, there was a question um, from Kelly King on, who again uh, says great talk and asks, will the epigenetic agent vary with latitude? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so um, some of the work that's been done in Europe shows that temperature can have an effect. And I showed you the plot from European sea bass. Um, it's unknown like how much the temperature um, will affect the, the, the rate of methylation or demethylation. Um, some of the work that we're doing on the East Coast, we have fish that are sampled um, in South Florida, red grouper and red snapper. And then we have fish that are sampled off the Carolinas. So, you know, we go from um, low 20s latitude, 20 degrees north up to, you know, almost 40 degrees north. So we have, um, we have quite a latitudinal range there and, and temperature um, will be explored in, in that respect. In that work, um, Dave and, and Nick uh, and, and Chris Hollenbeck will be developing the epigenetic clocks for the Eastern Gulf of Mexico and then applying them to fish caught in other regions. So we'll be able to track how well they, that clock performs in these, other, in these other regions. The amount of error in the um, data from temperature from either Atlantic salmon or European sea bass um, is not um, you know, deal breaking that I've seen to this point, right? But again, this isn't my area of research. Um, we, you know, we contribute some of the life history information to try to make the thing go forward. But you know, from what I've seen, um, you know, I'm 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 really just a cheerleader for it. I, I think this is incredible. I think it's it's going to be the most fundamentally uh, has the potential. Don't get carried away here. Has the potential to be the most fundamentally game changing um, new approach in in quite a while. Um, but there are some of these assumptions and and um, limitations that need to be further explored and temperature is definitely one of them. But what I've seen so far in the data, it, it seems like, you know, it's gonna add some process error, you know, some natural variability to, to the models, um, but it's, it doesn't appear to be on the scale of just aging error um, that we see, you know, in species like, you know, vermilion snapper or, or scamp, for example. 
Thanks for clarifying that. Um, we have a question from uh, David Gill, who's our keynote for Friday. And again, says great talk. And he's following up on um, Hazel's question. And he says, of all the methods you propose, if there was a single method to inform fisheries management across the region, which one would you pick? Well, you know, there's not one single question across the region, right? So I, I think um, I have this slide up on data limited methodologies, for example. Um, and, and so what are the management objectives? Data triage tells you what data exist. Then we can focus resources to approach this um, appropriately, you know, to get the most return on additional investment or to get more out of already invested funds in, in monitoring, et cetera. Um, and so I, I don't really wanna give you a cop-out answer of that it depends, but it, it depends. Um, some of the more advanced, um, you know, some of these molecular approaches, I think um, we're still in the developmental stage. And um, I, th I, so far, so good. They're very promising, um, but there's a real scale difference between, you know, doing, um, you know, um, some of these optical-based approaches around, you know, an island state in the Caribbean versus doing this um, genomics and AI-driven um, population estimation. And so, you know, it's hard to compare and say, well, you know, I would do this one, of course, um, because, you know, they're, they're just so much different in cost and, um, and needed expertise. You know, if there was an unlimited budget, then I think these molecular approaches in the long run, are, they just, they're just, they look so promising, you know, and, and I forget the paper that describes this, this, um, this idea. But basically, you know, there's new technology and everybody gets on board and real excited. And then then you and, and what's promised and then you get to kind of plateau of what's actually deliverable. And then perhaps it wanes down a little bit and you get to the, the zone where the technology matches the scale of questions that can be addressed you know, adequately well. So right now we're definitely on the, the curve of you know, sky is the limit. Um, and you know some of these studies coming out of Europe with you know temperature effects or, or tissue effects for the meth, um, methylomic or um, um, epigenetic aging, you know there maybe that's going to start to tell us where the limitations are in that. Um, so anyway, kind of a long-winded answer to say in the end it, it just kind of depends. And we have a question from Holden, and once again starts off by saying it was a really great talk. And he says, these novel and innovative assessment methods are certainly exciting and seem sort of revolutionary. And he asks, do you see any potential biases or issues or vampires in the closet? That is, do you have any general cautions as these new approaches are implemented? Yeah, so we're at the stage now of, of trying to, to kick the closet door open and, and poke and prod and and try to understand exactly where the where the limiting factors are. You know what assumptions are easily met. What assumptions can be, you know, devastating if they're not met. Um, with the with the close kin mark recapture, you know, the Australians are by far, you know, ahead of the the rest of the, the globe um, in that technology, and um, you know they've they've started to explore these issues. And, you know, reproductive biology and, and um, skip spawning, you know, a lot of these things that, that you know, befuddle reproductive ecologists, um, fisheries ecologists, can have a big effect also in the estimation of population size from the genomics. So it's critical to have great reproductive biology information. And that's a component of the work that we're doing in the Atlantic on Red Snapper is to fill out the geographic gradient of reproductive information so that we don't end up with, you know, extrapolating beyond the limited geographic range of the data that currently exist. Um, and so, yeah, those are, those are great questions. Um, you know, part of my answer is we don't really know where all of the issues um, may exist. Uh, you know, there there are a couple of different groups, um, uh, Robin Waples in, in um, the Northwest 
and Eric Anderson, who's at this, he's in the Southwest Fishery Science Center, um, but um, lives in Colorado. They, they've been doing a lot of simulation testing. Um, Paul Kahn's done a simulation testing that shows some of these areas to be wary of and areas where, you know, violating assumptions can have big effects on the close kin mark recapture approach. So through simulation testing, we get some idea of sensitivities, um, but then, you know, real world data sometimes provides us with more re realistic expectations for where problems may, ex may arise. So all I can say to that effect is that, you know, the folks that are, you know, really focused on this have been doing quite a bit of work to try to examine it because, you know, the agency, you know, the NOAA fisheries clearly understands, appreciates the potential here. Um, but, but also there's another component that, that we need to um, get our hands around. And that's actually, you know, integrating um, these external estimates of population abundance with stock assessment. So if we have a data poor stock, then we don't have to worry about, you know, how does this affect the stock assessment because there isn't one. But if you have a population um, assessment like Gulf Red Snapper, and then you produce this one point estimate, you know, with variance, uh, not a point estimate, but the, but the single year estimate of what the population size is of age two plus individuals, you have to find a way to reconcile that information with all of the other data sources that are pointing to a different answer to what is the population size. So there's also a considerable amount of work that's being done by various groups to try to handle that side of it too, is how do you actually merge these pieces of information? Um, and I think that's gonna be critical in the future. And it, and it gets back to, you know, Punt's recent paper again, um, et al, their, their paper on, you know, what, what will the future integrated assessment model platform look like? Well, this issue of scalability and being able to bring in these external estimates of um, population size are gonna be critically important to that. Uh, thank you, Dr. Patterson. We're just about um, at the end of our time here. So I, I don't know if you have any closing words you might want to share. Um, yeah, I just uh, I think the future is really bright. You know, we have a lot of cool stuff that's going to be happening in the next so often. And, um, you know, I think everybody can look at their career and, and you know, they, they get maybe to the end of a certain phase and they're like, what's going to be next? Um, and, and, and just the trajectory of fishery science, you know, things, the, the, uh, the punctuated equilibrium model seems to be um, appropriate. And, and so I think we're at a space now where this is kind of rapidly expanding. But, but fortunately, I think for our region, it's expanding in, in directions that are technologically advanced and quite expensive, but it's also advancing in places where I think um, more groups can put their arms around the technology and the approaches to provide answers so that we have sustainable fisheries for the long term. And thank you, Dr. Patterson. There are some sort of questions that have just popped up um, related to um, in situ kits. So I know you've uh, already said your closing words. Maybe we can just squeeze in one final question. Um, so Bob Glazer says, getting back to DNA methylation, how feasible will it be to develop an in situ kit for age estimation using this method? And he was thinking specifically of species that are processed at sea, for example, queen conch, where aging is virtually impossible and the, large in, the largest individuals are not necessarily the oldest and the catch is cleaned and the shells are discarded at sea. And I think that will be our uh, final question for today. Yeah, that's a great question, Bob. I think, um, you know, things like ELISA assays are, are not going to be feasible with this approach. Just because, um, so for example, in the Red Snapper work that Nick Weber recently reported from his dissertation, you know, there were 200 of these CPG sites that were part of his epigenetic clock. For um, Red Grouper, there were about 60. And, but to get to that point, there were millions of CPG sites that were sequenced using next-gen sequencing, um, you know, really high throughput and, and um, really intensive genomic modeling uh, or co computational um, um, requirements there. So, you know, maybe there can be an ELISA assay, assay that is focused on 
is this a boy or a girl um, red snapper? But I don't think the epigenetic aging um, is anywhere close to being able to do that approach. However, um, if you send vials of DMSO in the field and your fisher folk or observers can reliably and cleanly put tissue samples into those vials, even if it's just the, the scraps that, you know, after the meat has been extracted before the shell is discarded, um, then you should, you'll have a tissue sample to do the genomics work. So I don't foresee, you know, field-based assays and age estimation in the near future. However, I do think that extract, getting the samples to do the lab-based work is clearly feasible. Um, and we're working, for example, with FWC, uh, Bev Saul's group in, um, in, in, um, at FWRI to get fin clips from regulatory discards. So this one thing that I didn't really talk about at all is the game changer this potentially can be for estimating the age of regulatory discards, right? So we have maybe length composition data now that we have to apply an age length key to, or even just a growth function. Um, but if we can get a fin clip, not only can we do all these other genomic analyses, but we can age the fish. Um, so tissue sample, easy to collect in the field, um, assay to directly estimate age on the boat while you wait, unlikely. Thank you, Dr. Patterson. This has been a truly enlightening and it was enlightening talk and it was great to, for you to share your wealth of information. And I can see that there's a lot of interest in this topic and I would encourage um, all, our all our attendees to continue asking questions and also keeping these conversations going. So thank you again, Dr. Patterson. We, we are truly honored to have had you here as our keynote, pre keynote presenter. And hopefully next year, uh, we'll have you in person rather than virtually, if I'm right. Yeah, well, th yeah. Thank, thank you again um, for, for inviting me. You know, I always learn a lot at GCFI when I'm able to attend. And um, I'm, I'm, you know, thrilled to, you know, have been able to kind of put some thoughts together on these subjects. One last kind of parting um, idea here I want to convey is that, you know, in the stuff that I presented, there's only a, a small component that's my own research, you know, and things that, that my, my, my group is, is examining and looking at. So if there's anything that I talked about that people have questions of, if they shoot me an email, I can answer questions of things that I directly work on, or else I can give you links or email addresses of colleagues um, or even people that, you know, I, I don't know and I'm just citing their work. Um, and, and that way they can get it, you know, straight from the source. It's, that's a much better approach. Thank you, Dr. Paston. And yes, there are still a couple of comments coming in about how much people enjoyed your talk today. So thank you again. And we're going to get things ready to move on for our next session, which is related to reef-related fisheries. So you've set a really good um, foundation for our future discussion. So thank you again, Dr. Patterson. Yep. You're welcome. And I would like to invite um, our moderator for our reef related sessions, uh, Dr. Bryce Simmons, to join us while we get all the other new panelists set up.
Um, Bryce, are you able to um, enable your mic? Yeah, good morning, everybody. Yep, there we go. Are we good to go, Fadila? Yes, and I will um, share um, the presentations from my site. Okay, perfect. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, uh, today we've got a series of talks all related to um, uh, fisheries in the wider Caribbean region. Um, the first of our speakers is David Cochran. David is a PhD student at Florida International University with Dr. Alistair Har Harborn. Uh, David, are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you for that introduction. Um, my name is David Cohan. I'm a PhD student at FIU. Um, and the broad focus of my research is how the loss of structural complexity on coral reefs affects reef fish assemblages, predator-prey interactions, and herbivory. Uh, so anthropogenic stressors are directly and indirectly causing coral bleaching and reef degradation, and Caribbean coral cover has declined by 80% since the 1970s. Um, and Florida reefs are no different. High coral mortality is outpacing coral growth and settlement, leading to negative carbonate budgets, uh, where the erosion of calcium carbonate reef structure is faster than new reef is built. And over time, these reefs are degrading from complex heterogeneous habitats with lots of ledges and crevices, turning into flat homogeneous habitats. And fish are critical to ecosystem functioning on coral reefs. They supply uh, crucial roles such as grazing and nutrient cycling, and many reef fish rely on the structure provided by coral reefs. And there are a lot of gaps in our knowledge of how structure drives reef fish assemblages. We know it's important, but we lack a lot of species specific knowledge and a lot of mechanistic knowledge. So for my talk, I predicted which fish will be the winners. So which ones are gonna do better on these flattened degraded reefs and which ones are the losers that are gonna do worse. And then I took it one step further and included a trait-based analysis to identify some of the mechanisms that might explain why fish associate with structure. So I used NOAA fish and benthic survey data from nearly 4,000 Florida reefs across the Florida reef tract. Uh, and I used 21 anthropogenic and biophysical data layers. And I built density models for 109 common reef fish species. I extracted the contribution of maximum hard relief, which is our measure of complexity and coral cover for each of these species. And these associations with relief and coral cover were um, used to predict the winners and losers. 52 of, our, of the 109 species were losers of the loss of relief and 10 will decline with decreasing coral cover and only 17 species increased on flattened reefs and seven increased with decreasing coral cover. And as you can see on the figure on the right, which is uh, Florida Keys uh, field guide, a lot of the losers are uh, the charismatic reef uh, fish species or the ones that are important for uh, important targets for reef fisheries. So then I used those uh, associations with relief and coral cover for the trait-based analysis, where I tested if 13 morphological, uh, behavioral, ecological traits could explain those associations. And we found that morphology and swim performance were, were really important predictors with four of the eight significant traits uh, being made up by body roundness, tail shape, swim mode, and size. The species better at maneuvering on complex reefs seem to have traded off some ability to persist on flat, uh, in flat habitats. Uh, and bigger species are linked to reefs with bigger structure. Uh, generalists are expected to do better, which makes a lot of sense if they can live in habitats other than just uh, coral reefs or those that can potentially seek uh, refuge in uh, deeper water. And piscivores will be major losers and intermediate trophic levels are uh, expected to be winners. And I hope that these results will help with the management of reef uh, fish uh, across species and help design reef restoration strategies to match some of these species needs. Uh, thank you. Perfect. Um, thanks, David. So uh, just as a reminder to folks that are that are with us, um, please, if you have any questions, feel through, free, uh, free to throw them into the Q&A and or the chat, it's better to use Q&A if you can, but if you get in the chat, we'll also look at those. We're gonna save questions in, until the end and then we'll have uh, a, a moderated Q&A session for all of the speakers. Um, Dr. Christy patton gill Simmons, uh, uh, her talk is going to be at the end. I'm actually, well, 
<laughs> let me let's do that at the end, uh, Fidel, if you don't mind. Um, uh, so we'll do that at the, the as the last um, talk for this session. So next, let's do Jack, uh, Jack Olson, if that's okay. Uh, Jack is a research techni technician with the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center in Lajas, Puerto Rico. Uh, Jack, are you there? Yes, I am. Um, awesome. Yeah, and, uh, I guess my location on my bio was wrong. I'm actually located in Edgewater, Maryland now, but I went to graduate school in Puerto Rico. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, no problem. So my talk focused on um, recruitment patterns of juvenile snapper in the middle Florida Keys uh, between 2007 and 2019. And uh, this effort utilized a long-term SANE data set collected by FWC in Marathon um, over this time period. And it included roughly 1,500 surveys. Um, accompanying each survey, we uh, collected benthic habitat and environmental data. And um, yeah, the main, the main two objectives of, of this effort were one, to develop um, retrospective annual recruitment indices for five species, um, gray snapper, mutton, lane, schoolmaster and yellowtail, and as well as developing uh, annual indices, we wanted to model relationships with benthic habitat variables and envir environmental covariates. So the, the main variables we looked at were um, seagrass type, percent cover, distance from shore, um, sea surface temperature, wind speed, and lunar illumination. The principal findings from um, our recruitment modeling was that in 2010, we saw pronounced low recruitment for four out of our five species. Um, and we believe this is related to a widespread cold snap that affected South Florida this year. Um, and there's been a lot of other published research showing that uh, this cold spell affected adult populations of both fish and corals. Um, however, this is one of the first examples that we know of showing effects to recruitment. Um, and second, we found uh, pronounced high recruitment for mutton snapper in 2015, which uh, is interesting because it correlates with, um, with data from the, the broader Florida Atlantic mutton stock. So this would indicate that the uh, recruitment we see for mutton snapper in the middle Florida Keys is reflective of patterns in the broader mutton stock. Um, in terms of our habitat variables, um, seagrass type and cover were the most uh, important habitat variables and um, as well as distance from shore. And in general, um, habitat variables were stronger predictors than environmental variables. Um, and this, this has to do um, with several things, which I talk about in detail in my talk, but uh, one, one of them could be that uh, the way we collected fish and when we collected fish, we not, might not have been capturing the actual conditions at settlement. Um, so lastly, uh, we hope that the, date, the uh, recruitment indices we developed here will aid in the interpretation of um, possible or potential um, effects due to from regulatory action in the Florida Keys. Um, one being the uh, recent closure of the Western Dry Rocks multi-species aggregation site that happened this year. Um, and second is the proposed NOAA regulation, uh, sorry, restoration blueprint, um, which would protect a variety of areas across the Florida Keys. So thanks. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Jack. Uh, next, we have Jay Grove from uh, the Southeast Fisheries Science Center. Jay is a research fisheries biologist at the center. Jay, are you there? I am. Hey. All right. Hey, good morning. So the summary of this talk, so I, I guess I didn't follow the instructions. Let me say my email, if anybody needs it, is j j a y dot grove at noaa.gov. And instead of taking the space up the top of my slide to do that, I put all my co-authors because there's um, a huge group that's working on this project. So this project really developed um, on the PI for the National Coral Reef Monitoring Program, which means that we survey 
fish from zero to 30 meters in the US Caribbean. In this case, we're focusing on St. Thomas, St. John. And so the question that we had was, is the National Coral Reef Monitoring Program doing a good job or are we missing something by not surveying from 30 to 60 meters, which is out to the reef shelf in St. Thomas, St. John. So we launched this project with the Coral Reef um, Conservation Program funding with the University of Virgin Islands, Dr. Tyler Smith's group and really surveying out from 30 to 60 meters using the same methods that we use from zero to 30 meters to see if there was a difference, if there's maybe a refuge for some of the recreationally and commercially targeted fish species. And on the, you can see on the map, the blue is traditional NCREMP and the green is the area surveyed by what we coined as DCREMP, the deeper surveys. And you can see that in St. Thomas, St. John, that reef um, shelf from 30 to 60 meters is a large area. And so in general, um, what we found after, this is just comparing one year of survey data. So really limited, um, we're doing it for three years. So we'll have more information in the future, but we did see a higher density of some of our targeted species from 30 to 60 meters. And so is it a refuge was our question. And you know, that's what the fishermen are always saying, right? The bigger fish are deeper, um, you know, and is that is that really true? And so what we found is for some species, it's not. So hogfish is the top graph. We see smaller hogfish in both of the surveys about the same size, we start picking them up. Um, and we see larger hogfish in both of the surveys. So in that case, I would say NCREMP is doing a really good job and we can probably, the reason why I'm interested in this question is right, I work for the Southeast Fishery Science Center, which is tied to stock assessment. Although I don't do stock assessment, you know, they're always looking for streams of data that could be used to assess fisheries. And if this could be a, a viable data stream for them. And in this case, I would say NCREMP for hogfish is a viable data stream because we're really not picking up anything different in the deeper water. However, for species like red hind, we are seeing both of the shallow water surveys and deeper water surveys picking up these fish. However, about the time that they reach um, sexual maturity, length at maturity, we're seeing more of these larger fish in the deeper water surveys. So there may be this refuge for some species and red hind is an example. So obviously limited data, one year, um, they just finished collecting year two and then they're planning um, November now and um, they're planning to go out to collect year three next year. So we will have you know more interannual variability and more to look at, but it's an interesting first look um, that it might be variable depending on the species. And if that's the case, it's a big area of the reef track that we're leaving out when we're calculating densities. And I guess the last thing I would say is I couldn't do this without UVI. This is UVI supplies all the tech diving. Um, it's a huge partnership between NOAA and UVI. And so um, we all are working together to figure out how to best present this information moving forward. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you, Jay. Um, next up, we've got Gretchen Goodbody Gringley. She's the Director of Research for CCMI, the Central Caribbean, Carib Caribbean Marine Institute on Little Cayman. Gretchen, are you there? I am, thank you. All right, uh, so I'm gonna talk to you all today about uh, some work that we have been doing in Grand Cayman for about the last 18 months. And it was really driven by the response to COVID-19 and how activity has changed on our reefs here in Cayman since, um, since the pandemic. And specifically, looking at how the lockdown has impacted fish populations. So like everywhere else, uh, Cayman experienced a lockdown associated with COVID-19. Here that implied basically everyone was required to stay inside their houses for a period of about four months. So there was no activity on the water at all. Uh, so no recreational diving was allowed, no snorkeling. We couldn't even go to the beach. So this was a long period of respite for these fish populations. When they finally let us out in July, 2020, my team decided that it would be very interesting to look at how this has impacted the populations in and around Georgetown Harbor. 
We specifically chose Georgetown Harbor because it's a cruise ship port. At any given time, we can have up to nine cruise ships just off offshore. And so this has a major impact on the fish populations because they use dynamic positioning, so it's quite loud underwater. So to assess this, we did a series of fish surveys every two months. So we started in July 2020 and have been continuously doing surveys every two months since then. We did our last set of surveys in October. And uh, you can see from the graphs here that we did find a significant impact in this lack of activity on the fish population. So I will say that we used 2018 AGRA survey data as our baseline. So they were taken from similar sites along West Bay in Grand Cayman for our comparison. And so that's the first data point that you see in these timelines. So we found a significant and almost immediate increase in fish density. There was a lag in the increase in biomass, which we think was probably related to recruitment as a driver uh, for this increase in density. And then when we looked more specifically into these various populations, and uh, the different trophic guilds, we found that herbivores in particular responded the most significantly compared to other trophic groups. And within that, it was the parrotfish that had the largest response. So you can see the graph on the bottom showing this significant uh, trend of increasing parrotfish densities. Uh, if you were able to watch my talk, you would also see that we broke that down into initial and juvenile parrotfish versus a terminal stage males, and this pattern is driven by an increase in juveniles and initial stage fish. Uh, and so again, this points to recruitment as the driver for increased densities over time during this period when we have much less activity. I will say that the Cayman Islands remains closed, so there is no tourism still. So diving activities, fishing, we have no cruise ships, uh, so all of that still has been quite minimal, which I think is important because we didn't see this increase in biomass really until our most recent set of surveys. So that lag is quite significant. Um, and so in order for the population to fully rebound, it will take several months to years um, of this reduced disturbance time. Um, and so with that, I just want to thank my funders, uh, which is the Darwin Plus, as well as uh, walkers. Uh, so thank you. Awesome, thank you, Gretchen. Um, next up, we have Kate Overly. Kate is a fisheries biologist at the Southeast Fisheries Science Center. Kate, are you Hi there? Hi, everyone. Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. All right, so hi, everyone. Um, I'm gonna walk you all through a quick overview of the work that we completed. Um, but first, I'm gonna provide you with some background on why this sort of work is so important. So the knowledge of the spatial distributions of marine species is absolutely necessary for the development and implementation of management strategies for fisheries around the world. So the shift towards um, a more ecosystem-based fisheries management or EBFM has become more mainstream in recent years, focusing on aspects such as habitats, um, ecosystem processes, and the general sustainability of populations. Um, this approach to fisheries management does, however, require spatially accurate ecological information on the geographic distribution of the species, um, in addition to environmental variables that drive that species presence and contribute to its overall habitat preference. Um, so mapping and understanding essential fish habitats, or EFH, um, has become a very key component to enabling EBFM. So EFH um, has been broadly defined in the Magnuson-Stevens Fisheries Conservation and Management Act as waters and substrates necessary for fish spawning, breeding, feeding, or growth to maturity for those that are unfamiliar with EFH. Um, and then in the US Caribbean in particular, there is a very large lack of ecological information on deep water species, and it's made it extremely difficult to define EFH. Um, that said, recent improvements in habitat mapping technologies and underwater video systems have greatly advanced our ability to generate that spatially explicit data, um, particularly in those deep water habitats. Uh, so specifically, Queen Snapper is of interest from an ecological and a management perspective. It is a targeted component of the commercially important deep water snapper grouper complex um, that fisheries found throughout Puerto Rico and the Caribbean. Um, however, we know next to nothing about this species. 
Um, so in this study, we did investigate the use of presence only ensemble species distribution models or ESDMs. Um, and that was done to predict queen snapper distribution along the coast of Puerto Rico, um, specifically along the west, northwest, northeast and southeast coast, which you can see on that title slide there. Um, so we first mosaic um, archived multi-beam bathymetric data sets. Um, and then from that, we derived secondary terrain attributes to serve as our predictor variables. Um, so these environmental variables were then combined with our queen snapper presence from our catch and video data uh, for their integration into the ESDMs. Um, so then in using this method, we were able to model and analyze uh, queen snapper habitat suitability across differing spatial scales and amongst regions in Puerto Rico, which I go into a little bit more detail in the actual talk online. Um, but the, the habitat suitability, suitability modeling um, that we conducted in this study is the first effort made to map queen snapper presence probability um, and its un associated uncertainty in the US Caribbean. So areas of suitable habitat were predicted to occur throughout all three of the study regions, um, although they cover between 11 and 15% of the available habitat space in each region that we looked at. Uh, in particular, the bathymetry of each region was the largest driving factor in the ESDMs, um, as was high slope. The uh, vector ruggedness measure, or the VRM, which is a measure of seafloor rugosity, um, northernness and fine scale BPI also contributed very highly as well to our models. Um, so in general, our results essentially demonstrate that we can use seafloor characteristics um, and they function as effective predictors for queen snapper distribution across both mesophotic and deep water habitats. And then additionally, our results highlight the effect of spatial variability and habitat suitability at multiple scales uh, and the importance of taking scale into account when we're doing modeling for presence probability. And then our results do complement the very limited knowledge that we previously had on queen snapper that they can be found you know, near oceanic islands and reefs on the continental shelf and upper slope but it also broadens our understanding of potential habitats and highlighting hotspots for potential management concerns uh, such as EFH, which could then be incorporated into spatial planning under things such as EBFM in the future. Thanks. Perfect, thank you very much for that. Next up, we have, uh, and please correct me if I'm pronouncing your name wrong and apologies in advance, Leah Vernad. Uh, and Leah is from uh, the uh, she's a researcher at the University of Bordeaux. Yes, I'm here. So Leah Vigneault. It's Vigneault, a French name, you. so a little bit complicated to say, I know. Uh, firstly, are you hearing me good? It's okay. Everyone is hearing me? Yes, perfect. Okay, cool. Uh, first, I would apologize because it's my first time in the Gulf Caribbean Fisheries Institute conference. So I didn't understand that I have to put like a scheme on my slides. So sorry, I will resume already what I was talking about last week. So my topic was on the special variations in isotopic niches of two herbivorous fishes in the Guadeloupe Reef. So the goal of this study was to look at spatial variation of two herbivorous fishes, so Acanturus cerulis from the Acanturidae family and Sparizomariviridae from the Scaridae family, so parrotfish and surgeonfish. Uh, these two fish were studied previously in the Caribbean are really important in the regulation of the coral algal phase shift present in Guadeloupe. So the study was conducted during mostly one year because the different campaigns were done during three different master thesis and master projects. So one of, my, of the master thesis was mine, so it was related to this subject. And what we were looking about, it's the spatial variation of this fish on different, um, different sites on Guadeloupe. So we were looking at if we add the same trophic niche and trophic level for each of these fish species at different points and at different location around the Guadeloupe Island because it was didn't done before. So to look at that, we were sampling uh, different fish, so from the two species at five and four different sites around Guadeloupe. So locating facing the Atlantic Ocean or the Caribbean Sea or in or out reserve, marine reserve to see if there is an influence on the 
place on the traffic uh, on the traffic food web sorry and uh, we were also sampling um, Dicciota RG, which is at the basis of the traffic food chain to see if there is a relation between the Dicciota RG and the place of the different fish and different isotopic, uh, isotopic niches of these fish. So the conclusion of the study was that uh, we didn't add the same uh, isotopic position of the Dicciota RG depending of the sites. And we had similar results for the two fish species because we can see that depending of the site and depending of the place where the site was locating, so facing Atlantic Ocean or Caribbean Sea or in or out of reserves, we don't have the same isotopic niche for a species. So we can see that depending on the place on the island, we can have different um, isotopic niches. So maybe the same uh, food, uh, food, food habit, sorry, the same diet, but uh, sometimes not at the same level or not concentrated at the same, uh, yeah, at the same rate of nitrogen and carbon, depending on the place. I hope it was clear, sorry for my English. <laughs> was perfect. Thank you very much. I appreciate okay, that. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay, uh, next up we have uh, Anna Millinder. Anna is uh, a master's student at the University of Southern Mississippi uh, in Frank Hernandez's lab. Anna, are you there? Hi, yes, I'm here. Thank you. Um, so hi, everyone. Thanks for joining to hear a little bit about our project on the reproductive parameters of female red snapper and how they differ across depth. So red snapper are a reef associated species and they've been well documented to be highly associated with structure. And within the Northern Gulf of Mexico, they receive high fishing pressure um, by recreational anglers. Um, although there is a large body of literature on their reproductive biology, an aspect that often receives uh, little attention is how their reproduction interacts with changes in depth. Um, and a recent study by Brown Peterson et al found that depth was a more important predictor than structure type for reproductive performance. Um, so that led us to our um, study where our objective was to investigate the differences in reproductive parameters of a red snapper across three different depth strata. And if you look at the middle figure along the X axis, I've indicated the three different depth strata there. Um, for time sakes, we're going to jump straight into our results, um, but if you're interested in our methods, they're outlined in my 10 minute presentation. So if you look at the figure to the far left, we calculated a mean fork length for each depth stratum, and we found that as uh, depth increased, our fork length increased, and that females were significantly larger in the deep stratum. Um, we defined spawning capable females as females in the spawning capable phase and actively spawning subphase and calculated a percentage of spawning capable females within each depth stratum. Um, we found a similar trend that as depth increased, our percentage of spawning capable females increased and we ran a chi-square analysis and found that there was a significant relationship between depth um, and the percentage of uh, spawning capable females with the deep stratum contributing the most to that significance. Um, using the post ovulatory follicle method, we calculated the spawning interval or number of days between spawns for each depth stratum and found that females in the deep stratum were spawning every two days, where females in the shallow and mid were spawning every four and four and a half days respectively. We ran a chi-square analysis um, and found there was a significant relationship between depth and number of days, with the deep contributing the most to that significance. Additionally, we uh, calculated the fecundity and gonadosomatic index, and although there were no significant differences, um, they were both generally highest in the deep stratum. And all of this means is that we have our largest females that are more reproductively active and spawning more frequently in our deep stratum and therefore have a greater reproductive potential than females found in the shallow and mid stratums. And we hope these will be um, applicable to future stock assessments and useful in management decisions. Um, and we'd like to thank our funding sources and all the people that made this project possible. Um, and thanks for listening. 
Perfect. Thank you, Anna. Um, and then the last speaker of the session is uh, going to be Christy Pattengill Sammons. I am going to attempt to summarize her talk because Christy is on kid duty this morning. We're on the West Coast. Uh, so she's um, taking kids to school currently. Um, modern world we live in. So uh, Christy's talk was about Goliath grouper population trends in the Florida Keys and using citizen science data from the Reef Environmental Education Foundation to help inform trends in the populations of these uh, large creatures and then lead up to some potential new rules um, that are that are now actually going to be going into place related to take of the species. So in terms of background, um, Goliath grouper in Florida have been fished for uh, over a century. Um, data for from the fishery goes back to the, to the uh, 1950s. Um, and by and large, uh, the, the, the species has declined across most of that window of time, leading to a dramatic, uh, essentially crash in the fishery by the late 1980s. And because of that, the species was given full no-take protections in 1990 uh, uh, throughout Florida. And um, Following those protections, the species actually exhibited quite a quite a bit of a rebound in the multiple dif different data sources that existed up until around uh, the 2010s, the early 2010s. And so if you just look from uh, the point of protections in 1990 up to around 2010, it looks like everything's honky dory for the species. It's rebounding nicely. And um, thus in the in the mid uh, 2010 era, um, there was beginnings of a discussion regarding whether or not um, uh, management should consider moving beyond a full moratorium for the species. But uh, around uh, 2010 is when things started started to stop in terms of recovery of the species. And so if you look at in that, that plot in the center part of the graph, um, the multiple different uh, metrics of abundance that are available, uh, it's pretty clear that, that um, things are not no longer monotonically increasing. Um, however, uh, the, the MRIP catch data towards the, the 2010s suggests that, in fact, there's a blip uh, back up. And um, so there was discussion about opening, opening the fisheries in, uh, in the lead up to 2018. That proposal was ultimately quashed, but uh, because of that upward blip, um, and mounting pressure from the fishing community to open uh, take associated with the species, it was again brought before the, the Fish and Game Commission. Um, this was the uh, information that was presented. The blue line there represents surveys from reef divers. Reef Environmental Education Foundation uh, employs citizen science to collect observations as they dive, as they normally would on reef sites throughout uh, Florida and in fact the world. Um, and these data generate uh, both presence, absence, and relative abundance, single, few, many, and abundant on a log scale, one, two to 10, 11, 100, and more than 100. And because there's thousands and thousands and thousands of these surveys since um, 1993, it represents a reasonably long time series of information. And so what Christie presented was on uh, uh, an analysis, uh, a multivariate autoregressive state-based analysis that made use of these data and, and extended that time series of not only just um, uh, average estimates from these, these uh, surveys, but in fact, 95% uh, um, uh, credible interval estimates across space and time for, for the abundance of Goliath grouper up until 2020 last year. And um, when, we expend, when we extended out that time series, it's pretty clear that uh, in fact, Goliath grouper are, are not recovering. If anything, um, they're continuing a somewhat downward trend. Nonetheless, um, uh, the most recent rule uh, that was passed uh, allows uh, limited take through a lottery. I think it's 200 individuals. Uh, it costs you 10 bucks to enter the lottery. If you decide to get a tag, take one of these things, it costs you 500 bucks. Um, the maximum size, there's a slot limit for the fishery. It's only hook and line. The maximum size is 36 inches. So we're talking basically only sub reproductive fish. Um, and and uh, the fishery can't happen in uh, the southeast. So basically Florida Keys uh, um, up, up through Fort Lauderdale and, and a little bit beyond um, where most of the diving takes place. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you. Right, so um, with all of that said, I think we can uh, now move into the question and answer period. So for those, um, 
for those that are uh, that gave presentations in the talk, uh, I'm going to walk through the Q and A's and I'll read out the question and then give you an opportunity to respond. Um, See. If at that, sorry, go ahead. No, okay. Um, if at that point in time you have uh, questions that you would like to pose yourself, please feel free to do so. So, with that in mind, uh, we'll start with the first question um, from somebody that does not have a name or is anonymous, let's say. Uh, David, your fi findings are very interesting and hard hitting. You say you hope that they will help future management of reef fisheries resources. Can you please speak a little bit to how you think managers could use the results that you found? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the question and uh, thanks for listening. Um, so I think that uh, this framework kind of provides a lot of opportunities for managers uh, to manage reef resources. First of all, it's a list of what species are going to decline. And if you're interested in um, conserving or uh, the, helping with the recovery of some of these species, it'll give you an idea that, okay, we need to bring, uh, we need to add structure. We need to make sure that the structure that's there remains. Uh, we need to add coral for some uh, species. Um, it also is useful because it can be predicted to rare species. Nassau grouper weren't included in my analysis because they're too rare on Florida reefs. Um, and their traits will make them lo uh, major losers of the loss of relief. So they not only have to worry about being fished out, but if they don't have anywhere to live, they're not gonna recover. So if managers want to help with the recovery of Nassau grouper, they'll have to think about adding in structure or uh, preserving structure. I think the results from the trait-based analysis, especially the morphology portion, will help with designing artificial reefs. So if you want these Nassau grouper, you need to make sure that the reefs have appropriate, uh, these artificial reefs are appropriately sized for Nassau grouper, that they have areas of refuge from a high water flow or storms and places to, for them to potentially ambush uh, uh, as predators. And then finally, this framework can be applied to other uh, management questions. So what about species that uh, rely on nursery habitats like uh, seagrass and mangrove connectivity? Can we, uh, if we're targeting certain species, maybe we need to improve those uh, corridor, connectivity corridors from seagrass to coral reefs or mangroves to coral reefs? Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, next, uh, Nancy Brown Peterson asks for Jack. It appears that gray snapper recruitment was higher than for other species. Can you comment on possible reasons for that result? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Nancy. Um, so, yeah, we took this as uh, reflecting, of reflective of the fact that uh, the gray snapper population um, in general is larger than some of these other species. So that's kind of the short answer. Um, it could also be that some of these other species um, have been shown to recruit to other habitats besides seagrass. So um, hard bottom, um, namely, or potentially deeper habitats that we didn't sample. So it's possible that um, gray snapper were, were just better represented in the seagrass habitats than say like mutton or lane. But I think it mainly has to do with, um, yeah, the, the population of gray snapper in the Keys is um, higher than most of these other species. Okay, thanks. Perfect. Um, Jack, you got another question from Michelle Scherer, uh, who says, nice presentation. Um, do you think that the adjacent habitat mosaic may affect the number of recruits observed in some locations? Yeah, thanks, Michelle. Um, that's a good question. So uh, it's hard to say. One thing I will say is that um, the fish that we're picking up uh, re be restricted to uh, less than 40 millimeters. So these are new, very newly recruited fish. Um, another work has shown that, you know, within the first three weeks to a month of their life, the um, fish are not really moving around that much on a scale of maybe like tens of meters. Um, so from that perspective, it's I'm not sure that the adjacent habitat matters all that much in terms of moving from one habitat to another um, during that time frame. However, if we uh, step back and look at kind of like the next life stage, um, a lot of these fish will migrate from seagrass habitats into the mangroves. And uh, this is most notably shown, uh, known for uh, schoolmaster and gray snapper. Um, 
And not coincidentally, these are the two species which we found to have the strongest uh, relationship with distance from shore. Um, they were found most, most notably right along the shore, giving them easy access to mangrove habitats. So that, that would be something to look at in future analysis, like distance to mangrove habitats or distance to near shore structures such as docks, um, which I think could be important, especially for those two species. Thanks. Perfect, thank you. Um, Michelle also asks for Jay, great talk. Um, could the samples collected within the MCD boundaries influence the red hind results that you found? If so, how much do you think? So my computer's freezing a little bit and things are blocked. Um, I'm not quite sure, you know, that's something that we should look into after a, you know, a few years of samples. So we did sample, you know, in, in that Marine Conservation District area, um, but we didn't sample during any of the spawning aggregation times. So you would assume that the fish are dispersed, um, you know, throughout the reef. So I wouldn't expect there to be a huge influence, but um, we'll see, you know, and that's something that we can look at when we get more data. Perfect, thank you. Uh, okay, Nancy Brown Peterson asks for Gretchen. Um, first, she states, what a fantastic example of a fisheries release. Um, is the Cayman Islands government rethinking any sort of management uh, ideas associated with the results that you found? Uh, thanks, Nancy. I think that um, right now, the way that the Cayman Islands is going about reopening is really trying to think about the best way to balance uh, preserving the environment, but also making sure that tourism resumes. There's been a lot of controversy here regarding cruise ships. Um, if you follow what happened prior to COVID, uh, there was the potentially going to build a major cruise ship dock um, um, and that was overturned. And it seems that this, what we found with the, the data that I showed as well as discussions with the Cayman, Island, Cayman Islands Tourism Association is there's now been a move against increasing cruise tourism to potentially targeting more higher end, smaller ships. Uh, so I do think that these data will actually impact how we strategize the, the reopening of tourism here, which is just great to hear. Perfect, thank you. Uh, let's see, the next Rich Appledorn asks for Jay. Are we really talking about a refuge with depth or is it just an artifact of the ontogenetic distribution with larger individuals on average being found deeper? Yeah, Rich is right. Um, it may be a refuge for some species or it could just be how the species are naturally to, um, dispersed. Refuge sounds, um, it was a phrase that people were very interested in us using and you know that's how stock assessment folks were viewing it. So from that very, um, assessment oriented lens, but I completely agree, um, you know, ontogenetically that could be very natural and we're just picking it up in the deeper survey. So um, I think we need to do more. This was just an analysis, you know, just looking at both of the surveys, but really I didn't delve into the life history of any of these species in detail or, you know, what we already know about them. And, you know, like you said, red hinds may already be found in deeper water at larger individuals. And that might be something that's known and that's out there and published. So absolutely, it's a good point. Um, it doesn't sound as attractive as um, refuge, but I also feel like we don't wanna misrepresent any of the data um, if it's just you know presenting their natural range. So good point and um, it's taken and noted. Perfect, thank you. Um... Next up, Ellery Lennon asks a question for Anna. Do you think females are larger in deeper depths because of less fishing pressure? So larger individuals aren't as fished out? Hey, uh, yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, it will be interesting to investigate that. So a study that I cited in my presentation, Frank et al um, found that it was a result of fishing pressure and not necessarily an ontogenetic shift. But we do have the ages for all of these fish, so it'll be um, interesting to look into whether that is that age composition is shifting as depth increases, or if it's more homogeneous across depth. But that's a really good question. Thank you. 
Perfect. Thank you. Um, I'm going to now shift over to the chat. There's a series of questions um, that, that are also in the chat. So I'm going to start um, back to Michelle Scherer. She asks, um, or states, hi, Gretchen. Uh, you can reach out to the Cayman Islands Department of Environment, and perhaps they have recorders available. Um, and then she gives um, information for contact for her to talk about that. Yeah, I just want to say uh, thanks, Michelle. So Michelle posted a question earlier about uh, do I have any data on actual sound in the harbor? Um, and I do not at the moment, um, but I was saying to her that I would be very interested in finding a collaborator to um, expand upon this project and potentially put out some um, acoustic receivers or I don't have a lot of experience with soundscape data, so I would need someone um, to collaborate with. So if you're interested, please reach out. Well, she's a good one to collaborate with. I can speak from experience. <laughs> okay, um, perfect. Uh, let's see, uh, Alejandro Acosta asks, hi Jay, were you able to observe any differences related to snappers? That's you, Jay Grove. Um, okay. Yes, it depends on the species. So um, we just did a quick and dirty, I think uh, yellowtail snapper, for example, we did see some larger individuals at, in the deeper surface. Um, I don't think we looked at any of the larger body snapper. Um, so like a mutton snapper or anything like that, we may have the data to do so, but we just chose a handful of species. Really the species that we looked at initially were ones that we know that Southeast Fishery Science Centers considering um, doing stock assessments on in the CDAR process. So the species that we took um, to really looking at were queen triggerfish because that assessment's ongoing right now, yellowtail snapper, hogfish, and some of the parrotfish species that are coming up and slated to come up. Um, but yellowtail snapper, both um, as far as that species goes, we detected it in both of our surveys, um, the shallow water and the deeper water, but there were more larger and mature individuals in the deeper water survey. Thanks, and uh, Jay, sticking with you, Jack um, also asked, do you think that large hog, uh, hogfish abundance in both depth categories is related to ciguatera of, ciguatera avoidance by fishers? Yeah, that's definitely a possibility. I mean, that's kind of the reason why you see some of the large hogfish, large mutton snapper, you know, around those islands. It's, it's a possibility. Um, it's also habitat availability, you know, and what's available and what's looking good. And hogfish don't always, uh, so we did pavement, which is a big section of, we did aggregate, patch, and pavement in the deep water. And pavement um, is a habitat that really only we pick up, as far as targeted species go, really well we pick up queen triggerfish and hogfish. So there's a lot of pavement at that depth too. So it might just be habitat availability as well, but you're right, some of the largest individuals are there, which is not something you see in other areas and it's probably related to some preferences for the fishermen and new health. Thanks, Jay. Perfect. Um, okay, so um, Henri asks, Anna, is this reproductive effect of depth on red snapper found in other species? Hi, thanks for your question. Um, I focused most of my literature search on uh, red snapper. Um, however, I do know that gag grouper have deep water spawning sites, um, so it could be potentially that they have differences as well. Um, but um, that would be a really good step moving forward for this project to compare with other species. So thank you for your question. Perfect. Uh, let's see. Alejandro has a question for Gretchen. Were you able to evaluate changes in local fish consumption? Can this help to understand the increase on abundance? Uh, yeah, thanks, Alejandro. So I did not look at local consumption. I will say that during the lockdown period, fishermen were not allowed on the water. Um, so there was no fishing happening at all during that four month period. Um, and also the sites that I surveyed were within the marine reserve. So Cayman actually has a, a very extensive MPA area um, and the entire West Bay zone is encompassed within this marine reserve. So it's less likely that fishing would have had a direct impact on the increase that we saw at these sites uh, because of the restrictions with, during the lockdown period on fishing activity and because fishing is not allowed at these sites 
normally anyway. Perfect, thank you. And I'm gonna stick with you, Henri asks, um, if the increase in fish abundance appears to be driven by fish recruitment, how do you think that would have been affected by the lockdown? Right, so, well, we know that recruitment uh, can differ annually, seasonally, uh, based on a variety of impacts. So it's highly possible that this reduction in activity uh, impacted the success of the reproductive cycle that year. Um, so that's probably why we would have an increase in recruitment. Um, the parrotfish were more happy to reproduce. So fish use sound, for example, to locate mates. Um, you know, so potentially that could have, that could be interfered with during normal times, which was not um, when the cruise ships weren't there. Okay, thank you. Um, Christy, I think you're gonna be able to answer this. Christy is um, mobile right now, but let's see. Uh, it seems, this is from Ron Hill. It seems that the large increase in the most recent year of MRIP data might be an indication of a difference in sampling, especially as it compares to the reef data. Is anyone exploring validity of the various data sources? Uh, thanks for the question, Ron. I, you know, um, I don't know as much about um, the scale and scope of the MRIP data. Um, we do uh, the. So you're right that it could be a difference in. Um, geographic coverage, as Bryce had kind of alluded to, the, the reef data are obviously coming from sites that are diveable and um, focused mostly from just north of Palm Beach down through the Keys is where the, the bulk of the data are. Um, we do have some data going up the coast of the east coast of Florida and then some minimal patches of data in the west coast. Um, so yes, uh, certainly there could be some um, impact there. I think that the, I assume, because the, the catch data is mostly from um, incidental catch um, mortality, and um, there is a limited catch and release recreational fishery um, that happens. And um, so I don't, I don't know. We are not looking specifically at the the differences. Bryce, you might be able to expand a little bit more on what has gone into the model for the reef data. Uh, well, we did for the analysis, we did actually break the, the reef data up into the to the three regions or the the on the east coast, we did north northeast, so north of Palm Beach and then south of Palm Beach. And then we had a, a west coast um, region. And um, they, they do some fairly different things. Uh, Christy is right that there's a limited amount of data. Um, it's not, there are relatively less data, I will say. It's not necessarily limited. There's actually quite a bit of data from those other regions. It's just, there's a lot of data from the Florida Keys, for instance, uh, because people dive there a lot. Uh, but nonetheless, there's enough data from the different regions to see that they're, they're, they are doing some pretty different things, especially in the most recent time. Um, interestingly, at least to me, is that on the East Coast, it appears that they're decreasing the fastest. Um, and, uh, and then subsequent to that is uh, higher decreases in the Florida Keys. And then the, the area where it, it appears the decreases are the least uh, in, in the most recent years is in, on the, um, the, the north, Northeast uh, part of Florida. Okay. Next up, we have a question from Megan Davis. And uh, Megan says, hi, Leah. Um, can you tell us more about the different species of macroalgae the fish prefer to graze on? OK, so hello, Megan. Hello, everyone. Uh, OK, concerning the different species of macroalgae the fish prefer to graze on. So we didn't sample the macroalgae species, so I can tell you more about it. I can only tell you that the parrotfish, so the parrotfish studied, can graze on algal turf because they have the possibility to graze on coral and eat algal turf and also to eat macroalgae. Whereas the surgeon fish was mostly eating on macroalgae because his mouse don't permit it to graze a lot uh, on coral and on uh, what we call algal turf. So 
one of the future studies which could be really interesting related to your question will be to determine what exactly each fish species could eat as macroalgae, for example, on the different side to see if the difference in isotopic signature could came um, from a difference in trophic diet, maybe, because there will be maybe not the, exactly the same species depending on the site, or if it's only came from the situation of the site. Is it okay for you? <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. And while I've got you, let's do a follow-up question from Jack, Jack Olson. Yeah. Jack asks, uh, why do you think isotopic signatures differed between the east and west coasts? Okay, so isotopic signature will differ between the different coasts because if you look at the Guadeloupe, so I don't have a map to show you now, but the um, east coast is uh, located next to the Caribbean Sea. So it's really protected from the different big currents which are arriving from the Atlantic and the winds, whereas the west coast is really located, uh, sorry, I think it's the, I think it's the opposite, sorry. Yeah, the East Coast is facing the Atlantic Ocean, excuse me. So there is a lot of currents, a lot of winds which are coming and different water masses which are moving around. Whereas the West Coast is locating next to the Caribbean Sea. So you don't have the same water masses, you don't have the same influence of currents, the same temperature, et cetera. So you could have a really big difference concerning isotopic signature due to the place of the location. So if you have really influence of the ocean or no. Perfect, thank you. Okay, uh, let's see, I'm switching back over to the Q&A um, questions and uh, Alfonso Aguilar Pereira asks, Jay, would you, uh, why would mesophotic reef, reefs be a potential refuge for commercial fish? Why would they be? Is that the question? Is? Correct. Yeah. Why? Why would it be the case that they would be refuges for the? For you know, the if they're farther from shore, sometimes it's harder for fishermen to get out there and get them. So you know, will we see in other areas when we do the imprint survey, remote areas, um, whether they're in the Pacific Islands or they're in the Tortugas in Florida? You know, the more remote you are, the less fishermen that are out there. Those areas act as a refuge, and so the deeper water, for that same sense, could potentially act you know, as a refuge, it's a little bit further out, it's harder to get to, you can't get to it during certain weather. Um, whether or not, you know, it's actually a refuge, you know, as Rich brought up, or, you know, it's just, you know, where some of the fish live as they get older, um, but it does provide this distance from shore, you know, that really makes it a little bit less accessible to some of the fishermen, you know, especially some of the guys that are doing shallower water traps, or if you're spear fishing, you know, it does limit some of the fishing gears that you can use as well. You know, if you're going to go out there, you're going to be using gear that can fish in those deep water, and you have to be set up with that type of equipment, whether it's rod or reel, or, you know, a trap and lines that are that long. Um, so it, it does limit um, the fishery um, to some extent. Well, thank you. Christy, uh, Nancy Brown Peterson asks, if only mature fish are being harvested um, through, the, through the new rule, have there been any projections on, regarding how the, the take of those 200 fish will affect the population recovery? Yeah, I think uh, immature fish are taken, right? Bryce, is that what you meant to say? Uh, that's what I meant to say, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, um, that is a great question, and that is not something that um, that we are are have undertaken or, or able to at this time. Um, I I know that that has come up, um, and the um, let's see, FWC. So as I understand it, they did they did vote to approve the proposed rules. Um, they are going to be finalized at a meeting in 2022 with potential other revisions. So that's also something that there's still a little bit, it's not, as I understand the process, it's not set in stone yet. It's very likely that those will be the rules. Um, and then they wouldn't go into effect until I believe it's 2023. So there's still some time. So I would hope that there'd be some work done um, to, to evaluate 
that. Um, but because of the, there's been some talk about, you know, these fish are really vulnerable to the, the broad, um, the cold, cold snaps that happen sometimes, the um, ongoing red tide events have greatly impacted uh, the population. So there's a lot of stressors coming at them already. So even though there's pro relatively high mortality in juveniles anyway, just naturally, um, this could be just one more set of stressors taking you know upwards of 200 juvenile young sub-adults. Um, but unfortunately, reef data will not, we, our data set doesn't include any of these really young individuals because they're mostly in the mangroves. And, and um, sometimes people will do reef surveys in the mangroves, but very rarely. So that's a long answer to say that um, hopefully there's gonna be some work done, but not that I'm aware of. Okay, thank you. Let's see, an anonymous attendee asks Kate, um, at what spatial scale should maps be made to incorporate the essential fish habitat signal of deep water snappers and groupers, but also cover relatively large areas in the US and Caribbean? All right, so for that, in general, higher resolution mapping data is, is preferred, right? To pick up on those fine scale features that we're trying to distinguish in the maps to, to generate these models. That being said, a general rule of thumb, 10 meter or less or higher resolution um, would be ideal. However, the other side of that coin is that depending on your input data, you want your resolution to be the same or higher than or lower than um, your uncertainty in things such as your presence data. So for instance, for the queen snapper work, we had 30 meter resolution on the West Coast, meaning that our queen snapper presence data needed to be within 30 meters, our coordinates 30 meters or less um, in order to actually generate maps such as these. So with the Northeast and Southeast, it, it was eight meters. Um, so it's a bit of a tighter, tighter fit to match that data to. Um, some of our research that we're doing, so we kind of started off with this project is like a general overview and started incorporating a lot of these variables. We're also looking at inputting over 40 species of deepwater coral um, to serve as predictor variables to see if that affects queen snapper um, habitat suitability or other deepwater snappers in the region. And that's going to be kind of a future project from here. Um, but things such as ROVs, we are using coral data from the Okeanos Explorer, um, in addition to the fishery independent video survey that we run out of the Panama City NOAA lab. And so for the ROVs, they'll, they'll tell you a lot of the time what the actual uncertainty is. You know, it's 10 meter um, uncertainty in that coordinate where that coral was seen. So it's great to have really, really high resolution mapping data, but it needs to match the input data that you're using in a nutshell. Perfect, thank you for that. Uh, next, Alfonso asks for Gretchen, is there any data at the very same location on fish biomass before COVID? And I guess that um, may, maybe means beyond the agri data, is there anything additional? Because the agri data I think was before the COVID, um, if I'm correct, but answer. That's correct. So the aggregate was from 2018 by the CCMI team. Um, it wasn't at the exact same sites, but it was all within the general area of the West Bay um, at those main dive sites. Um, but we don't have anything beyond agra, which actually is limiting because agra works from a set species list. We had to filter our current data to make sure that we weren't over um, estimating abundances because we're counting everything as opposed to just this limited species list. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, Bob Ellis asks, Christy Bryce, you mentioned the vast amount of data available in the Keys. Is there potentially enough to separate out habitat effects on abundance? There's relatively little suitable habitat for adult goliaths in the Keys compared to the East Coast and Gulf. But I suspect dive effort is skewed towards higher relief sites where they would be more likely to be seen. Um, I'll, I'll answer that um, and say that, in fact, yes, uh, the, the model results that I showed, um, while a synthesis of all of the different effects in the model, 
um, based on an, or essentially an ordinal uh, time series. It, uh, that model itself has uh, a large amount of, of random uh, time varying effects, including um, diver effects, individual divers habitat. Uh, we actually used uh, NCRIMP habitat data. So, so Jay Groves group, we actually paired this analysis with a larger analysis of um, data from NCRIMP. So to look at matching up reef data uh, reef survey effort, citizen science data with um, a, a statistically designed federal fisheries survey and use the habitat classifications that they have to do their, their uh, randified stratum, stratified random design uh, as, as effects within the model itself. And I can't remember the specifics of how important habitat was, uh, but it was important enough that we included habitat as an effect within the model. Okay, uh, Ron Hill over in the chat asks Kate, uh, how are your study results affected by having multi-beam or good bathymetry but limited actual habitat data as opposed to if you had side scan, side scan sonar data of habitats available? Yeah, so unfortunately side scan isn't an option due to the depths that we're looking at. So the study was done between 100 and 500 meters, um, which is, you know, the general depth range, a little bit deeper than that um, for Queen Snapper, uh, which was the target. That said, it would be great to look at backscatter data from the multi-beam, right? So we tried to do that actually, um, to generate some of that sediment type um, and how the hardness return. It's difficult to mosaic rasters that don't overlap. So there's um, an R program um, that actually can do that, but you need, it requires overlap within your rasters. And unfortunately in the Caribbean, there's not a whole lot of overlap in those regions um, between the different data sets. So you can't really mosaic them all together in a uniform, um, in a uniform way. So it's really hard to plug that then into a model. Um, that also said is multi-beam does penetrate into the sediment. So it raises the concern of you're getting a hard return. However, is it sand with rock right underneath it? And then at, at what stage does that, does a fish notice that that's sand or is it, you know, can it tell that there's rock underneath the sand, you know, a couple inches down. Um, so it raises a lot of interesting questions. Um, I'm partial to side scan because we use it at work, <laughs> but again, not really an option with the depths that we're working at. Uh, but we do hope to kind of look into the sediments and integrating sediments into our models, um, trying to figure out a way to mosaic some of that backscattered data to get at some of those questions as well. Thank you. Mark Peterson asks for Anna, do you have any data on fish movement among the different depths? Hi, thanks, Mark. Um, for this study specifically, we do not. Um, this was um, a large study conducted by uh, both MDMR and CFRD that looked at the reef fish ecology around uh, natural and artificial reefs. Um, so unfortunately, we don't have any data on fish movement for this particular study. Okay, thanks. Um, looks like we're out of questions, so I get to ask some. <laughs> um, I'm gonna start with uh, Jack, a super interesting uh, talk. Thank you. And, and um, I'm just, I am, I'm in love with your SANE data. That's so cool. And I'm wondering um, what other species you were catching and, and, it, and to what extent uh, you feel like these different species that you're catching are um, uh, elastic in the habitat or, or, or are they really sort of needing the, the specialty of the habitat that you're sampling? So the other species, of course, I'm curious about uh, the grouper, if, if you were catching grouper from the, that habitat. And then while I'm talking, I'll also ask um, whether or not it's possible to connect those data in terms of a metric of recruitment with some of Jay's data from INCRIMP 
um, you know, tropical reef fish are notoriously um, invariable relative to other sort of highly productive systems. And so it always begs this question of whether or not the variability you say and see in survey data is just due to observer error or if it's true variability in the population. But it strikes me that if you could pair your recruitment data to variability in, for instance, NCRIMP data, you could get at that question, which would be super cool. I'll stop talking. Yeah, thanks, Bryce. So yeah, we catch um, all types of species in this in this same survey. Um, yeah, a lot of a lot of grunts. It's probably our most uh, represented family, um, mohara's, um, parrotfish. So as we're slowly working through this data, we're going to hope hope to do some analysis on uh, targeted families and species. Um, and I saw your question about grouper, so I actually looked back at the data set. And over the um, 12 or 13 years, uh, we caught only five grouper. So we were really not catching too many. It was like three blacks, a red, um, and a rock hind. And they were kind of caught for the blacks and the red in the spring. Um, the rock hind was caught in the summer. So yeah, I don't know if they're maybe recruiting to yeah, deeper, deeper habitats, maybe like um, hard bottom hatch reef. Um, Hard to say. And yeah, and your point about um, pairing this with the RVC data is something we've been thinking about and we'll hopefully get to one of these days. Um, I think that'd be really cool. It's like you said, it's, um, I think it's notoriously difficult to relate recruitment patterns to stock size, but if we could do that with the RVC data and and our our same our same recruitment data would be would be awesome, and I think there's definitely the potential to do it, given the uh, the breadth of both surveys. Okay, cool. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, then the other kind of general discussion point, I guess, that you know came clear across these multiple talks is depth matters, um, and and whether or not it's ontogeny uh, or differential effects of, of um, fishing pressure slash refuge. Um, I, I think that's it's really interesting and it has, uh, I guess I would, I'd be curious to hear um, from, from either Anna or, or Jay, like what, what is your sense of the impact of, of your findings in terms of assessment? So, because in, in my mind, that's a, that's a big thing, especially in data limited assessments where length frequency really plays an important role. Man, you could get it really wrong depending on when your where your data are coming from depth wise. So I'm just wondering if uh, if you have any insights on that that are that are more structured than what I just um, said. I can talk up first. Yeah, I mean, if you're getting it wrong, that's not good. So that's you know the first part. What I, I think what we've looked at and what we've talked about is it really just depends on the area, right? So two things that go into stock, well, there's multiple things that go into stock assessment, but they're looking at abundance estimate, you know, an abundance estimate over time. That's one of the measures. And then they're also looking at life history data and lengths. So lengths, you could be getting it wrong, you know, if you're not seeing larger fish, but abundance estimates too, if you're seeing them at such a greater rate, you know, in deeper water, then you're not really estimating the population correctly. And you're not getting correct abundance estimates. So that's really what NCREMP is focusing, you know, a lot on, and this, and then it'll be linked up in the stock assessments to like history data. Um, notably, we chose St. Thomas, St. John for our survey for a reason, and that's because they have this really long shelf. That being said, it may not be as big of a deal in some other areas, like St. Croix really goes out to about 30 meters and then has a steep shelf down, and it's really almost vertical. So you're not going to see any of these you know, big increases in abundance because the habitat's just not really there. It's very sharp. It's a steep shelf, and um, so it really depends on the you know, what the area looks like, the geography of the area, you know, the bathymetry to um, whether or not it really plays that much of a role. But yes, it will. Um, stock assessment folks in NOAA are aware of this, but obviously we can't do anything without interannual variability in our surveys. So at the moment, the fact that stock assessment in the Caribbean is moving forward, um, that they're doing these CDARs and that they're using fishery independent data that's actually, I would say, 
the biggest step at the moment. And then if we can keep improving and getting better by getting more information, um, then that's the direction we should be going in. And I think that's where we're headed. Perfect. Um, Anna, feel free to add if you'd like, otherwise I can move on to more questions. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of, you know, echo what she was saying, but also mention that, you know, the results that we're seeing is just in our area. So it would be really interesting to see if these results span across the Northern Gulf, if they're in other areas like in the deeper Caribbean, or if it's just, you know, our region that's experiencing this. So I just wanted to add that. <laughs> awesome. All right. Um, yeah. So um, in fact, we need to wrap up, sadly, uh, even though there are ad additional questions. So I would encourage those. If I didn't get your question, my apologies. And please feel free to reach out uh, via the, the platform to ask your questions. Um, uh, David, you've got a couple for instance, in Q&A, take a look at those. Okay, uh, thank you all very much for your time. Um, interesting set of talks, uh, lots to think about in terms of threads regarding depth and um, survey design. And I appreciate everybody's time and participating in GCFI, even in the era of COVID. So thank you all very much for, for paying attention, asking great questions and giving great talks. I appreciate it. Thanks, Bryce. And thank you again to all our panelists today for the reef-related fishery session. Uh, we're going to have a short break right now, give our interpreters a, a little break after doing such a great job um, this morning. And during this break, we have a nice film um, that I'd like to share. And it's a nice bridge between the reef-related fishery session and the upcoming fish spawning aggregation session. And this film is called Goliaths in the Stream and by Terama Productions. And I'm just going to let it play during, during the break. So we'll see you back in about 15, 20 minutes. Thank you, everyone. It's now summer in South Florida. The winter lemon shark aggregation has come and gone. Spring sea turtle season has come and gone. And it's time for a new Leviathan to come into focus in Florida waters. Every year between August and September, at the height of hurricane season, another aggregation of megafauna takes place. Goliath groupers arrive in numbers to aggregate in and around the shipwrecks and reefs of Palm Beach County. Palm Beach County has the largest and most accessible aggregations for this species. At first, ones and twos appear, adding to the resident population. Then more arrive, and they keep arriving. Where they come from and where they go after spawning is not well understood, but scientists have recorded goliaths as far north as southern Georgia. One thing is clear though, South Florida is a special place for these fish. This late summer aggregation along the Treasure Coast and the Palm Beaches is the largest concentration of goliaths known, and it is the only place in the world for divers to interact with these giants in such large numbers. Once hunted to near extinction, a large portion of the goliath population aggregates here. Perhaps they return in part due to the ongoing artificial reef program, which might offer good shelter. Or perhaps there's something ingrained deep within these fish and they're just returning to original territories like salmon and sea turtles do. South Florida is also a destination for scuba divers. 
many who travel from far away just to see and interact with these gentle giants. They brave sweltering air temperatures to enjoy Florida's warm coastal water and to spend time with the largest reef fish in the Caribbean. Goliath grouper are one of those fish that are really impressive to see underwater. So being able to view them underwater is something that a lot of divers will pay a lot of money for. And they've actually done economic impact studies to show the value of a single fish alive versus dead. And they found that because of the economic impact of the dive industry in Florida, the value of Goliath grouper is pretty high. This fish is perfect for an ecotourist industry, perfect. Because you can see low numbers of them, let's say less than a dozen, any time of the year. You can see much more than a dozen, up to 100 during spawning time. They are one of those fish that you're guaranteed to see at most artificial reefs. Um, they are, again, very impressive and approachable underwater. They're charismatic megafauna. There's not very many places in the world that you can interact with a fish of this size. grouper in abundance now. They're recovering, they're still recovering. They're hitting bumps in the road by red tide and cold uh, events and uh, damaged um, uh, juvenile habitat. But they're abundant in enough to still attract, you know, this diving industry resource. They're beneficial to our tourism. They're beneficial to the dive community. We need to do what we can to protect them. Uh, we need to have the population grow. Fortunately, nearly 30 years of continuous protection for goliaths has made a positive impact on the species. Scientists aren't sure about the Goliath's historic numbers, but current population trends seem to show them slowly increasing. However, this hasn't always been the case. At the time, it seemed like the right thing to do to spear these fish who were considered underutilized species and utilize them. Of course, a lot of things seemed like the right thing to do at the time, like shark fishing and things like that. It turns out that it wasn't, but we learned from it. Well, with the Goliath grouper, they just, it was, you know, it's a slow growing, long lived fish. It can't take any pressure. I saw them decline. I saw it off Palm Beach. Actually, they were gone before I even got there in the early 70s. Heard the stories of the great big herds, but I never saw that. And then in the Gulf, that was where we came in and speared them. But I saw the decline. It started pretty rapidly, especially after a few more people got, got out there spearing them. They, they just, resource couldn't take the pressure. Rex had had in excess of 100 fish on them, went down to maybe one or two. So that's a pretty serious decline. Historical accounts of Goliath numbers from as early as the 1950s are sketchy, but most accounts agree that the numbers were still high. Old-time fishers, such as Kenny Rosinas and Frank Hammett from West Palm Beach, talk about taking five to 10 fish a day, every day. A good year was 100,000 pounds of fish. Four or five other boats were taking similar numbers of fish, 
with an annual total close to a half million pounds of fish per year killed. But the story actually begins nearly 50 years before Hammett and Rosinus were on the scene, when Goliaths were being targeted by anglers in the early 1900s. Gene Johnson's tackle shop was thriving and catching Goliaths all the way up to Daytona Beach, while others were catching them down along the coast to the Florida Keys. Because of their size and their slow nature, Goliath grouper were easy targets. After the last trip I made out to the Stony where I saw the one fish, I came home and it just really started eating away at me. And I got up at three in the morning and started a letter to the Gulf Council. It took me several days to write it. And I sent it, actually it was Terry Leary. He was their biologist statistician at the time. And I went back and forth with him and they gave it to the council. And then from there it went to the FWC and then the South Atlantic and pretty much everyone agreed they needed to be closed. There was no real opposition. There wasn't anything to lose, they were gone. Florida's historic range for the Goliaths is unclear, but it likely extended into northern Florida and above on the east coast and throughout the Gulf on the west coast. As fishing pressure increased and the Goliaths' population decreased, so did their range, until all that was left was a fragmented population barely able to sustain its numbers. Goliath aggregations are extremely vulnerable to human predation. And after predation, many of these aggregations never reform, nor do the populations recover. I just never thought they would come back like they did. But they're attracted to metal and high profile areas and they went right to these wrecks. And less than 10 years after protection, we saw aggregations reforming again. Shocked a lot of the resident divers there. It was a pleasant shock. It's, it shows that if you do protect these things, they'll come back. And a lot of times, it's less time than you think. Now, Don advocates for fishery conservation. With his local knowledge and understanding of fisheries and marine ecosystems. He works with scientists and helps to disseminate information so that fishery managers and conservationists can make informed decisions that will guarantee that the Goliath population remains strong and everyone can enjoy these exceptional animals. You can't get too fixated on the species itself. You gotta look at the environment. And if the environment is not healthy to support it, it's not gonna support other species that live in that same environment, and they all lose. And so it comes down to water quality and what's going on right now in the state with all this algae blooms in the Indian River Lagoon and the red tide events that are happening on the West Coast are all gonna have a long, uh, profound effect on that environment that this fish lives in as well as everything else we go out there and enjoy, sea turtles, uh, snapper, grunts, angelfish, everything that we like to look at. You know, whether you're a diver or a recreational fisherman, even a commercial, it's gonna have a huge impact on all of us. Fortunately for Goliath Grouper, there's an abundance of research ongoing that is providing scientists with a more complete understanding of their life cycle and the role they play in the dynamics of the ecosystem in which they live. Dr. Angela Collins has been conducting a long-term presence and abundance study of artificial and hard bottom habitat in the eastern Gulf of Mexico. So we've been doing it for over 10 years, um, and a lot of these sites we've been repeat visiting. Uh, I did a lot of this work with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission for the state of Florida, and also for the University of South Florida. Today, with the help of her friend and colleague, Christy Erickson, Angela's planning a dive to gather additional data in an effort to understand more about the Goliaths. So what I think what we're gonna do is, I'm gonna video, uh -huh. and then you're gonna count. Okay. The 
This only has 2,000 pounds. And basically what we were doing is going down and counting the number of goliath groupers at these certain specific habitats, both artificial reefs and natural ledges, and then also getting an idea of the size distribution. So using underwater videography, we were able to basically use lasers to get size estimates of all of the fish that were present at a specific site. One of the results of Angela's research was the confirmation that goliaths were more likely to be present and more abundant on artificial reefs with good structure, like shipwrecks. Florida has a thriving artificial reef program, one of the most active in the country. Over the last 70 years, more than 3,300 artificial reefs have been placed or sunk along coastal Florida. These structures provide good habitat for fish, often where there was none. Many of these high relief structures provide the preferred habitat for the goliaths. One of the prevailing scientific hypotheses is that these shipwrecks are helping in the recovery by allowing larger goliath aggregations to form. Moat Marine Lab's Dr. Jim Lacazio is conducting a study using passive acoustic monitoring to record goliath sounds at certain aggregation sites as one of the parameters to qualify that location as a spawning site. These animals concentrate at predictable locations and uh, there's a term which um, has a technical meaning called hyperstability, which is where catch per unit effort doesn't track the abundance of animals um, well enough to be used as a predictor for how stable the population is. Uh, in this case, you can kind of think of it as applying to seeing a large, dense group of animals on a wreck and it giving the impression falsely that the population uh, is very high. The levels are high, uh, but when it's not the spawning season where you see 60 or 80 fish, you'll see two or three. And so uh, there's that, that misleading impression that is given. Uh, so who can say how many uh, fish there are? Mark and recapture studies are underway, but there's no um, conclusions yet from those. So more of that work would help us understand that. Passive acoustic monitoring allows Jim to record high-resolution, long-term sound production data without a researcher needing to be present to operate the recording equipment. This allows Jim to monitor multiple sites at the same time in order to determine where reproductive behavior may be taking place. In the future, these data may also be beneficial in helping to approximate the number of individual grouper at a given site, leading to a better estimation of their population numbers. Get the, get the tape straight. Science is often collaborative in nature. During a field session where Jim and his students are catching and fitting goliaths with new acoustic tags and scanning for older tags. They collect tissue samples that can be analyzed for contaminants and also eggs that can be used as another parameter to qualify an aggregation site as a spawning site. See all the eggs? Mm -hmm. All right, we want a nice big uh, sample of those eggs. Uh, we can get them. These tissue samples will be sent to Dr. Chris Malinowski who is conducting research through Florida State University and the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory for analyzing. So I think we're starting to have a couple uh, technical issues with that video, but I'm going to load um, that video onto Whova. So those of you that were interested in it, um, you can rewatch it. So apologies for that, but I think we can um, start getting set up for our um, session on fish spawn and aggregation. So I'll invite uh, Martin Russell to um, take the screen, not the floor.
Martin, over to you. Hello, everyone. Thanks for Dilla. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you fine. Great. Um, hello, everyone. And um, welcome to the um, fish spawning aggregation session, which is entitled The Mystery of Fish Spawning Aggregations and the uh, Opportunities for Monitoring and Management. Um, we have just over an hour to uh, uh, have a panel discussion and presentation from the, the speakers who presented last week. And that's just to, um, as, as the title says, to work through the mystery of spawning aggregations. And, um, and we continue to learn about them and understand them and also continuing to try to manage them. And that film we just saw just then just highlighted a, a, a key aspect of an, a, an aggregating fish species with some, some serious problems and some management issues. Um, so it's a challenge and it's an opportunity that we have. And there are some great people that work on spawning aggregations around the world, especially in the Caribbean, I notice. Um, so uh, it's, it's a great opportunity for GCFI to have this session. And every year we try to have uh, presentations on aggregations and a bit of a discussion. Um, and this year we have four presentations, four talks. And I do notice also that in the uh, book of abstracts, there are about eight other um, abstracts that uh, are related to um, fish spawning aggregations. So I encourage people to read through there and either watch the talks or see the posters. Um, so um, I will, um, before I just hand over to the, the first presenter, the panel we have today is, um, is Bryce Simmons, uh, Martha Prada, Ron Hill, Habo Zhu, and Yvonne Sadovi, um, and myself as moderator. Um, and we'll, I'll go through the presentations, a uh, three minute talk um, or, or just discussion um, by the speaker, and then we'll open it up to questions and answers. So, so feel free to um, pop your questions and answers in um, as you're listening, and then we will address those at the, at the end. So um, Martha, are you there? And if you like, you can... Uh, Give you give us a three minute or thereabouts overview of your presentation. Yes, Martin. Hi. Uh, I guess Yvonne is going to present from our side, but if she's not there, I I can certainly do that presentation. Yvonne. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, Yvonne, can you there. hear me? Yep. You yeah, can't you see can. Me, yeah, and I'm trying with the. Um, I don't seem to have a like a, a camera thing on my, oh yes I do, I beg your pardon. Yes I do, got it, high tech. <laughs> um, so thank you um, and good, actually it's good middle of the night over here, everybody. Um, and I'm really, really glad, it's quite amazing with this technology um, that I have the opportunity to join you. So thank you very much. And this talk uh, is about a, a somewhat different type of management plan. Um, it's a work that was conducted, uh, has been conducted over a large number of people. Uh, there's a note I see that they, they don't have audio, but Martin, you can you can hear me, can you? Yes, Yvonne, uh, I can hear okay. and see you. Okay, well, let, let me continue and then um, hopefully um, people, this person will be able to resolve the sound. Um, so at the bottom of the side here, you can see a large number of people who've been involved. They've been involved a, over a very long period of time. And in fact, uh, here you can see figured two species, the Nassau grouper, which is a threatened species, according to the IUCN uh, red list, and the mutton snapper, which is a near threatened species. And the management plan I'll very briefly discuss uh, is one that focuses unusually, I think, on the spawning aggregations of these two species, rather than the, rather than um, on the entire uh, fishery and, and uh, life history of, of the species themselves. So this is very much a focus on the spawning aggregations. 
Um, there are a number of other organizations you can see to the bottom left also included, COPACA, OSPESCA, NOAA, Caribbean Fishery Management Council has been a major um, uh, player in uh, getting this plan developed. And the story really started with the Nassau Grouper. Um, even by the early 90s, there was concern, the early 1990s, there was concern about the species. Um, and this concern grew over time. And the genesis of this particular management plan was really in about 2008. Um, and there were meetings uh, about this particular species. And then subsequently a, a working group, the Spawning Aggregation Working Group was formed, initially just focusing on Nassau grouper, but then adding the mutton snapper because of concerns also about its aggregations, which were declining. And the concerns in both of these species it was that there was a focus very much on the aggregations for much of the annual landings of the species. And so that's why um, this particular concern, and as you've heard in the last talk and in other talks, uh, aggregations are, can be particularly vulnerable to, to fishing if they're not managed. So this is a little bit of the background. The management plan um, was developed over several years and is pending approval by WCAFSI, uh, which is under NOAA, um, and this is in the Western Atlantic section under NOAA. And we're hoping next year under the uh, scientific uh, group that this will be approved. And we've also, um, in anticipation of that, um, and they've also already reviewed um, the management plan uh, quite extensively. So in anticipation of that if approval, we've already started with the planning and we have 16 actions and the three colored sets of boxes are the 16 actions which follow a timeline from around 2020 on the left-hand side with the pink um, uh, for about a decade. So we, we planned over a, a decade what we want to see and the priorities are in the pink uh, to start off with and one of them is the fact that many countries, even though these species are present, do not yet have a good idea of all of their aggregations and have not yet <clears throat> prioritized which are the aggregations that they should be um, that they should be managing. So that that's a priority to develop guidelines to enable that to occur. Also, in recognition of of, of many of the commercially exploited species within the region, uh, there are pelagic eggs and larvae, and of course the these animals um, move over uh, uh, interna uh, national boundaries. And so those recognized real need for a harmonized plan that goes uh, at the regional level across different countries. And in fact, with these aggregating species, the adults also can um, move for several hundred kilometers uh, between their reef sites and the aggregation sites. So this regional component was, um, is a large part of this. And there's also recognition that we could learn a lot from uh, the management that has already been put into effect in some places for some of these species. Some has been very successful. Um, the Cayman Islands is a, is a very good example where there's been remarkable recovery at one particular site because of management, because of scientifically based management planning over a long period of time. So it's a fantastic example there of, of the kind of management that's needed um, and can be very successful. Um, and other kind of management just hasn't maybe been enough or for long enough to be successful. So we're learning uh, lessons uh, from these uh, experiences. In the following years, um, an important component which we'll be building on is to engage uh, very closely um, and as much as possible for the stakeholders, particularly stakeholders who are fishing depend on these fish either directly or indirectly, fish on them either on the aggregations or on the species at other times. And this is a particular thing we want to differentiate, which is actually looking what are the benefits of fishing on the species outside of the aggregations versus on the aggregations, because the fishermen um, with, with both these perspectives are gaining. We also will look at the, the um, the non-extractive value of aggregations, for example, they can be quite spectacular. And uh, from an ecotourism perspective, um, there's a lot of economic uh, gain to be had in some locations and a lot of gain to be had by protecting aggregations because of the way they feed the fishery through reproduction. So these are the, this is the kind of thinking behind 
um, the management um, and development of the plan. So uh, the next slide is a major component, and I'll be finishing uh, after that one. A major component is the educational part, which is um, outreach, having people understand, uh, particularly the major stakeholders, why it's so important to manage aggregations for their fisheries. Um, and one of the films, one of the shorter films, National Group Against the Clock, I think is going to be shown um, at the Cinefish at GCFI. There's a long film, The Secret Crown, which will be released next year, and some citizen science uh, education, uh, particularly radio kits in different languages, uh, the three languages um, in the region. Um, they'll be uh, slowly released. They've been well developed. And this is uh, a collaboration between many people, but particularly uh, Beluga Production um, and also the Spawning Aggregation Working Group. And then the last slide, really, I don't need to go through it because it's a summary um, uh, of, the, of what I've already uh, told you, but these are the kind of the highlights, so to speak. So Martin, thank you. Thank you, Yvonne. Um, and uh, Martha, did you have anything additional to say there? Or, um, or we could hold well, off for the uh, the questions and answers. Sí, preferiría esperar y voy a avisar al público que voy a hablar en español. Sí, no problema. Okay. Gracias. Um, Yvonne, um, I uh, will ask others, to, uh, people to post questions and answers and we'll get to go through those at the end. So thank sure. you, Yvonne. Thank that you. That was very, uh, very interesting. Um, I do notice that we do have about 65 people attending this session, which is good. Okay, so moving on to the next uh, talk or speaker, it's Ron Hill from NOAA Fisheries. Are you there, Ron? I am. Hi, Martin. Welcome. Thank you. So um, I'm Ron Hill. I work with NOAA Fisheries. I'm a, a basically a coral reef ecologist. Um, and although we had about, um, we were supposed to do a, a 10 minute talk, mine is actually about five years long. Um, it started with the um, with a presentation in the Caymans at GCFI in 2016 where I was just presenting some of the, the early information about the, um, the sound drifters that we had developed um, in order to, to do a couple of things. We, we wanted to use them, first of all, to try to look at the spatial extent of a, of a known spawning aggregation. And that was one of the ways that we tested out this technology. And so we worked with um, Michelle and Rich Appledorn off the west coast of uh, Puerto Rico at a known spawning aggregation site. And I kind of highlight that in, in the video presentation. And it's a very simple approach that we've used. These are just continuous recorders um, actually developed after work that um, Chris Koenig had done at um, monitoring Goliath grouper spawning aggregations. Um, and so we, we worked a little bit with trying to, to use them to understand the spatial extent of, of the known habitat or the known aggregation, as I said. And then off the east coast of Puerto Rico, um, once we felt like we had a, a bit of an understanding of how they worked and, and all of that, we had some information from a Sea Grant survey where fishers had been interviewed and they indicated just general areas on nautical maps where spawning aggregations were known to them. Um, but these were not data that we were necessarily privy to or that they cared to share specific locations. So we used our, our sound drifters as a way to investigate some of these areas and see if we could pinpoint um, exactly where to find some of these unknown spawning aggregations. And this is sort of the, the highlight of that part of this project. We're off the island of Culebra, which is, is a part of the Northeast Reserves area of, of Puerto Rico and has been identified as a, um, a um, oh gosh, what's the, an, an HFA, a habitat uh, focus area, sorry, <laughs> I forgot my acronym for a minute, um, by NOAA um, as a place to, to try to um, uh, focus attention and, and try to understand better what's going on in the habitats and ecosystems in those areas. So 
We focused some of our um, surveys there. The areas to the, um, to the Northeast in particular was a, a spot that had been highlighted as a red hind spawning area, but we weren't exactly sure where, but we did manage to um, run our sound drifters across that area and detect spawning sounds from red hind. Um, and so we felt that was fairly successful. Now to, to really operationalize this, you need somebody um, not that's traveling periodically um, from the states to do this, but somebody that's local on site could be there day after day and could actually run this same set of um, surveys until you focus in on exactly where you see some, some high um, sound levels and then put some divers in the water or a, an ROV or something to confirm uh, that the animals are in fact on those sites. But but we had fairly good success with this and it's something we've continued to try to get some funding to do more local surveys. Um, and we feel like it's, um, it's worth pursuing unless you have the budget to go get a wave glider or um, sail drone or something of that sort that can stay out there forever. So that's my presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you very thank much, you. Ron. Um, and again, uh, we'll uh, hold off with questions and answers until the end. Um, that was very interesting. Uh, the next speaker we have is, is Haibu Chu um, yes. from the University of Puerto Rico talking about simulations. Over to you. Uh, hi, Milton. Uh, hi, Milton. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Hello? Okay. So I've started my speech today. Um, Hello everyone, I'm Haibo Xiu, uh, the PhD candidate from the Department of Marine Science, uh, University of Puerto Rico. Uh, this, this project is exploring the main ocean, oceanographic pathway leading to the dispersal of fish eggs and early larvae from marine protected area in the US Virgin Island and off the Eastern Puerto, Puerto Rico Shelf and to identify particle pathway and the potential locations of sediments of fish spawned at this site. This study is designed to generate a connectivity metrics for eggs and larvae from commercially important fish species, such as the right head and the mutant snapper. Uh, commercial fishers from St. Thomas have percent Testotony is that the spawns of high bank mostly most likely benefits the coast, the east coast of Puerto Rico. Um, their observations during the years of fishers um, fishing at the high bank suggest that uh, the eggs and the larvae would flow floor towards Puerto Rico. Um, this work will help to provide some evidence to, to their uh, observations and the post um, alternative uh, hypothesis. In this ca in case of San Croix, the rules of oceanographic features such as eddies uh, has been suggested by some reference to play the major role in larger larval connectivities. Um, this proposed work will study these features as a high spatial resolution using observational and modeling tools previously unavailable in this region. Specific questions in our study to be addressed quantitatively are, uh, where do the fish larvae from network MPAs go? Are this best set to protect in order to enhance uh, recruitment in the most favorable areas? Where should additional MPAs nodes to be added to the network um, for maximum um, signature with the existing MPAs? Uh, firstly, we introduced the M AFRICOM model, which is especially favorable to the regions with complex asymmetry and a irregular coastline. Overall, uh, we use a different ob observational measurements such as ADCP, buoy, and the tide gauge to calibrate and uh, validate the model performance. 
Uh, in fact, we continue conducting the operational mo uh, African model since 2019, which is daily running on the Caricou servers and provided one day cast and the three days forecast, uh, including the current surface elevations, temperature, and the salinities. Uh, in these studies, we run one year high cast from December 2018 to December 2019. The output will, will store offline and would, and would be used as the input of following particle tracking measures. Uh, Neville Lagrangian's particle tracking models was applied with bio behavior options to explore the potential pathways of fish eggs and early larvae following the spawning aggregations at the known aggregation set. All the particles used to control the model, such as the spawning set, the spawning depth, spawning time, and the pelagic larval durations will, uh, is species specific. In our case, 100 vir uh, virtual particles were released from high bank and the land bank at 5 p.m., 6 p.m., 7 p.m., at five days, which is between two days, uh, before the full moon to the two days past the full moons in December of 2018, January and February of 2019. Mm, the particles was ad ad adaptive by the positive buoyancy after the spawns until they're expected to reach the post of fluxion on the 18 days and started flowing controlled by the approach named the vertical um, uh, probabilistics uh, distribution mat matrix, uh, matrix. This code was originally a part of connectivity modeling system and uh, modified by us to work well with unstructured grid in this study. Uh, the matrix was built by the fish survey conducted by the Source East Fishery Science Centers from 2007 to 2010. Um, it, provi it provi provided us with the observation, observations of vertical distribution of larval abundance in the mixed layers, um, which is extremely important. Um, um, it, it's extremely important for estimating st statical uh, stage is specific probably, probability uh, density distribution of fish larvae. Uh, which they are uh, capable of swimming and uh, undergo onto genetic vertical migrations. Uh, the, the progress of studies show that the trajectory patterns of fish larvae is sensitive to the release hour, uh, release day, and the release locations. Uh, the connectivity between the MPAs and the, some potential sediment sets suggested by the result of, of this study, uh, such as the uh, Sosten Puerto Rico is constructed during the ongoing work. Um, this study is believed to contribute the percent on understandings of the role of this fish spawning set and their relative contribution to the logo versus far field recruitment. Um, it will help to address the evaluations of marine protected area as sources and determine the sink for the eggs and the larvae spawns from the known MPAs. Um, uh, I think I think we'll stop here. Thank you, Herbu. Um, yeah, we'll move on and uh, we'll wait for more questions after um, we finish off for the next talk. Um, but I found that very interesting. I do have a question in my mind, which I'll hold back on for a second. Um, so moving on, um, Bryce, are you there? Um, I'm going to hand over to you now to give a uh, three minutes or or so. That's not, That's not your side. Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sadil, is there is the, I is the is the uh, slide the one slide that I provided for you is that available or or no? If not, that's okay. I see a slide on the screen, Bryce. Hey, that's just the it, that's the splash screen slide from my my actual talk rather than the one slide that we provided, but that's okay. Uh, sorry about that, but this is the one I have. I can look for the other one, but if this one can work, we can go this, ahead with it. This will work just fine then. Um, okay, great. Uh, hi, everybody. 
Uh, so uh, my talk was about um, uh, looking across uh, basically nearly a 20 year time series of uh, movement and behavior of Nassau grouper on Little Cayman Island as the population on that island uh, went through a remarkable recovery that uh, Yvonne mentioned. Um, uh, the, in 2001, the aggregation on Little Cayman was uh, discovered. And uh, prior to that, all of the known aggregations from the Caymans had been fished to exhaustion. Uh, at the time of discovery, that, that aggregation was quite large, but it was fished out hard uh, for a couple of years till there were very few individuals left. And because of Cayman Islands history of overfishing of aggregations, they uh, undertook uh, protections for that spawning site. And in fact, all spawning sites known uh, active or not in the Cayman Islands. Um, but as part of that, they established a research program with help from the Reef Environmental Education Foundation called Grouper Moon. And that program is a collaboration between the Cayman Islands Department of Environment and Reef, the nonprofit organization, to carry out pieces of science to help inform adaptive management for the population. And uh, as Yvonne alluded to, it's proven uh, wildly successful. So the population grew from, in 2003, uh, probably less than a thousand individuals to, uh, in a contemporary context, upwards of 9,000 individuals. So a ninefold increase, um, at least in the population over time. And over that window of time, we've had acoustic hydrophones ringing that island. And in fact, all islands in the Caymans. Uh, so we actually have an acoustic web that listens for the pings of tagged fish moving through the islands. And for most of the last 15 years, we've had tagged NASA grouper adult spawners in the system. And so what we've been able to do is look at how these animals behave during spawning season and how that behavior has changed as a function of the size of the population. And the change has in fact been fairly remarkable. Well, what we found is that, um, uh, first of all, all, ag all reproductive, nearly all reproductive, if not all reproductive aged individuals appear to aggregate every year, and they're not moving between islands. They're not making these deep water migrations. So all the, all the fish on Little Cayman are Little Cayman fish. But uh, as the population has grown since 2003, um, up into a um, modern day, what we've seen um, is that uh, individuals moving around the islands spend a lot less time wandering from one potential spawning site to the next and covering lots of ground. Two, uh, when the aggregation site is large, uh, moving very little relatively, exploring not many, if any, of the other potential sites and all going to that one aggregation site. So they spend less time moving around the islands. And because of that, and, and, and not by a little bit, like we're changing uh, hundreds of kilometers less of movement per spawning season on average. Uh, and, and that change in movement means that um, any, any potential harvest that might take place on an aggregation um, uh, or, or during migration uh, during spawning season is going to have uh, more exposure to migrating fish when the population is lower because they move a lot more, uh, spend a lot more time looking for the, the good spot, the good nightclub to go to. The other thing we found is that uh, per capita, looking across both Little Cayman and Cayman BRAC spawning sites, as well as data from Rick Nemeth's group down on the Virgin Islands, spanning, um, uh, you know, aggregations of just a few hundred individuals to aggregations of seven or 8,000 individuals, and looking at per capita, the amount of time an individual spends at an aggregation site as a function of how large that aggregation is. And what we found is that there is an exponential change in the amount of time fish spend at the aggregation site as a function of size, wherein fish on larger aggregation sites spend less time at the aggregation. Conversely, when the aggregation is smaller, the few remaining individuals spend a lot longer at that aggregation site, presumably because whatever behavioral cues are driving reproduction are enhanced when there's a whole bunch of individuals there. And so spawning and reproduction happens in a much more concentrated window of time. Everybody spawns, releases gametes, and goes home happy um, in a shorter amount of time. And of course, adding fishing pressure on top of that, what that means is that the individual, the per capita exposure to any fishing pressure taking place on the aggregation site is going to be higher when the population size is lower 
simply because fish are spending less, excuse me, fish are spending more time at the aggregation site when the aggregation itself is smaller and thus are exposed to any fishing pressure that may take place on an aggregation site. So all of these pieces of information um, suggest that there is, is an apparent behavioral reorganization that's taken place on the island of Little Cayman and beyond as a function of growth and recovery of that population uh, in terms of the spawning size. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Bryce. Um, it was very informative and uh... And given that we've just, that's the, uh, the four speakers. And um, I'll just wait for a few questions to come through on the chat. So I encourage people to think up some good questions for a, uh, an answer from the panelists. Um, and then I'll open up to anyone on the panel as well to, to, um, to speak or, or, or make a comment. Um, so, but we do have one question that's, that has come through from Nancy. Um, to Bryce, um, given the lack of tourism in Cayman this past one to two years, are you seeing an increase in the spawning aggregations? Uh, gosh, I wish I was able to see the spawning aggregation at all, but uh, COVID and Cayman are um, uh, have created challenges uh, where wherein Cayman has been closed to any any travel basically, and so we and and in deference to to um, uh, to the community that's there, we, we didn't want to push it. So we didn't go down and uh, participate in the aggregation research last year for the first time in almost 20 years. We did, however, because we have strong partnerships um, in the Caymans and, and the Cayman Islands Department of Environment is, is equally driving this project. Uh, they fielded their, their own team uh, fr from volunteers from the dive community, for instance, and helped us collect uh, those data. So we maintained some of our monitoring streams, but we didn't do any of the, the marker capture work that we would normally do to estimate population size. And because of that, we don't know whether or not there's been any uh, change or response uh, in the last year or two of the population either as just a function of population growth and or in response to COVID. So the short answer is we don't know, but I'm sure interested to find out. And I'm really, really hoping we get down there in January or February. Thanks, Bryce. And um, while, while you've got the floor there, there's another question that's come through from Alfonso Aguirre Pierre. Um, for Bryce, um, how successful is enforcement in Cayman Islands to protect Nassau group aggregations? I guess it is remarkable given the healthy SR group or aggregations you have there. Is that right? Yeah, so um, Yvonne mentioned in her talk that one of the key aspects of successfully managing a species is education and outreach, um, and that's proven true in the Cayman Islands as well. So even, even though the Caymans are a relatively wealthy country in the Caribbean, um, their enforcement capabilities are, are um, are limited when it comes to enforcing communal fishing. Um, on the other hand, uh, we've been active through the Grouper Moon Project and reaching out uh, to the community and to the schools through through a, a year long science curriculum. And so we've we've over time we've built community support for the idea that protecting the aggregations during spawning is an, is is important to overall health of the fishery. And because of that, the community has largely bought in. So it's less about enforcement; it's more about belief of the community that it's working. And the good news is, at this point, the, the population's grown so much that the that the fishermen are seeing it because they can. You know, the reports are, ah, I can catch fish from the shore for the first time since I was a kid. And, and that's, you know, that kind of messaging from the fisher, fisher, fishing community itself has been really powerful. Thanks, Bryce. You, you're, a, you're a popular um, speaker at the moment. There's a few questions coming at you, but I just noticed that Yvonne has her hand up. If you wanna, did you wanna say something there before I go on to the next question for Bryce? Just unmute. Yes, I would. Sorry, I was just yeah, I was just unmuting. Yes, yeah, since since Bryce has the floor, just something to share. Um, very interesting, the fact that the, the 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 more fish there are, the less time they spend there, the less time they move around, and of course that's going to have implications for um, when when, it, when when such animals are fished. It's going to have implications for kind of their exposure to fishing. And just to share briefly with uh, one of the groupers, Plectropomus areolatus, it's square tail grouper uh, coral trout in the in the Pacific in several islands what they found is that the the number of months that the species comes to 
aggregate to spawn is greater. There are more months that it comes to spawn as the numbers go down um, and uh, related to fishing. So again, you know, they're, 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 they're coming more often, um, presumably for whatever reason, um, but it does expose them more to fishing. So it is another important element, you know, when we're looking at managing these species and, and understanding um, um, what happens uh, when the numbers are, are declining. So very nice, very interesting. Thank you. Thanks, Yvonne. Yeah, it is very interesting about the change in behaviour and also the, therefore the change in vulnerability. Um, Bryce, there are a few more questions here, so I'll just stick to the questions and answers panel. Um, a question from Michelle Scherer. Um, great work, once again. Do you have any recordings to compare sound levels between high and low abundance of spawning aggregations? And do you think some sites that are louder equal more interactions within spawners or vice versa? Um, thanks, Michelle. Uh, we do, we have sound recordings. So we have, so Michelle is actually part of some of the sound work that we do in the Cayman Islands. Um, we, this last season, we put a, an array of, of passive hydrophones across the, um, the shelf edge, spanning the entire known aggregation site. And so we're looking at that now to, to assess variability and call frequency as a function of, you know, meters or hundreds of meters. Um, but we also have uh, long-term monitoring of uh, acoustics at um, aggregations from each of the three islands, Little Cayman, Cayman Brac, and Grand Cayman. Um, and we have started to do some analyses with those, but it's an interesting and open question as to whether or not we can see the signal of population recovery and call frequencies. We haven't looked at that yet, so I'm excited to see if, if we can see that. Um, do, I, do you think some sites that are louder equal more interactions? Oh. Um, yeah, that's also a great question. You know, um, Michelle, of course, you know this better than anybody, but um, translating call frequencies into abundance of fishes is, is tricky. And so I'm hoping that some of the work we did with multiple hydrophones at the aggregation site, um, well, that was 2019 now, right? Uh, will help to get at this question of whether or not we can look at, um, uh, you know, louder sites and, and behaviors um, and, and how that might mediate our estimates of abundance based on call frequency. Thanks, Bryce. There's a couple more questions for you in the chat. Um, actually, I think there's, yeah, there's just two more. Um, the first one's from Ron. Uh, I remember from an earlier talk that you reported that tagged fish were going back to a spawning site day after day and then moving maybe back towards their home reef. Do you see less of that in your tagged fish data with the increase in abundance, i.e. difference, difference in different individual behavior. Yeah, so what, what, what we do see is that in, in years with smaller population sizes, uh, um, we see that fish spend more hours in any given day during the spawning season at the aggregation site. So that is, um, they're, they're closer to spending 24 hours of, of, of hours detected at the aggregation site when the population is small. Um, with larger populations, it appears that, that um, some individuals uh, are not detected the full 24 hours. Now that could also be because as the population gets bigger, the aggregation gets bigger. And so fish might not be close enough to the hydrophone. So that sort of within day scale, that's an interesting question. I'm not sure the resolution of our data with just one hydrophone um, uh, is able to tease those two things apart. But it's a great question. Okay, Bryce. Um, and there's another question from Krista Sherman. Uh, are individuals migrate into larger spawning aggregations, uh, spawning multiple times during the spawning season or just once? And has there been pressure from local fishers to resume spawning aggregation fishing? Or have they accepted that this practice is not sustainable? Um, so what we, what we did see with, um, with our fish is that the, it, they, they would regularly move between different uh, ends of islands, which are known uh, spawning locations, they, in, in, but they would ultimately coalesce to a single location, which was the, the sort of standard spawning site. Um, they, would, they would more frequently move between those different locations when the population was smaller. And so I, I think, as you suggest, I think what's happening is that 
um, individuals are, are visiting multiple potential spawning sites and then ultimately making decisions to stay or go based on how many fish are there. And of course, in a regional context, especially like where, where you are in the Bahamas, that's hugely important because while the Bahamas probably has tens uh, or more of spawning sites, you th these fish are perfectly capable, as Yvonne said, of moving many, many hundreds of kilometers in the spawning season. So fishing out one aggregation site is simply going to move the remaining fish probably at some point to another aggregation site. And if you're fishing that other aggregation site, it's going to look like the population's doing just great. You keep catching fish, catching fish. But the problem is you're catching all of the last remaining fish from all the other aggregation sites that have been fished out. So it's a scary proposition when you get that sort of consolidation effect. Wow, it's so interesting, Bryce. Um... I'm going to switch over now to Haber. A couple of questions, and I've actually got a question for you, which you may have mentioned about anyway. But if you could just clarify, can can your simulation be done on in the reverse, i.e., with any confidence about uh, finding aggregations? You're, you're on mute, Haber. Uh, okay, so uh, first I have to ex explain some things. The I, in this case, I use the two models. The first model is the Africom. That is the oh, that is the ocean model. So so that that model can just simulate is the current moving, you know, temperature salinity. So so that is a regular ocean models. And uh, and we have we we have the output of that model and based on the output from that model, so we we have we use the PTM, which is a particle tracking model, which is an, another model. Uh, so another thing, since in our case, the Africom just work with the unstructured grid. Um, you know they uh, they have uh, 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 you know they have benefit or they and they also have the this. Uh, advantage. Um, so in, in this case, we do not have any models which can work with the backward tracking. So so um, but 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 I think but I think it's a good it's a good point that I can work with that um, since all the models is it's a Fortran based code and um, you just modified the code a little bit and that can work with pretty well with the backward. So um, it's a good point for the future work. Okay, thanks, Habu. It was just, just a thought and you never know where these thoughts go to. And that's the challenge with spawning aggregations. I think uh, more ideas, the better. You have another question as well um, from, uh, from Vivian, uh, sorry, Virginia Chevette. Um, super excited about your work. From your presentation, it appeared that eggs larvae spawned in January had potential to make their way to much the US Caribbean. A radiocarbon data from red, red hind odoliths indirectly support this concept of vertical mixing of shallow waters in the region. Any thoughts on mixing patterns during other times of the year? And you mentioned potentially modeling mutton snapper spawning aggregation egg release. What month date would you target that for? Uh, yes. Uh, firstly, for for the uh, in uh, for the case of Red Hat, uh, I would like to run the model. You know, release the virtual particles uh, at May or June or July uh, to compare with the models uh, with the release with the particle releasing in December, January, and February. Since based on the research, the right head was uh, was sponsoring an aggregation uh, from the sponsoring aggregation at uh, at those three months. So I would like to run the models uh, uh, with the particle releasing at May, June, July to compare the results, and uh, we can see the difference. Um, for for another question is that. Uh, yes, this model can work with the mutant snappers, and uh, the uh, I would like to target. Uh, I would like to target the you know I would like to target in May, June, July for the mutant snappers. Uh, in fact, 
uh, in case of mutant snappers, we have the uh, we already deploy the surface drifters uh, in two, uh, in May 2008, uh, 2019. So it's another way to um, to validate our result. Thanks, Haibu. There's another question from Ron. Um, it was interesting to see that under some conditions, your larval drift went into the area of eastern Puerto Rico, where we have found spawning occurring. Do you know if anyone is using genetic tools to confirm some of the connections uh, uh, you predicted? Yeah, that, that uh, actually that's a good question. That um, since I'm the since I'm the um, since I'm the uh, a physical oceanographer, so uh, you got me. Uh, I, I should do some research about that. <laughs> yeah. So, good question, Ron. Um, there's actually a question for you, Ron, um, from Bryce. Um, how much how much dollars to build the drifter system do you use? Not very many. Um, the <laughs> We probably have, um, oh, I don't know, all with all the hardware and everything, probably three to four hundred dollars in a drifter. Um, some of it has to do with the the tracking devices that we use, and then also the housing that we use is something that Chris Koenig had built um, and provided to us. So uh, developing that that you know, pressure housing to, to hold the recorder, but the recorders themselves are only about $170 a piece, um, plus a 15 or $20 hydrophone that uh, extends through the housing. So it's really inexpensive compared to some of the other options that are out there. Um, yeah. Did you lose any? Uh, we did actually. Uh <laughs> It seemed like every time we tried to use six instead of five, the sixth one ran off somewhere different. So we we had them well marked and we lost one off the west coast of Puerto Rico and we expected to hear from somebody in the Dominican Republic at some point, but we never did. So so we don't know where it ended up. Okay. Um, Haibu just mentioned that um, they deployed GPS-based surface drifters in May 2019. Um, there is a question to any of the panelists. So anyone wants to answer this one, it's from Alfonso Aguirre Vieira. To any panelists, do you think it do you think it is recommendable to keep moving, sorry, to keep removing fish during spawning aggregation takes place or strictly recommend stop fishing specifically during aggregations because of reproductive peaks? What do you think? Yvonne. Go for it. Just unmute. I okay, you've done it. There. Done it. <laughs> yeah, you can. I hope not. <laughs> um, it's actually a really good question, and I think you know our community. There's definitely something that needs to be um, discussed. You know, already we heard about the in the earlier session about the Goliath grouper and as it recovers, there becomes pressure to open up. And, and I'm sure other places where aggregations have shown some recovery, there is very obviously going to be pressure to open up again uh, where, where people have been displaced from fishing. So I think this is an important question because um, just talking about reef species, so I guess mainly the groupers and the snappers at the moment, uh, which have been quite heavily exploited. I would say that if you look overall at the experience in the in the Caribbean, tropical Western Atlantic, Pacific, it's it's pretty clear that as soon as you get um, kind of uncontrolled, if exploitation is not controlled and it becomes, you know, uh, commercial or intensely commercial, the aggregations do start declining. I mean that we, we see time and time again where this occurs and when there's no when there's no management. Um, and so these gatherings clearly are very susceptible. So one part of the answer is you, there seems no reason 
not to exploit them as long as they can be controlled, um, as long as they can be managed appropriately. But that does seem to be from a practical level, extremely difficult. Um, another possible approach, and I suspect a lot of this should be case by case, but another possible approach is just to allow subsistence fishing because that, that's obviously um, going to be very important in many communities. Um, but I think thinking about whether, whether in the long term we should be thinking to conserve these as essentially the source of fisheries, because that's where the eggs are produced um, in most cases, that is something that I think we, we need to consider. And, and I, I doubt if there's going to be a single answer, but it is much more about beginning to live much better in balance with, with the marine environment, with these fish populations and recognizing that some of them are very, very susceptible if we cannot or do not manage them. So my, my gut feeling at the moment, understanding how little we are able to manage, Cayman Islands is an, is an exception. It really is. I mean, it's, it's great because the Cayman Islands shows that you can manage um, and see numbers increase, but whether the extent to which you can manage with fishing activity at the moment, I'm really, I've not seen a really, really good example amongst reef fisheries at least. And that's gonna be a difficult thing because in many places, the fishing season is the aggregation season. Um, that's considered the fishing season in many places. So this is going to be a real flip, but I think we're going to have to have flips anyway about marine resources and how we humans relate to them. And I think that having a larder, having the, the source um, in the aggregations is going to be, should, should become or likely to become part of our thinking in the long term. I hope so anyway. Thank you. Thanks, Yvonne. And it, it, it's, it, it's a no-brainer when you think about it. Well, it's it's we shouldn't be fishing on the aggregation time. But like you just said, a lot of fisheries rely on that time historically. And so it's hard to shift away from that. Um, and probably be, sadly though, the shift will occur when you when the hyperstability kicks in and we end up with not many fish there at all. Um, so it's hard to convince some people and there's economics and social economics as well. Um, so it, has anyone else got a comment on that particular topic? Oh, subject? I, I would just say that I, I agree with all of that. And, 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 and in terms of fisheries management, the, the key is that because of, because of everything that's just been discussed, which all really ultimately boils down to hyperstability is catch per unit effort from these aggregations has nothing to do with the population size. And, and so because those two things are really divorced, um, you can't use CPUE, catch per unit effort, as an index of abundance for these populations. So if you're going to allow fishing to take place, that's fine, but do not trust that what you pull out of the water tells you something about the population size because you'll get it really wrong. But how often does it, that, that, that actually happens regularly? And, and it's from a fishing industry point of view, well, we're catching fish, so let us keep catching them. There's no problem. It's that type of, of thinking. So if we kind of uh, keep on saying uh, there, there is a problem and, and we need to reduce the fishing. Um, Ron, you got your hand up there? Yeah, I think, um, you know, to, to the comments um, about the fishing season, you know, I, I know Bryce just mentioned it today and I've also heard anecdotal discussions before around St. Thomas and that area once the hind bank was closed um, had been closed for about 10 years, that the fishermen were commenting that, you know, before we were only catching these fish during the spawning season, but now we're catching them year round. And I, I think, you know, once you get the focus off that spawning aggregation and you find that, that you, they are available um, more on their home reefs um, year round, you've got really a more sustainable and, and a more economically supportable um, fishing activity going on at that point, if they can survive that long. Can I can I add can I add to that, um, please, Martin? Sure. I don't. Yeah. I sorry. I, I don't know how the uh, how, how your control of the sound is. Um, I, I think one of the one of the things in in the management plan that that we're working on um, was to look to see who are the people actually directly benefiting from aggregations of our two focal species and also people who are uh, mainly fishermen but, but people who are 
benefiting from the species at other times. And we've tended to focus a lot on, you know, the, those who are directly fishing on aggregation. But there are a lot of people, as you say, you know, when, when there's a healthy population who will benefit, who do not necessarily have access to the aggregations, but catch fish outside. And, and those are stakeholders too. So I think actually looking at this bigger picture is also important with, with understanding, you know, the, the, the benefits too from, from having the production coming from healthy aggregations or protected aggregations. Thank you, Yvonne. Um, Alejandro has just posted a, a good question or co yeah, it's a question. Can science, can the science we are discussing deliver what policymakers are asking and stakeholders expect for the management of fish spawning aggregations, such as rapid answers with minimal minimum uncertainty to complex behavioral processes? It's a very good question. Anyone want to have a go? Can we read it again? No one? I'm, I'm just trying to get my head around the question. As usual, Alejandro is giving me complicated questions. <laughs> um, uh, so, so if I'm interpreting it correctly, maybe that's um, this question of whether or not sort of the behavioral complexity of these populations and changes in the behavioral complexity as a function of population size might cause, might stymie clear control rules associated with the fishery. Maybe that's, am I interpreting that correctly? In, in, which, in which case I would say, I think it's going to, I mean, it, it, you know, it's, uh, I, behavior and changes in behavior operating at the level of um, selectivity in a fishery, I don't think is almost ever, if ever incorporated into a stock assessment models, cause it's hard and, um, but it, you know, these are the sorts of situations where they're critically important to consider nonetheless. So I think it's a challenge to figure out how to come up with control rules that account for variability in behavior as a function of population size. And that's that's an open question and a, and a really good one, I think. So it's, it's a hard, hard one to answer, Alejandro, sorry. Did you wanna say something, Alejandro? Yeah, I was gonna say uh, the, the reason why probably uh, Fishermen want to continue fishing and they don't understand many times. Some of them will understand very clearly and those are the ones who are going to allow us to protect some spawning aggregations, but other ones want to continue exploiting and, and fishing them. And the numbers is what they say. There is more fish now than never before. And managers want to have a, a, an easy answer to say the science has to be quick, but all the approaches that we are doing with acoustic telemetry, uh, soundings, and uh, all that will not generate the information that we need in a, in a very short term, term. So we need to find mechanisms in which we can engage these people to understand those quickly so we can really protect before it's too long. Too long. It, sometimes it takes 10 years for us to be able to present enough data for a manager to say, hey, this is working. And that by that time, the resources probably were overfished or it's not there anymore. And then we start in a recovering phase. So that, that was the reason I was just bringing that question. It's uh, something we're dealing with. In, in many cases though, there, there isn't the time, of, it's not the luxury of time while fishing's occurring and waiting for science. It's the same old problem. And, and maybe we need to be much more stronger and firmer in this, in a collective scientific view of the hard facts of the examples and push home the, you know, the problems that have occurred elsewhere can be prevented in your area if you do the right management. And we need to go harder with that approach rather than trying to provide um, more data, more research, which takes time and money. It's an interesting one. Um, Nancy's got a question here, which I'll just read it out to you. It's, it's a question to everyone. So for those species that have aggregations over several months, would a potential answer to the fishing conservation problem be to allow fishing during the last aggregation of the year? This assumes females come to multiple aggregations, so they would have had a chance to spawn at least once during the year. Not a great option, but is it worth considering? 
Anyone want to have a go at answering that one? I guess I'll offer at least a little bit. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure that we have that much sort of definitive science on the timing of, of some of the aggregations. The, certainly the, the Red Hind work that Michelle and, and that whole group has been doing off the west coast of Puerto Rico, you know, has gone from believing that the main spawning peak was December or January, depending on the timing of the moon, um, to now seeing that we still have spawning fish coming back sometimes in March. And there's some evidence that there are a few there in June. So I think from a management perspective, it's really hard to, and, and that varies by year. Um, so, you know, in one year you might be cutting off fishing uh, or allowing fishing starting, you know, March 15th and another year you might be February 15th and then you might be April 12th. Um, you know, so I, I just don't think we have that much solid evidence of, of the timing of these. It, it seems like from a population perspective, it's not necessarily a bad um, thought, but I don't know that we have the science to support it. Thanks, Ron. Um, Martha, you've got your hand up there. Is that about this particular issue? Or you've got another comment to make. Um, sí, gracias, uh, Martin. Esto es un comentario que tenía pendiente hace un ratito sobre cómo el manejo se puede integrar con los, eh, el mejoramiento de las agregaciones reproductivas de peces. Y me parece que en la región tenemos suficientes eh, políticas que están bastante descoordinadas desde el punto de vista de manejo pesquero, la ordenación pesquera o desde el punto de vista de la conservación como tal. Así tenemos programas regionales y nacionales de áreas marinas protegidas que pueden y tienen el potencial de extenderse a favorecer y fortalecer las agregaciones reproductivas, pero no hay suficiente coordinación entre todas estas iniciativas regionales. Definitivamente, casi nunca vamos a tener toda la información necesaria que quisiéramos como administradores de los recursos marinos, pero sí podemos eh, colaborar mejor, coordinarnos mejor, hacer un mejor uso de los recursos que tenemos en este momento para que sea más eficiente y llegue verdaderamente a, al logro final, que es la conservación de las áreas y de las épocas claves para la reproducción de, de los peces en este caso. Gracias. Gracias, Martha. Now, lost the end of my, I didn't catch it because I didn't get my interpretation on quick enough, but can the panel answer that one or make comment? No, Yvonne, did you pick up, did you get the interpretation of that or did you understand? Um, I, I think Martha was talking about, you know, the, the, the need to coordinate better, to be effective. I, um, the, the fact that we have actually enough information very often, we don't need forever more science to be doing some of these things. Um, and I would imagine, I mean, from discussions I've had with Martha on, on NASA Grouper, that certainly there are plenty of examples to show that we need to act and that we have learnt enough about what the major challenges are um, to enable us to, uh, to, to manage these things. So Marta, I, if I haven't, I haven't caught everything, I'm sure. Um, so if there's something important I've missed off, please do, please do come in here. But we need to, to make management possible. We need to have much better coordination at the regional level, um, internally, um, at the national level, uh, and this is a problem. I mean, not only in this region, but but in many other regions. I, and then can I can I go back and make a comment on Nancy's um, question about uh, if there are species that have multiple months uh, that, that that some individuals.
could be taken towards the end. I think one of the problems is with that, that um, in the Caribbean, for groupers and snappers, to my knowledge, there aren't so many species that have multiple months. Um, and that, that was picked up by, uh, I think, several, several uh, responses on that, you know, that the, the variability in the timing, but not necessarily multiple months in any one year. Um, but even when you have species with multiple months, like one of the groupers uh, in, 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 the, in the Pacific, um, we have individuals, females, returning to the same site um, every month. So, you know, it's not like you're just going to get a few females at the, in the last month. There's a possibility that these females aren't necessarily spawning every month um, as uh, according to, to, to what seems to be happening in this particular species. And being able to control just one month would probably be quite difficult to manage. So I'm just thinking from a practical point of view. And just as a general comment, I think, I think we really need to move towards a kind of very a clear approach to aggregations. Um, that going back to, I think, Alejandra's comment, that if we, if we allow the situation to get so bad and our threshold is so low that we don't act until, until that stage, then we're gonna have a lot of problems with recovery. It's the same with um, threatened species, that we tend to wait until they're, they're threatened or, or, or endangered before we actually really do anything. Um, and I think that is a big danger. Going forward, we need to be more, much more conservative about thresholds for threatened species and for things like aggregations, which I'll call sort of threatened life history characteristics, if you like. We need to, uh, that mentality, I think, really has to change. We don't wait until the last minute um, we, 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 we recognize the vulnerabilities in certain species and certain life history events and, and try and act much earlier. Sorry, that was a little bit of a mouthful <laughs> because I was picking up on all these different points. But, but it does also go to show how much more we have to be thinking about how to, how to address some of these, these really big problems that are increasingly affecting fisheries, particularly vulnerable um, aspects of these fisheries. Sorry, I'll, I'll mute now. Thank, thank you, Yvonne. Um, that's a very valid point. Um, there are a few comments and questions which I'll read through in the interest of time. I think we've got another five minutes or so. Um, Michelle Scherer has said, hi, Nancy, um, that, that wouldn't be recommendable for protogynous species to avoid a risk of sperm limitations. Um, Joe, Joe Pitt from Bermuda, um, a comment to Nancy, artisanal fisheries for mullet row often take the approach for allowing fishing during the last month of the reproductive season, but these are not aggregating species. Um, Krista Sherman has mentioned uh, Alejandro, genetic genomic approaches can also be useful tools for examining changes in effective population size and population structure, connectivity and applied to management. Uh, Joe from Bermuda again has said, uh, however, when we were looking to adapt the closure of red, red hind aggregations to changes brought about, sorry, red hind aggregation to changes brought about changes in seawater temperatures, Fisher said that fixed opening and closing times were important and changing dates to match the lunar cycle was not practical. I think that's, that's a, a key point. Um, and there's a comment from, or a question from Bob. Uh, do we need to recognize that many of these mobile species in reality have fairly strong alien effects and do not need to be, and do these need to be more fully integrated into stock assessment models? Um, I don't know the answer to that one. Bob, does anyone else want to comment on that particular one? Joe Pitt says, I agree, Bob. I, I guess I, I would say, um, I think if we can figure out the specifics of those Ali effects, I think it would be a very good idea. Um, the, the challenge is ultimately that we're, we're still uh, still trying to figure out what the mechanisms is behind the apparent ali effects that are happening, and 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 I think you know until you can really have a firm handle on what what those mechanisms are, it, it's hard to sort of incorporate those uh, into a, an assessment. And they may be biological, you know, they may be behavioral in mechanism or 
Um, so yeah, so it's an interesting open question. The, uh, while I've got the floor, I'll just say quickly and follow up to what Yvonne just said and, and uh, uh, riffing off of Alejandro's question. I think one of the challenges in Florida, for instance, it's been so long since, the, since uh, a large population um, was there that it's kind of lost to the collective memory of the, the fishing community. And because of that, when you see any recovery at all, it looks like there's spades of fishes about. And, and so establishing some you know, reasonable expectations about what virgin biomass is, is, is absolutely key. You know, in the Caymans, Little Cayman, that's an island 11 kilometers wide, long by a kilometer wide, and it's got a population of nearly 9,000 Nassau grouper with no signs of that population slowing down in terms of growth. That's an insane amount of biomass for a large predator. It begs the question, like, what, what is version biomass. And I, I would suggest that for most of us here, it's way higher than we were probably thinking in our heads, especially when we were, you know, diving on reefs as kids. So anyway. Thanks, Bryce. Um, we're about to finish the session, but there is one comment that's come through from Alfonso Aguirre Pierre, which is quite pertinent to what we're talking about. And uh, it says, Yvonne, the key issue here is getting the government of every country compromised to recognize the recommendations of the Sporting Aviation Working Group here in Mexico, I've been attempting to do an approach, but politics issues prevent the, the accomplishment of the task. However, I keep pushing forward, but an international backup is required here in Mexico. I think an international backup is required everywhere. I need it here in Australia, so that's a good point, Al Alfonso. Um, for Dilla, I think we're out of time, is that right? Yes, you can just sort of wrap up with some final words and then we can move on to the next session. Yeah, I think those last words are, are key for me. Um, I think we do need a, a, a stronger voice, a, a collective voice um, globally that can be used in, in any circumstance, whether it's in Australia, Caribbean or off the coast of Africa. Um, so I think the, the discussion was really informative. Um, there were some good questions coming through there. I will note that we have a bit of a gathering, a virtual meetup of uh, anyone interested in spawning aggregations and that's at uh, 4 p.m. Miami time today. So anyone wants to join that one, we can have a random catch up discussion um, and have a beer if you like as well. Um, and that's at 4 p.m. Miami time today. Um, I, that's it for me. I, I really enjoyed that. And I, this was recorded, so we'll be able to go through it again if we need to. Back to you, Fadilla. And thank you to the panel. And thank you for everyone for, for participating. Much appreciated. Thank you, Martin. And as Thank I've you said, everybody. Previous Great to see you all. Thank you, Martin. Uh, sessions. Uh, the conversation does not end here. We encourage you all of these um, presentations from today. There, these three minute presentations, there are full talks available um, on the app. So we encourage you to go check them out and please keep interacting uh, with the speakers from today and also keep this conversation going through the um, virtual meetup with the FSA group. And just in general for this meeting, please continue to engage on the app. Um, next up, we're gonna to move to an exciting um, special session about celebrating the International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture, which we call IAPA. Um, and this will be um, sort of a, a little bit of info into IAFA in the Gulf and Caribbean region. And I'm gonna invite um, our moderators for this event. So uh, Yvette, are you here? You can probably... Um... Hi, hi. Yes, Fadila, I'm here. Just to introduce, but the moderator is uh, uh, Ms. Shang, Shang Dalia. So I will, I will give the general over, um, I mean, a welcome uh, remark. Okay. Can I? Okay. So just thought as uh, I'm the, the secretary of uh, the Western Central Atlantic Fishery Commission, and I would like uh, to bid uh, a warm welcome to this special session uh, on celebrating the International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture in the Gulf and Caribbean region through recovery 
hopefully end up resilience. I wish uh, actually to all acknowledge uh, that uh, uh, this session is organized by the by WCAPC, the Western Central Atlantic uh, Commission, in partnership uh, with uh, the Caribbean Natural Resources Institute, uh, Canary, the Caribbean Networks of uh, Fisher Folk Organizations, CNFO, the Caribbean Regional Fisheries Mechanism, CRFM, the Central American Fisheries and Aquaculture Organization, OSPESCA, the University of West Indies Center for Resource Management and Environmental Studies, or UWISEL means, the Gulf and Caribbean Fisheries Institute, ECFI, and with our official supporter, the European Union. The coordination of for the preparation of for the activities, participation in global planning processes and uh, active contribution of uh, WCAPC member state uh, for a successful IFR 2022 in uh, the WCAPC region uh, is uh, a specific recommendation of the commission made uh, in 2019. So the importance of uh, as uh, you saw, the, the activities uh, uh, um, uh, are, are very important uh, for WCAPC. And these activities uh, will unfold uh, consistently with our overarching theme of uh, resilience and uh, recovery with gender and youth uh, as cross-cutting themes uh, together with uh, sub-themes that uh, we have on social resilience, innovation, intersectoral uh, linkages. You know, the, the importance of the celebration of this year stems from the significant uh, contribution that small-scale fisheries and uh, small-scale aquaculture maker in this region in terms of uh, food and nutrition security, livelihoods, poverty eradication, and uh, also sustainable use of natural resources. Indeed, while small-scale uh, fisheries or catches in Latin America and the Caribbean are less than large-scale uh, fisheries, they account for more than half of uh, landed value. This is important. In addition, almost 90% of direct and uh, indirect uh, job in fisheries uh, uh, and aquaculture are connected uh, to these uh, fisheries. And this provides uh, up to 85% of the fish that is consumed. Unfortunately, as uh, you may note, uh, this substantial contribution is not uh, always uh, fully recognized. This special session is uh, and therefore part of a series of activities uh, with members and partners in order to increase uh, the understanding and actions to collaboratively support uh, these uh, subsectors for their sustainable development. I will name the main intervention we have planned for, for this uh, uh, IFR, the regional launch. Next week, uh, we will have uh, the regional launch of uh, IFR on the 19th of uh, November. Uh, that's on uh, the Latin America and the Caribbean. You will all be informed about it. There is an ongoing process uh, currently of uh, identification of uh, small scale fisheries and aquaculture champions in order to celebrate uh, the excellence uh, to those uh, for those uh, who are supporting this uh, uh, sector. It could be from fisher folks or fish workers perspective, uh, it could be some policy makers, uh, fisheries officers, uh, uh, academia, researchers, um, so a civil society as well. So champions uh, are being identified. Uh, um, that's uh, a key activities. Members uh, are also preparing uh, their roadmap for IFA. And uh, we are currently mobilizing resources uh, in order to support uh, the members in implementing the roadmap uh, that uh, they, they are currently um, uh, developing. So I, 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 it's a pleasure for me also to, in terms of uh, resource mobilization, uh, to uh, let you know that uh, we've already mobilized uh, 120,000 US dollars from uh, our supporters, the European Union, for the activity to contribute uh, to the activities of uh, IFA in uh, the, uh, the WCAF region this year. To take us through this session, we are honored to have uh, Dr. Dalia Shang, who is uh, the chair of the International Steering Committee uh, for IFA. Let me briefly introduce you our facilitator. 
Dalia Chang of the IFA, chair for the IFA 2020 International Steering Committee, has been working in the Ministry of for Production of Peru since 2015. She began working as a legal advisor in the General Directorate for Supervision, Inspection, and Sanction of the Vice Ministry of Fisheries and Aquaculture. Assuming since last year as the director of the Directorate of Monitoring and Evaluation of the General Directorate of Policies and Regulatory Analysis in the same vice ministry. She has a bachelor degree in law and master in corporate law with a mayor in business management. Without further ado, I'll pass the floor to Ms. Shang. Ms. Shang, please, over to you. Thank you, Beth, for your welcome and the invitation to join you here at the 74th meeting of the Gulf and Caribbean Institute. Um, as Yvette mentioned, the International Year is a monumental event that seeks to highlight the important role of small-scale fisheries and aquaculture in contribution to the livelihoods of millions of people around the Gulf and Caribbean region. As chair of the ISC, I recognize the importance of building effective synergies between the International Committee and regional committees. Indeed, one of the main goals of the ISC is to identify opportunities and simulate dialogues among the groups at the national, regional, and global programs. Today's event is for making that goal operational. So today you will hear, hear the important contribution that small-scale fisheries and aquaculture make to a cross-section of stakeholders. Our aim with the section of these participants is to demonstrate and bring attention to the men and women who are engaged in the industry. Our objectives in this session are going to be three. The first one, demonstrate that the multidimensional contribution of small scale features from a range of groups, including policymakers, gender specialists, civil society, and fisher folks representatives. The second one is identify intersectional, uh, sorry, intersectoral uh, linkages that are at play within the fishery industry in the Gulf and Caribbean region and how to leverage those linkages. And the third and last, galvanize regional support in the lead up to the international year. So as we get started, we encourage you to uh, submit any question that you have using the, um, the Q&A function or also the chat box that you have on your screen. Uh, for have an order, an order uh, each participant will make a five minute intervention, but we have reserved approximately uh, 30 minutes for audience questions. So now I will introduce each participants before providing uh, the prompt of the year to respond. So um, our first prompt is directed at Mr. Julian Defoe. Uh, Julian Defoe from the Commonwealth um, of Dominica is the Chief Fisheries Officer at the Fisheries Division, Ministry of Blue and Green Economy, Agriculture and National Food Security. He has over 20 years of working experience with the division and has undergone extensive training in various regional and international forums in a small scale fisheries development. Mr. Defoe holds a master's degree from the University of the West Indies, Cape Hill Barbados. Currently, he also serves as the convener for the WICAF Mort Fat uh, Working Group. So welcome, Julian. Uh, and this question is going to be for you. What do you think should be done to improve on our social protection policies and institutional arrangement to make them more inclusive and to create awareness among fisher folk and small scale fish farmers about such and about such arrangements and improve on their capacity to access them? Mr. 
you are mute, Julian. The unforbidden mistake. <laughs> Yes, uh, thank you, Dida, very much for um, your question. But I was just, I was saying before I, I proceed, um, I would like to say thank you to the FAO and GCFI for the opportunity to be a, a panelist and also your organization. On an important dis and relevant discussion, I must say, on um, especially in the time of celebrating internationally of artisanal fisheries and aquaculture in the Gulf and the Caribbean area. And um, this is the 74th conference, and I'm, I've been fortunate to visit a few. Um, Dalia, unfortunately, um, I did not have to think. And the reason why I said I did not have to think because much of what should be done because in reality has been done in articulating what should be done for improving um, social protection policies and the institutional arrangements to make them more inclusive and to create awareness among fisher folk and small scale fishers aquaculturists, including about such arrangements. Um, however, the, the issue has been most broadly is limitations, constraints, failures, even at times reluctance um, thus far um, in regards to the second part of the question, which is access, enable to attain this objective. And my basis for, for saying that uh, much has been done is I think we will start with what, for those of us who are fisheries practitioners, our Bible our 1995 Bible, not, not, not like Jesus Christ, which is the Code of Conduct for Responsible Fisheries. And embedded in that in, is, in the objective article, which is in two, from the beginning one recognized, recognizes that social aspects in establishing the principles in the, in the Code of Conduct. And the most significantly in respect to our, our own discussion here today, which is small scale or artisanal fisheries, to promote fisheries and food security and prioritizes local communities nutritional needs. So these are embedded in the objective of the code of conduct for responsible fisheries. And most recently, we, we have, in addition, we want to move on to the voluntary guidelines for securing small scale fisheries in 2015, again, um, developed um, through the, the, the great work of um, FAO. And this, <coughs> sorry, okay, and um, which is like a Bible to us also, which is a blueprint. This is something that I, I use on a, on, a, on a daily basis since it, it was, was developed. And it already provides a clear pathway of what should be done. It addresses all the key areas central to social protection, such as, you know, many things, the guiding principles, equity, equality, accountability, um, economic and social environmental sustainability, gen gender. Um, there are so many key and relevant things already covered in the SSF guidelines. Okay, so again, I want to say, that's why I don't have to think much, okay? Because from a personal perspective, we have done tremendous collective work. And this is an initiative we, we took part over several years from 2011 to 2014 when it was endorsed and officially published in 2015. All of these years with all of the major countries involved, um, small developed, all of us which we have a, a significant small scale artisanal fisheries was engaged in, in this process. You know, so from, in my opinion, from, from a CARICOM member state um, context and, and also a lesser extent, um, the OECS, to which I can speak a bit more because I know of the general situation while our conference addresses the entire Gulf and the Caribbean, but I want to put this here in the con in content text. Okay, um, a lot has been done, tremendous amount of work from a national to regional um, perspective by many organizations. So these things, you know, have provided policy perspective to policy makers, government, trainings for official folk, public awareness campaigns for fisher folk by many of our credible regional institutions, such as the SOMIS from the University of the West Indies, FAO itself, CRFM, Canary based in, in Trinidad, tremendous amount of PR work has been done. So, so the, 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 pro the problem is, and I which is the big but, the limitation has been in the actual access, which is the second part of the question, access to those means. Okay, that would that would create the social protection that we're looking about. And those constraints has been be it that financial, appropriate infrastructure, um, property, tenure, etc. So this is just my my small closing remarks as I know 
time is limited, but I just want us, you know, going forward to, to now focus on the access, because tremendous work, I would say, as I explained, and this is not all has been done already in charting and mapping the way and developing this strategy for social protection in small scale fisheries. Thank you, Dalia. Thank you, Julian, for your response. Um, our next speaker, oh, before that, don't forget that any questions you can put it and write it in the in the chat box or also in the question and answer um, chat that we have, and well, we all have in our screen. Our next speaker, Ms. Lisa Perth, will expand on Julian's response by adding the important gender perspective. Lisa Perk is the CEO of a woman, women-led consultancy company based in Barbados. She is a gender and environment specialist with more than 20 years in the development field. Her work as a consultant is global. She is a member of the Gender in Fisheries team, GIF, and has conduced several studies as well as training for fisher folk researchers and other development actors on gender in a small scale fisheries. She developed the gender equality mainstreaming policy for the OACS commission and was the lead consultant in designing the Engender project. Lisa, welcome. And for you, this is the, the question. What gaps do you think remain in the ongoing work to mainstream gender in SSFA, how mm -hmm. could IAFA be a game changer in championing a gender and gender um, perspective with representative, fair and sustainable SSFA? How do you, how do these gaps link to climate a change or can be responded to through a climate or a climate and gender lens? Thank you. Thank you so much, Dahlia. I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And of course, to follow Julian, um, who definitely started this off very well. I want to take this opportunity to quickly thank GCFI, as well as FAO, uh, CERMES, and the whole, the, the organizers um, and the sponsors for the opportunity to join this esteemed panel. Uh, so Dahlia has given me three very heavy questions. So let me see what I can do in five minutes. So uh, I would say I would pick up from where Jillian um, ended off by saying that there has been a lot of work done, including on gender. I think if you look back for the last five, 10 years, uh, we've definitely had a, a bit of an arc when it comes to looking at gender and fisheries. I think the gender and fisheries team, which is a very broad team across the region with many, you know, many disciplines has been quite effective. The support from FAO, um, SLC has been very important in that regard. And some of the work that I will mention here has been supported by them. Uh, I think also you have to look at the work of CRFM, um, including some of the work that's been doing on gender mainstreaming and fisheries, their action plan. So we have done some work, but there are gaps that remain. And Dylan hit on one of the key ones that I'll talk about a little later. I wanna kind of reinforce what Yvette would have said though, that as we look at this issue, when we look at these three topics that you asked me to think about, I think it's important to put them in the context of the SDGs, for example. And that if we're gonna be looking at these three issues, we look at you know, not only gender equality, but poverty, uh, you know, zero hunger and food and nutritional security. We look at decent work and economic growth because you know, we are involved in fisheries. And even though it's not necessarily uh, uh, the biggest um, you know, uh, contributor to GDP, it is critical for the livelihoods and income for a lot of people, uh, both formally and informally. We also look at responsible uh, consumption and production uh, life below water. And obviously, also we need to think about peace, justice and strong institutions because fisheries is not happening, uh, particularly SSF is not happening in a vacuum. It's happening along with many other activities that are happening sometimes in the same space or sometimes the same economic zone. Um, so in terms of looking at the gaps, uh, access is definitely an important one. And Julian would have mentioned finance, uh, you know, but there are other uh, elements I think we need to look at. We need to look at the fairness and the non-discrimination of access, um, you know, and I think fisher folk will raise often how they feel that they're challenged um, to be able to be treated fairly, um, at, you know, for persons to really have respect for what they do and the income they earn. 
Uh, we also need to look at asset ownership. Uh, you know, this is a challenge. You need assets, you need collateral to be able to access finance often. And depending on the community you're from, particularly if you're from an indigenous community, often assets are commonly owned and our systems are not open yet to understanding these, you know, different forms of collateral and collateralization. And so this presents a barrier uh, to some members of our community uh, across the GCFI region. Uh, other, also we have to think about the fact that we are living in a region that is very much exposed to extreme events, uh, both weather and climate related. We are seeing already some of the effects of that uh, in the coastal and marine uh, environment. And what we often lack also are the risking tools, tools that will help fisher folk, their communities, their households, to be able to uh, you know, smooth some of the impacts that they, they, they see and they feel uh, from small and big events. Uh, you know, one of the things that comes to mind is that when I was doing some work recently in Dominica and I had the pleasure of talking to Jillian was that even though Hurricane Elsa passed, supposedly brushed uh, Dominica, it did not brush uh, Dubique Stowe. So when we think about the impact of an event, it's not just at the national level. Sometimes the nation is fine, but it's some communities that are actually facing some very acute impacts. And we need to look at that. And we need to have that in mind when we're doing our work. And the importance there is looking at some of the gender impacts of that in terms of the fishermen, but also the knock-on effects for those who are uh, you know, involved across the value chain, uh, particularly women. Uh, we need to also do better at collecting data, uh, doing research, uh, but we also need to make sure that we're really building in and mainstreaming climate change and uncertainty. Uh, I think we've learned some key lessons from COVID in this regard, but we also wanna make sure that we're addressing issues of decent work and labor, uh, which can affect men and women very differently. Um, if I think about what EAFA can do, uh, I think there's going to be an important um, advocacy role, and it will be important to, you know, to put on the table several things. I think we need to look at governance and power dynamics and the role that women and men play in leadership and decision making around the fishery sector, particularly small scale fisheries. Who's deciding? What, what are they deciding on? And who is affected by those decisions are key elements. I think we need to look at how we expand the opportunities across the value chain for both men and women, uh, uh, particularly to, to do this in a way that would leave them less vulnerable to specific kinds of challenges that come from either economic, social, or environmental shocks. We need to look at the quality of participation. So even though I'm saying men and women, it's not to invite Lisa to the meeting. It's to invite the person who actually knows about fisheries, knows about small-scale fisheries, understands the livelihoods uh, and to be at the table and to be helped to, con you know, to, con to con contribute and to really help to, to present ideas and to be able to implement some of the initiatives that are necessary. But we also need to make sure that we're understanding what are the social and cultural norms that are around the fishery sector. Every single ecosystem, including fisheries as an industry have norms and cultures. Uh, some of them are good, some of them are not so enabling. And so we need to confront and challenge those if we're really gonna make sure that things are inclusive that as Julian says, that we have access to social protection. Because one of the things you will see uh, from COVID is that when social protection is out there, often what it says is full-time fishermen. Now look at that, full-time fishermen. That means that fisher folk who are women are not gonna be taking getting support. It also means that the part-time fisher person also will not be getting support. So if you wanna be inclusive, even in terms of who we're defining as those in need will need to change. Uh, if we look at climate change, one of the things to look at is how the climate patterns are, you know, conflicting also with some of the more uh, robust times of action and activity from the fishing community. And so you're asking now, you know, we're now dealing with double challenges. We're dealing with sargassum and a number of issues. And we need to look at how we address those needs and how we look at, you know, a whole of society, whole of system, a whole of year because a lot of fisher folk will also say that having income across the year is a bit of a challenge for them. You know, how do they do this? We need to really look at what are the systems in place, what are the needs, uh, and how they differ from community, from fishing activity, or species, uh, you know, et cetera, the type of boat you're using, all of those potentially have implications. Last but not least, it's important to recognize that climate is not happening also in a vacuum. It's coming on top of a number of environmental stressors. Our work that we've done uh, in Guyana, Suriname, and Trinidad really helped to identify that, you know, countries may be all facing climate change, but they may also be facing a number of 
combined factors that are challenging their ability to confront and address the, you know, the significant problems, uh, the variability, the shifts, the challenges that are really affecting the community and communities. Uh, and that includes issues like pollution, uh, overfishing, uh, you know, high tides, uh, you know, and also sometimes, you know, issues that are happening at the port level. So we want to make sure that we're taking a broad view of what are some of the challenges and we're, we're making sure that in addition to looking at the fisher folk, we're also bringing in the broader community, we're bringing other industries, and we're really looking at what are some of the possible solutions for making sure that small scale fisheries can not only be sustainable, but it can also be sustained. And as lastly, as we do that, we wanna make sure we understand the impacts of those combined factors and challenges on men and women and how they differ. And we saw this in the work that we did in Suriname, Guyana and Trinidad, uh, when we were looking at shrimp and ground fish and some of the, you know, the differences were quite distinctive in terms of the impact both indirect and direct on men and women and also on households and communities. We wanna make sure that we address that in a really integrative way and that we have frameworks that allow for that climate gender lens to come together, uh, looking at both the livelihood perspective, but also looking at the ecosystem and the ecosystem needs that we have to address as well. I'll stop there and look forward to hearing from the other panelists and also look forward to the questions from uh, you know, our participants. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa. Um, yes, you've highlighted some great points from the gender perspective. And well, now we will continue that stream of thoughts uh, from the civil society perspective. To provide that perspective, we are pleased to welcome Mr. Denis Sami. Denis Sami is a community development specialist. He has over 30 years of experience in the field of conservation and ecotourism in a leadership position. His contribution earned him a national award human bird silver medal um, in 2001 for his loyalty and devoted service to Trinidad and Tobago in the sphere of the environment. Um, over the last five years, Dennis has worked with fishers in Northeast Trinidad to plan and develop a small-scale fisheries program to improve decision-making and collaboration among small-scale fisheries. Welcome, Dennis. And for you, the, the question is, what role do you think you and your fisher folks um, organization, a small scale fish farming organization, can play in highlighting the importance of SSF, SSA to economies, livelihoods, and culture in the WICAF region to our policymakers and the public at large? The floor is yours. Thank you. Hi, th thank you very much. Um, special thank you to um, to Canary for the nomination and to GCFI for facilitating the session. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, Future Fishers as an organization, um, uh, uh, we we have uh, pegged our our uh, our thinking along the lines of ensuring that um, we think about the future of our current decision-making process. So when you think about fishers making decisions today and how it impacts the resources down the road, um, that's the message that is being sent. That is message that is being communicated with the fishers and that's the message we are hoping the fishers will start to spread. The, the role that you are speaking about is connected with uh, being a steward of the environment, uh, a steward of the fisheries resource. Uh, and that simply means ensuring that there is um, su sustainable use and management of the natural resources over a long period of time. So with, with every role, there is some, uh, some amount and aspect of responsibility and I think um, uh, uh, both, both Lisa and Julian talked about some of the issues um, surrounding the environment in which fishers operate. Uh, a core example is that Trinidad is operating under legislation that is more than 100 years old. And as a result of that, a lot of bad habits, a lot of um, uh, ill-advised practices have been 
allowed to develop and created. So you have a challenged environment and a lot of behaviors that impacts the resources, in some cases, a very negative way. So when you, when you think about um, the role that fishers need to play and the responsibility that comes with it, the first, um, the first thing that comes to mind is the issue of um, participating in data collection, participating in conversations that allows for the correct information to be generated about the species about the catch rates, about the cost and effectiveness of the fishing methods that has been utilized. So first and foremost, secondly, I think from when you, when you think about, the, you, you look at the information gathering side of it, you can also immediately uh, um, send that to what is the cost to fishers and how can fishers collaborate and work together towards reducing the cost of operation, especially since the, the, the catch over the last five to 10 years have been decreasing significantly. So when you think about that, you think about fishers must be able to operate effectively. They have a responsibility now to connect with collaboration for the reduction of cost. In other words, are there any opportunities associated with bulk purchases? So that kind of collaboration could support um, the move towards real stewardship behaviors within the industry. Another core point is the issue of um, the supply of fish and the opportunity to protect and to uh, uh, safeguard important nesting grounds, safeguard important spawning areas. Those, uh, that's the kind of thinking that underpins a future fisher. The, the, the thinking about the future of your current decision, ensuring that the long-term viability of the resource is very important and fishers should not be thinking about allowing um, legislation to guide their action because the resource, the, the, the few people that benefit from the fishery resource are fishers. And, and that means they have a responsibility to ensure its long-term sustainability and long-term protection. So the other thing that I, I think would be even, even more critical is the issue of ensuring that the fish that they catch, that they, the systems can be set up to ensure that they can maximize the value of the fish. So can it be, can it be salted? Can it be smoked? Can it be packaged and um, uh, sold to larger um, distribution outlets. Those are the kind of things that fishers need to, need to be concerned with. The long-term value and maximizing the value of the fish. That I think is going to be the most important part of the next five to 10 years and understanding where, uh, um, how, how the benefits roll back to the fisher and uh, linking with that is the expansion of the downstream industry and the environment that facilitates the development of the downstream industry. We heard before the access to markets, we heard before the access to finance as a critical component of some of the challenges that underpins the role that fishers have to play in um, ensuring the sustainability of the resource. So linking with that is the whole idea of how does climate change play a role in, um, in affecting the value chain for fishers and how, does, how do fishers and or NGOs and or other agencies can come in and help um, with climate proofing the value chain for fishers. This is a... This is a, a, a special um, a, a toolkit that was developed by Canary in regards to ensuring that natural resource users can um, continue to use the resources in, in, a, in a sustainable way. And also the, the whole issue of um, thinking about while fishing, how can you, um, how can you reduce your bycatch? How can you reduce the catch of turtles? How can you reduce the catch of 
uh, other vulnerable species being more open to alternative equipment or alternative methods and willingness to try new methods are also very critical um, approach to take. And fishers do have a role to play where these things are concerned. And if you, if you also um, think about, on the one hand, you would, you would talk about the bycatch, but on the other hand, you can talk about what can we do to improve the, the environment for fish to spawn, for fish to grow, for fish to, um, to develop. And I think those are, those are sort of the combination of things that we can look at. It's conservation of the resource, product development, cost reduction, downstream industry. With that, I say thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, thank you, Dennis, for your perspective. I think our intervention will continue to expand in this direction. Um, for this intervention, we welcome Mr. Adrian Larroda. Adrian Larroda is President of the Bahamas Commercial Fisheries Alliance, CFA, and Chair of the Network of Fisher Folk Organizations, CNFO. He provides oversight to the CNFOS uh, work plan, which, is, which includes activities to, pro to improve the livelihood, uh, livelihoods of Caribbean fisheries and fishing communities while promoting the sustainable use of marine resources. In April 2020, uh, Adrian has been part of the team that launched a Fisher Folk Leadership Institute, which provides training to 17 Caribbean member states. So Adrian, before I am going to ask you the question, um, I am going to put you in, in context, no? Uh, with climate variability and change leading uh, to more intense storms and COVID-19, disrupting livelihoods activities, small scale fisher folks and small scale fish farmers, tend to be several impact as they have little or no access to social protection arrangements. And taking that or this in consideration, uh, what sort of coping strategies do you, do you or others in your community utilize to address losses in incoming and access to critical services? Uh, what role do you think the governments in the regional can play in better preparing small-scale fisheries or fishing, small-scale uh, small aquaculture communities to deal with the negative impacts of climate uh, change and likely future pandemics? So, Adrian, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And on behalf of CNFO, I'd like to thank you for this invitation to participate in this panel as we look forward to greater participation in IAFA, the International Year of Artisanal Fisheries. Um, the, you know, it's a good opportunity for CNFO. Oh, 2020, 2019, 2020 was very challenging for fishers across our region and, and the Caribbean. Um, and as we know, we faced a number of challenges. Uh, the chief among them was COVID. And secondly, was uh, here in the Bahamas, we had Hurricane Dorian, and other, other countries were affected by, by major hurricanes. And as we know, hurricanes are going to will become more intense as a result of climate change. What the CNFO has been doing as a focus is trying to, is assisting and understanding through training at the Leadership Institute the, the experiences of our, of our fishers in our member states. With this, they are, we've been able to share a lot of experiences in terms of, of loss of income, which we all know for small scale fisheries is, 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 is very, you know, it's, it's challenging. 
uh, uh, the loss of income could be as a result of anything from, from storms or from loss of, of equipment law through, through any major and, and even minor incidences. Uh, we, we've seen where there's been loss of income, fishes couldn't, you know, weren't able to work or weren't able to go out and, and harvest any, any product because of sea swells. Uh, as you know, in some regions, we have the major sargassum issues, uh, which is prohibited fishes from actually operating. These are some of the challenges that we meet, which are becoming more frequent now. So in order to, to mitigate losses, what we, are what we are trying to do is train our fishes to understand that, 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 that they must prepare themselves for days when they will not be able to, to, to harvest product. Uh, uh, we, we actually cause them to train themselves in the better use of that the better use of fads uh, uh, to make their each fishing expedition uh, to fish smarter uh, uh, on each expedition so that you know you don't spend a lot of time trying to chase a fish but you actually know where to go to find fish we have we actually causing them to be trained in in the use of, of, of better equipment for the, the operation of their business these are the things we feel will, is, is a step to actually mitigate and limit some of the losses that fish shouldn't have because it's not so much losing because you you may lose your product but there are lost fishing days that have the greater impact on fishes um as we move forward we, go, we will be forever challenged uh through climate change and, and, and adverse weather conditions with this you know we, the cnfo is going to begin to advocate for better better fishing facilities for fishes in other Caribbean, fishes throughout the region. Because as you see, and even with the photograph that, that is your background photograph, uh, Ms. Chang, you will see that there are small vessels that are just uh, lying on the seashore. Those vessels are vulnerable to, to adverse weather conditions if a, if a storm were, were, were to come through, and that'll be lost assets. So what we want to do is have, provide how fishes, you know, to, to provide for the better protection of, of fishes assets. Uh, uh, and of course, as was mentioned before, the ownership of some of these assets, there are many challenges that fishes face because they don't actually own the assets, but they're just merely, merely what we call a uh, uh, share, hold share, share, share uh, participants in these operations. Uh, the, the major plan too, even though we, we, we speak about ownership of assets is to, is the securing of these assets. Uh, to put, you know, to provide uh, protection for them, so they will be, you know, be able to be utilized for for longer periods, and all that. Um, as was mentioned before, too, the you know the the uh, another issue is the respecting of the social and cultural norms of fishes. Through COVID nineteen and with the twenty twenty pandemic, a lot of restrictions were placed on fishes that were considered harsh. Uh, as as we all know, you know, fresh fish and and, and, and the fisherman's livelihood, fishermen provides provide a vital service to every community because of what they do. And to restrict that activity to the point where people, fishers were not able to go out to fish and all that was, was extremely harsh. And so, you know, we, we through our international partners, you know, we tried to advocate to have those restrictions list, lifted or eased in most instances to allow fishermen to continue to, to apply their trade. Because when you, you know, with, placing those types of restrictions on on artisanal fishers and 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 the, and the industry what you're doing is, uh, is is now causing these independent people to rely on government's social assistance and as 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 which is really not the intent of 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 what a social assistance program should be so so uh we, we found that that uh, those restrictions through COVID 19 and we hope that in future pandemics, greater collaboration could be had and understanding of, of all participants and, and the cultural norms of, of, of different communities, because what may work in one country may not work in another country. Um, uh, what may work in, 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 in one community, one constituency, one community on a, in a particular country may not, you know, may not be the best uh, uh, solution or, or, or the best method to manage uh, a, a pandemic in another community. So these are things that need to be looked at. And through CNFO, we want to have that collaboration as we play a greater role in the management of fisheries resort, you know, of, of fish, of, uh, fisheries organizations in throughout the, the, the region. Uh, and we've, we've, we've actually been a, a, 
a great source of information for governments and fisheries divisions because we're able to provide you know the uh, across border cross border uh, collaboration uh, you know to to help them in decision making so we want to continue that and and of course as was again mentioned earlier by one of the other panelists we want we, we too want to promote diversification and, and and add value to our fisheries products regionally um, at the moment they're from our information and, and, and from our members, we find that there's very little trade, uh, inter, inter-Caribbean trade on fisheries products. And that is something that we want to change as an organization, CNFO, because we would like to see more inter-Caribbean trade, and particularly fisheries products, uh, 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 even through the canning, salting, preservation, et cetera, et cetera, even, even through the sale of fresh products. Um, um, you know, so that we would not so be so heavily reliant on on I would call the European market or the U.S. market for 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 our revenue. Uh, those are just some of the things that CNF was looking at. And again, as we as we move into the in, into this new realm now, where storms are becoming stronger, uh, you know, uh, some coastal areas are going to be adversely affected by 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 sea level rise and like, all those things. We can only hope. That, that all development and all initiatives are taken with the greatest interest of, of small scale fishers, you know, and, and as we pro also to promote the, the, the small scale fisheries guidelines, these things will, we, we feel, will, will aid, our, you know, artisanal fishery, fishers and, and, and fisheries, um, uh, you know, as we, as we move forward into the, what I would call the next, uh, the next millennium, or more or less. Uh, but, but again, thank you. And, I hope I wasn't too long, but I have a lot of notes. Uh, <laughs> so just want to thank you for the opportunity. And I look forward to any questions from, from, from any of the attendees. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian, um, for your perspective. Um, you were able to add an important intervention to the ideas we have from our other panelists. And well, now uh, we will transition to the, to the questions from our audience. Uh, we encourage you to direct your questions once again to one or all of your parties, all, all of the panelists. Uh, please, if, if your question is going to be for a specific panelist, it would be we, it will be really appreciated if you can include his or her name in the question. So I can see that we already have some questions in the chat box. So the first one is from Silvia Salas, um, and it's going to be for Dennis. Um, Dennis indicated that the benefit of fishing goes to a wider range of groups and society, but the costs and challenges are held by the sector. Uh, her question is, how other sectors that benefit from the activity help to ensure to improve the environment of resources and the future of SSF, for instance, tourism, which keeps growing in the Caribbean region? Dennis, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sylvia, for the question. Um, uh, there is certainly linkages between the sectors, especially tourism. I mean, fisheries support tourism very significantly. One in terms of food, but also in terms of the opportunity for tourism experience. I guess this really speaks to where the tourism experience can be safely developed, but also um, uh, richly created for the benefit of um, uh, locals and foreign tourists at the same time. So, um, so certainly um, from, from a linkages perspective, even from the perspective of agriculture, there is also opportunity for linkages. And uh, we, we did not go very deep into the economic model that we have been building around this um, today, but the intention is to connect all of these various sectors to, um, to the benefit of 
the um, the fisheries and the fisheries resource because when you when you think about it, the fisheries resource is not in isolation of the effects and impact from other sectors and other resources. Um, Ridge to reef, as an example, um, play play a critical role. Um, uh, mangroves, uh, coastal environments uh, do have both positive and negative effects on the fisheries resource, and those kinds of um, uh, um, sector interaction and integration is also going to be very important. But one of the key components of all of this that uh, eluded me during my presentation was the organization of fishers in a way that they themselves can advocate for and with each other in, re in relation to when something when some event or activity can impact the resource. So when you, when you think about coastal development, when you think about development of ports, development of um, uh, uh, infrastructure that can certainly affect the, the, um, the environment, in some cases, the uh, ecosystem that uh, function that supports the resource. So, so yes, um, certainly those, those are all aspects of, um, of where the connectivity could lie. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis, for the response. Um, we have another question from Beth, and it's for Lisa. Lisa, from your for your experience, what do you think should be the top three actions that policymakers should pay greater attention to in terms of gender as they are on the celebratory year. Lisa, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dahlia. And thank you, Yvette, for this question. At least I had a little time to prepare. Uh, so I had a little bit more time than, than Dennis, maybe. Uh, so thanks for this question. Uh, I came up with three things. So first, budgeting. In order to celebrate the year, you have to have budgets. And if we want to do a good job of addressing gender, we need to make sure that we have good budgeting even from now. Um, you know, that is gender responsive, you know, so we need to look and see within the fisheries budget, what are we going to be doing to, to make sure that IAFA is well celebrated, but that also a gender lens is in there. Uh, second part of that is that in order to do that, they need to consult. So they need to consult with the fishery sector and with the dentists of the world and the Julians, et cetera, and the Asians, but they also need to consult with women's groups in the fishery sector, as well as the gender bureau. Um, if they're going to be doing good gender work, we need to work with those who actually do gender on a day-to-day -day basis. And as, uh, you know, Dennis would have said, you need to bring groups together that perhaps are not used to working together. I think that could even extend to also bringing, you know, the broader agriculture sector, to bring in the health and the food sector, because these are all very much linked to these issues. And if we want to make sure that we're talking about the expanse of the benefits of the sector, we want to make sure that all of the messages come through in a very strong way. And then last but not least, I think it's important that we look at our, the programming. So, you know, this is about budget time for the year or budgets are on their way. But I think it's important to think about how we leverage climate finance. We are having this discussion uh, in the last week of the COP26. Climate finance is one of the big issues. Uh, zero net, you know, emissions and a whole bunch of other things have been on the table. But part of what has been coming through is the SIDS needs for climate finance um, and support and tools and mechanisms to be able to address some of the issues that were mentioned by Adrian in terms of managing risk and uncertainty. So I think it's important that we think about our programming in a slightly different way. We adapt the way that we deal with fisheries, we bring climate in, and we start also putting uh, some clear resources, both local as well as external. We can't be relying only on external resources. And we maximize the capacity of the fisher folk themselves and the people in the communities who enjoy their fish, they enjoy their fish fries, but we don't often ask them to contribute to the sustainability of the sector and for some of the needs that we have in the sector. So I think we need to also look internally and bring the community and you know the society together to look at how we're gonna invest in SSF and also in aquaculture. Thank you, Lisa, for your response. And then we have another question from Silvia Salas also, and it's an open question. And so any of the panelists could, could answer it. She asked if inter-Caribbean trade increased due to COVID, 
And maybe if some of you know or could give um, some examples, no? If you can provide some examples of that. I don't know we, uh, who are you maybe wants to, to answer this question. You can raise your hand and the floor is going to be yours. Maybe Julian or Adrian that... Yeah, I, I just thought uh, Adrian here. Uh, I was actually waiting to see if somebody else was going to answer because I would have been curious myself um, as to what that answer would be. But um, from there, from where we sit, we haven't seen the. I, I don't want to say that there's zero um, because I'm sure there is, but uh, on a measurable scale, that uh, we have we, we can't determine that. At, at, well, we don't know at this point. Um, um, it is something that's much needed. And we do get, at CNFO level, we do get inquiries, even myself, uh, being in the Bahamas. Uh, I get inquiries sometimes about uh, people from other Caribbean countries who want to you know, know the cost of importing certain fisheries products to their countries, or if there's, there's maybe an interest of importing certain fisheries products from their countries to the Bahamas, particularly squid, uh, uh, you know, the, and the, that sort of stuff, and and the deep water, well, uh, some fin fish and and all that, and, and even billfish. So I don't know if there is any measurable trade at, at the moment. Maybe somebody else may know, but uh, from from where I sit, CNFO really couldn't say that. It's, uh, Thank you, Adrian. Then we, we can pass to the next question. Um, yes, this question is, um, a, they are asking, a, well, it's asking if, will this be a focus or will, I know, Will there be a focus on workforce development to provide diversified incomes? For example, working with fishers to learn and be involved in aquaculture? Yes. So Julian, you want to answer this one? Yes, okay. Uh, thank you for the individual for, for this question. And if I may, on behalf of the, the panel, um, so for a long time now, diversify, diversification and alternative livelihood in the fisheries sector, especially the small scale fisheries sector, has always been a hot debate. And it is always assumed and have the notion that it's easy for fishers to transition into one job or another. Like it is maybe easy for a lawyer to, to become a doctor or, is, or vice versa. You know, to be honest, um, in my experience, being being in the profession that I am and raised from a coastal community, fishing community, fishers are normally maintain their livelihood activities until the end. Um, it is what you know, it is what you do. However, if the situation arises, an assessment, there, uh, there is an environmental need there is a resource need because we are also fisheries managers while we are stalwarts and we are proactive and promoting the sustainability of, of fishers economic activities, but we are stalwarts of the, of the environment itself. So where the science speaks, speaks to that, we have to promote it. And what do we have? But the assessment has to be brought easier. So we have to look at what type of aquaculture is it? Is it, is it mariculture? Is it land type aquaculture? And these, and both of them bring their own challenges too. So when you move to the land, you move to other environmental factors. What species do you raise? Is the area conducive? Do you now move into land tenure issues and so on? So, you know, it, it's not an easy fix. It's not an easy answer. However, we have seen even currently in Dominica, a lot of areas, especially those who focus on the reef fishery. And we all know throughout the region, we have had some issues with, um, with some issues, not, not everything is blamed on fishers, but re reduction in, in the production of reef fish. And most time fishers get the blame for overfishing, but you know, there are a lot of other parameters. This is not the area for discussion, but I, I can get very emotional. 
on, on fisheries topics. But um, yes, so you know we have seen, especially in in the Eastern Caribbean islands, the the production of seamoss has become um, much more um, prevalent and and popular among coastal communities. So th this is one of area which is very viable. And we have seen not just the production, but it also has a market. So we have also seen the processing of CMOS into beverages become very popular to in the OCS and, and wider Caribbean. Dominica is a prime example. And currently we, are, we have heavy emphasis on the production in CMOS in the coastal areas. So I would like to say to the audience, yes, um, on the appropriate assessment, the appropriate alternative livelihood to complement maybe fishing can be presented to fishers and be trained and provide um, access to appropriate funding and mechanisms um, to do so. I just want to say that this is not all what is proposed can be easily adapted. One typical example is be for a long time environmentalists has promoted fishers who, who move into whale watching instead of those, those who utilize whale. Many of us don't, but some of us still act as a culture it did. But you have to understand if a fisher were to become a whale washer tomorrow, he has to get a more expensive vessel. He has to have liability insurance. He's carrying tourists. Where is he going to get $1 million coverage of insurance? So there are many you know, hindrances to alternative livelihoods, but there are many alternative livelihoods that are also relevant and that can be applied. And where possible, of course, we will 100% promote these alternative um, livelihoods. Thank you. Thank you, Yulian, and for the response, and thank you, Megan, for the for the question. Um, we have two other questions. I hope we have enough time to respond to both of them. But the first one is from Ratana. Um, he says, "No, uh, many of the points made by the panelists are related to the discussion about blue economy." What is the thinking in the region about blue economy, blue growth initiatives in the region, opportunities, concerns? It's also an open remarks, I know, sorry, an open, an open question. So maybe I don't know which one went to answer this. Well, I am a volunteer here, but if, if any other member wish to, to proceed on, on the response, they can. If not, if the panelists give me to go ahead, then I can. Please, Yulan, go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. And I'm, I'm, I smile and respond because it is, it is an activity that I have been heavily engaged with over the past year, um, transitioning into a blue economy. And both Darren and um, the CNFO representative um, struck a chord on that. And that is making access to the marine environment, which was traditionally a fisheries area. I mean, in addition to maritime and shipping, which is usually um, does not affect fishing that much, but a traditional fishing area, the whole coastal area was usually done for fishing. And right now we have found ourselves having to share that space and with um, water sport activities or the touristic activities, and maybe those of us who are into renewable energies, maybe wind farms, and those who are speaking about wave energy and so on. So these are the possibilities that the fishers are being put up against. And we are not um, discrediting these, these other aspects. And, and as Darren said, it is an understanding now that to fishers who traditionally were used to the space for themselves have to come to the understanding that it is now necessary to share this space. Because the, 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 the blue economy, I mean, in, in, in essential is making the most of out of the marine environment in a sustainable, a sustainable manner. And um, in, in many literature, it is said that you know fisheries possibilities are maximized. And, 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 and while we are one region, Gulf and Caribbean, the context of each country is, is different. Each of us may have a different type of fishery to focus on, be it demersal or pelagic. Dominica is a mostly pelagic dependent country, so we are, which is a bit more abundant than demersal. So these things have to be taken into um, consideration. Um, so Dominica in, in, in past times have been doing many things, you know, even having recently just reviewed yesterday a blue economy roadmap and strategies and so on. But even if this is the blue economy in general. All of them, you know, cannot, you know, really remove fisheries um, from the from the sphere of things, because which is the traditional um, blue economy. Thank you, Julian. Uh, I think that 
that Lisa wants, uh, Lisa and Dennis wants to answer too. So we are not going to have a, enough time to answer the last one, but it's okay, Julian. How about because it's a question that is directed. Uh, maybe you can, you can answer it. It's a question for from Maria, uh, and it's in the chat box. Maybe you can answer it uh, in the chat box also, so we can receive the the comments of Dennis. Is, is that okay? Uh, yes, that's okay. Okay, perfect, Julia. Thank you. Then uh, first Lisa, please, and then Dennis. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, to be fair, though, Dennis was before me. Um, you know, uh, you know. So I just want to acknowledge that he was before me. Uh, I, I poked up my hand there at the last minute. So Dennis, with your permission, I'm just going to speak very quickly because I know you have something to contribute. Um, no, I just wanted to reinforce what uh, Julian said and just say that I think, like the discussion we had before, I think we it's important to think about transitions and how we shift uh, behavior and culture around things. And so with the blue economy and blue growth we are gonna have those shifts. And one of the key elements will be resource sharing. And so I think we need to be very clear and very purposeful on having resource sharing arrangements. We need to do the training, capacity building and the mentoring uh, to make sure that those don't end up resulting in conflicts because they can very easily. Um, you know, And we don't also have structures in place to manage those. And so we need to think about what kind of mechanisms, uh, You know, whether it's grievance mechanisms, et cetera, need to be put in place so that if something happens, you know, it, it, it's addressed immediately, it's addressed fairly. Uh, I think more broadly, I would say that it's important that the blue and green, the blue economy, like the green economy and like, you know, zero emissions becomes more than a, than a buzzword because it, there's always a potential that, the, that some of these mechanisms and ideas become very popular and but then become very hard to translate and to implement. I think it's important to make sure that when we do this, we need to address the, the pre-existing you know, equality and inequity issues. And we need to make sure that the opportunities are not gonna be given to those who already have opportunities, but they're gonna be given to those who've been waiting for some time to have opportunities uh, and that we make sure also that the benefits are shared more equally. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't know that. You, you raise your hand for it. I'm so sorry, but please continue. Thank you. No problem, no problem at all. Uh, in theory, the sharing of benefits and the sharing of opportunities is what we would like to see. But sometimes to be able to access these things, it's very difficult for, for, for local and rural communities. And a lot of the times, when others access the resources, it does not trickle down. And that I think is the biggest problem for expanding and growing um, blue, green growth within rural um, communities throughout the Caribbean. I think there's a, there's a huge um, accessibility challenge for the funding that exists. And uh, a lot of the times you need support organizations to be able to access these, uh, these fundings and, and to bring the opportunities for local and rural communities. Otherwise it doesn't come. I've seen a lot of really good projects start and never get off the ground, largely because of the sustainability system that is built. And of course, sufficient funding to even start the thing in the first place. So that I think is a real challenge going ahead for the development and expansion of this whole blue green economy scenario, especially for rural and local communities. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Dennis, Elisa and Julian for, for your comments. Then, well, I, I saw that a, that Julian already answered Maria's question. So because of the time, we have to, to close the, to finish the, our meeting for today. So thank you all very much for your engagement during the session. Throughout the session, we have tried to bring you different perspectives that are at play in the fisheries industry across the region from our panelists, you have learned about areas of the industry that are, that are critical for their livelihood. And this perspective underscore 
one of the central goals of the upcoming international year. We encourage you to keep up with the activities being planned at the national, regional, and international levels uh, during the next year. And we have included links to various uh, resources in the chat box. I think that Eric is going to help me with that. And we look forward to seeing you at other IAFA 2022 events. And well, thank you very much for have a great day, uh, a, great, a great meeting day, and, and thank you all for your assistance. The panelists for the contribution with your comments and of course this, the, the participants that that enrich the, the meeting with their questions. Thank you so much and have a uh, great day. See you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, Thank, you Thank you very much. Take Thank care. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thanks to, to the panelists. Thank you. Thank you.